uh, or long COVID uh, and um, the potential benefit of vaccination in that context. Thank you. So um, there are um, ongoing efforts to um, complete. It, it's not something that's really assessed um, through ongoing surveillance because of the, the difficulty of, of, report, of collecting the data systematically. But there are um, plans or ongoing repeated surveys um, that will be um, implemented to assess that. Um, in terms of vaccine effectiveness against um, long COVID, I think that that would be a question for um, Dr. Link Ellis. She on the line? Hi, this is Dr. Link. You will. Uh, oh, great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I can answer the question about uh, VE for uh, post COVID conditions. I mean, generally, I think the research has been a little bit mixed um, and, and inconclusive, although. There is some benefit, um, clearly, for prevention of uh, initial infection close to vaccination, especially close to booster vaccination, um, as well as uh, prevention of severe disease, which has been associated with higher likelihood of long COVID. Um, I think the lack of a standard definition globally um, and ability to kind of track patients longer term, as well as diagnostic testing for long COVID has complicated the ability to measure VE. Um, but it is has remained a research priority. Thanks. Thank you so much. Do you think it would be possible, at, perhaps at a future meeting, to have a summary of what information is available on this topic? Yes, I'm sure we could do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez? Yes, thank you for that. Um, I set a question. Um, have you been able to analyze similar data in pregnant women? to see uh, the effect of the, uh, not just the primary series, but also the boosting on um, COVID hospitalizations and, and mortality. So um, it may be that COVIDnet is able to do that, but I don't have that information. Uh, we don't collect any information on pregnancy status as part of the um, the vaccine impact um, surveillance data that I presented, which are the cases and deaths by vaccination status. Um, I could, um, along with the other request that was made, I could pass that one to colleagues um, and ACIP, um, uh, you know, secretariat could consider um, that maybe that could be included in the future. No, thank you. I think it's important because it's something that we, um, you know, that I, I, you know, as, as another point in terms of encouraging vaccination among preg pregnant women. And also, um, I also think that it'd be important to um, capture data. And I know this is a little bit separate from the vaccination, but even on the use of the monoclonals and outcomes um, in during pregnancy. Thank you. And Dr. Sanchez, this is uh, this is Dr. Fleming Dutra. Thank you so much for that um, question and comment. I just wanted to point out that we are hoping to address um, uh, vaccine effectiveness and and these questions about um, COVID vaccine use in pregnant women and effectiveness in pregnant women and their infants at a future ACIP meeting. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I I don't see any other hands raised. I do have one last um, question. <laughs> Uh, request for the group, which is, you know, I wanted to do, well, two, two things. One is, is I wanted to uh, emphasize Dr. Pilling's point, you know, we know that the mortality rates compared to older adults is lower in children, that when we look at leading causes of death in children, you know, for the young kids, it's the fourth to fifth leading cause of death in kids. And so the point she makes about what is the burden on severe disease slash hospitalization, I think is similar to, to what we see with um, all-cause mortality and wanting to make sure that we really understand the burden and can articulate that well, particularly in uh, pediatric practices. So that would be extremely helpful. Uh, the other, you know, question I have is really around the commentary around severity, which uh, it certainly does feel different despite it being more prevalent in the Omicron era compared to Alpha and Delta. Uh, but I wanted to ask if there are any studies that actually compare 
unvaccinated and potentially uninfected, if we have that information, people um, in terms of severity during Omicron to those who are unvaccinated in Alpha or Delta. Uh, since we see those graphs between the vaccinated and unvaccinated are so different or that the, the, um, the hospitalization rates. Uh, and, and I ask that because uh, there is a perception that it's less severe. Um, we don't have to worry about it as much. Uh, but I think this is, you know, the Omicron wave is on the background of people who have both had infection and vaccination. So we are very different um, from an immune perspective as a population than we were uh, during the alpha wave and the delta wave. So I wanted to ask, has there been any work on that? Is it possible to take a look at your data to tease that out to really understand um, the severity comment? So, <clears throat> Dr. Lee, are you asking when you control for um, previous infection, vaccination, um, is Omicron really less severe than pre previous variants? Is that the question? Yes, because if you look on slide 11, actually, mm -hmm. um, what I see is, uh, oh, is it slide 11? Oh, maybe it's slide 12 or 10. I can't remember which one. <laughs> no. um, but uh, the point being that um, because it includes, oh, that, yeah, I think that's it. So, you know, this includes 18 and older. And so I definitely see in, the, in terms of the outcomes, uh, it looks like there is a uh, shorter length of stay, um, you know, uh, uh, less mechanical ventilation uh, if you're in hospital death. But it's not clear to me, you know, what proportion of that population in the Omicron era has been vaccinated and previously infected compared to the Delta era. And for me, it would be really helpful to know if the severity was attenuated uh, by cumulative immunity or if it was attenuated because of Omicron in and of itself. And I think, you know, it feels to me like I haven't really understood how well we tease that out. And I hear a lot of comments that Omicron is less severe, but, but I'm not so sure that's the case. I feel like it's a very different population now than it was during Delta. Yeah, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right that these results that we're showing here are actually just descriptive results that don't adjust for the impacts of vaccination. Um, and so, yeah, they have to be interpreted in that light. But um, although this study doesn't address your point, there are um, a number of publications that do do that type of analysis that take into account um, immunity status and have shown that Omicron is less severe than um, Delta, uh, you know, the previous variant. Um, so I, I, I think, I think we're we're firm in that fact. The, the issue is that there are so many more Omicron infections because of um, increased transmissibility that um, it's not the the reduced severity of Omicron is not something maybe to take lightly because um, with a higher chance of getting the disease, there will still continue to be um, a, quite a, you know, a large number of hospitalizations and deaths. And I, I tried to allude to that fact on several of the slides, but I think it's good to make that point clear. Does that help? Uh, yes, that does. Yeah, the cumulative yeah. burden or the attributable risk is uh, substantially bring the on. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Sanchez, one last question, and then we'll move on to the next section. Sure, thank you. You know, I, as I look at these data, particularly slides 22 and um, and that following 123, I guess, um, it's just, you know, there's a lot of issues raised, including with me and, and even people who I counsel and ask, and people ask me about booster dosing. Um, and, you know, given that um, that the high prob the high zero prevalence of people who've had um, had COVID already now in June 2022. Um, so this would be data on a on very high zero zero prevalence in you know among the general population, but it really attests to the need for booster dosing. Um, I think that it really speaks for um, for the fact that that, um, that we need to be recommending it. And I just wanted to comment on that because, you know, there's been a lot 
as to whether we should get that booster or should we wait for the fall and I guess for today. Um, but it's, it really does point that even with in the era where there's high um, natural infection um, that presumably uh, then the booster dosing has also contributed to the decrease in, in uh, hospitalization and, and, um, and mortality. But just want to comment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Um, we will move on next to the um, next speaker, which is Dr. Natalie Thornburg, um, who will speak about the immunology of SARS-CoV-2 variants. Dr. Thornburg. Great, thanks. Audio tech, can you hear me okay? We can hear you perfectly fine. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks. Um, so today I will be talking about the immunology of Omicron variants, but I'm going to specifically focus on a technique that um, laboratorians are using to estimate how different viruses are from each other that it can, can inform um, vaccine selection. So I'm going to talk about antigenic cartography. And um, this method, lineage isn't, lineage numbers um, aren't necessarily reflective of how different viruses are from ancestral viruses. So it doesn't necessarily, BA5 isn't necessarily more distant um, from the vaccine strain than, than BA2, BA3, um, just because of the number. Um, and we're accustomed to looking at, at, at virus lineages and viral variances in phylogenetic trees, and those are generated um, according to genetic, uh, genetic differences and not antigenic differences. And that's not how your immune system sees viruses. It sees viruses as, as shapes. Antibodies see the shape of a spike protein and not the linear sequence of nucleotides or amino acids. acids. So antigenic cartography is a method to measure how differences viruses might look to antibodies after vaccination or infections. So what is antigenic cartography? It's a visualization method used to determine how closely related different viruses are, but not in the context of genetics or uh, amino acid sequence, but antigenically. And it uses a matrix algorithm uh, called matrix completion multiple dimensional scaling al algorithm um, to, to, to generate a map. Um, it was originally developed for H3N2 influenza viruses using uh, hemagglutination inhi inhibition titers. Um, and you can generate either two-dimensional or three-dimensional maps to see how closely related viruses are. Next slide, please. All right, so this is just a summary of how an antigenic map or antigenic cartography might be done. Um, so you take a matrix of viruses in sera um, and do neutralization assays, and you create a checkerboard of the results from these neutralization assays. Now, the, the method of cartography is not limited by the kind of sera that one is using, and it's not limited by the neutralization technique that one is using. What's important in this method is that you have, you know the information about the material being used in the assay so that you know the history of the sera that's being used and you know the sequence of the viruses being used. And in this cartoon, um, they're demonstrating that they have in this particular study have taken hamsters and inoculated them with different viruses with known sequences and then collected serum, day seven, day 26, from those hamsters so they have antibodies raised against specific viruses. And then they have, they are showing two different neutralization assays that could be used. Pseudovirus neutralization assays, which are in the shell of a different virus with a, just the spike protein from SARS-CoV-2 with a known sequence, or an authentic virus, so a virus that's been isolated from a respiratory specimen from, from an infected person. And then you do neutralization assays and generate um, a matrix of neutralization titers, and that's shown in the square with the red and the yellow and the green. So for every individual virus, you have a neutralization titer against a specific um, serum. And then you use that to create the map. Next slide, please. Um, so, so you use the, the titers that you generated from doing neutralization assays of those different hamster serum in that previous cartoon. Um, 
use those titers to create a distance map. So you might, um, and that's in the top right hand corner, you might log transform your neutralization titers and then generate, use that to generate a matrix, a distance matrix. Um, so each square might represent a different, like a change in titer. Um, and each different assays that one might use, the squares might represent different distances. A lot of the maps that are being generated right now for coronaviruses, each square is about a, is a two-fold difference um, change in neutralization titers. Um, and then you, you take that, those table distant, distance and you generate the map that's shown on the left. And you might say, um, so you can see, you can color code, um, you can color code the viruses and you can put um, the squares. Most publications have been using empty squares for CIRA in filled circles as viruses to see how closely related they are. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to this method. Um, the advantages include that it's extremely easy to interpret because you can just look and see that in this case, um, antigen BE is pretty far from antigen LE, but BN and LE are pretty closely related. Um, um, and it's, it's fairly accurate and it gives you a really good overview rather than just looking at sequence alignments, which can get complex. And it gives you quantification and can give you predictions about how easily a virus might escape, escape an antibody response. Um, there are some drawbacks. It can be an oversimplification. Um, it, there can be bias in the maps, assay bias. Say, for example, um, a map generated with pseudovirus neutralizations might look different than a map generated with authentic virus neutralization or animal sera versus human sera. There can be effects of outliers, and there is always map uncertainty. The, the, the dots are not actually quite as finite as they might not look in a map. There is some uncertainty. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what do we know about how antigenically similar Omicrons are from earlier viruses and, um, and how antigenically related they are to each other. Um, this is just a reminder of the Omicron lineages and sublineages and the amino acid variations that have been observed in the spike protein. This is not the full spike, spike protein. This is just a, a few regions and some areas where there are very variations um, between Omicron lineages. The N-terminal domain um, is shown in a blue square, um, and the receptor binding domain, which is where most of the potent neutralizing antibodies would be binding the receptor binding domain and blocking ACE2 um, binding. And then, um, and then downstream of the receptor binding domain is shown at the bottom. Uh, next slide, please. These are just some of the amino acid differences projected onto the structure of the receptor binding domain. Um, BA4, BA5 is shown unless the, the unique amino acids to BA4, BA5 are shown in uh, B on the left in red. Um, and then the different variant amino acids on the right are, pro are projected onto the ACE2 footprint, so where um, the like receptor binding domain binds ACE2. Um, and you can see that there are some common to most of the Omicrons, to BA1, BA2, BA3, but not BA4 and 5 are shown in white. Um, unique to BA4 and 5, again, are shown in red. Um, unique to BA2 is shown in magenta. So it's pretty complex. If you were just to look at this, you wouldn't necessarily be able to say uh, which one of these Omicrons is most different um, from ancestral virus and say, uh, that's the one that's most likely to escape vaccine or, or neutralization. Um, so next I'm going to show you three antigenic maps from peer-reviewed publications that include Omicron viruses. Um, two of them are two-dimensional and one is three-dimensional, and only two of these maps include BA4, BA5 spike sequences. Next, next slide, please. All right. So in this one, um, investigators um, were able to look at um, the BA1 and BA2 lineage, lineages of Omicron, but not uh, BA4 and BA5, because this was um, submitted before, really, the emergence and broad circulation of BA4 and BA5. Um, so in this study, they used convalescent sera from unvaccinated persons to generate antigenic cartography um, for BA1 and BA2. Um, and so what you see here are squares, again, are sera from convalescent patients, 
circles are viruses. Um, the the um, uh, red is Delta, um, light blue is ancestral viruses, uh, green, alpha, yellow, beta, and then Omicron viruses are light pink and dark pink, and they're kind of off there to the right. Um, and so they've shown, um, they've shown convalescent sera in the, in the left panels, and then on the right side of the panel, they, see, um, they show vaccinated, um, vaccinated participants and not convalescent sera, and they see a little bit of difference um, between just the vaccinated alone versus convalescent sera. Um, the, the SACO of this is that Omicron viruses are more distantly related from ancestral viruses than the earlier variants. Um, and that um, you see more, um, more uh, dramatic difference when you're looking at um, individuals who had been vaccinated only as opposed to um, uh, infected, um, using infected sera. Next slide. Okay, and this is another study that was published um, this summer, but this one um, includes analysis of BA4 and BA5, and this one is also a three-dimensional map. So it's shown you a front view, a top view, and a, and a side view, and it's a little, a little harder to um, look at and, and understand. Um, but this also uses pseudovirus neutralization data. Um, they've used serum from breakthrough BA1 infection. So these participants had been vaccinated and then were infected with um, Omicron. And then they also have a panel of human monoclonal antibodies um, that they use to generate these maps. And, and what this map indicates is that BA, the, the Omicron viruses sort of cluster together, um, but consistent with the earlier study, um, cluster away from ancestral virus. And so they're quite anagenically distinct from ancestral virus, Wuhan virus. Um, and that in this analysis, BA4, BA5 um, are more distant to uh, Wuhan than um, other Omicron viruses. Um, and next slide. All right, this is the last uh, published map I'm going to show. Um, so in this study, they've used 21 known monoclonal antibodies and used pseudovirus neutralization. Um, and then they also have neutralization using post-third dose sera. And each square in this one represents a two-fold change in neutralization. And this map is also a three-dimensional map, but it's not shown in three panels. It's shown in one panel, and, and they've um, generated that 3D by um, by by showing you the arrows on the bottom, which dimension is which. And so if you look at um, uh, the, the black circle is um, ancestral virus, D614G, that's ancestor, vaccine strain virus. Um, you can see BA1 viruses um, are clustered a little bit away from BA2 viruses. BA1 viruses are up there on the top left. Um, BA2 um, lineage Omicrons are over there on the right in, in blue, in different colors blue. They have a couple different variations of BA2 lineage viruses. And then BA4, BA5 um, viruses are um, up there in the top sort of right-hand corner. Um, this map indicating BA4 and BA5 might be most distantly antigenically related to um, ancestral virus compared to other Omicron lineage viruses. Um, next slide. Um, so this is just a slide. I do want to indicate that when we look at these maps, it's easy to think of those circles and those squares as really finite things. Um, but whenever one uses bootstrapping, you can see that there's overlap between um, Omicron lineages. So uh, bootstrapping is just a statistical method to estimate sampling distribution. Um, and there can be, as I said earlier, individual variation in assays viruses um, and individual sera that are used. So, so this, this is a map that I pulled from some aggregated data that was published back in May, so it's um, a couple months old at this point. But I just wanted to use it to demonstrate that there's quite a bit of overlap um, in the antigenic maps between the Omicron viruses. So the dark blue is ancestral, and um, Omicron viruses are showing different shades of pink and red. And, um, 
they, they cluster away from ancestral virus. There is some overlap, but still using that aggregated data, either BA1 or BA4 viruses may be kind of further away from um, ancestral viruses. Next slide. So in conclusion, antigenic cartography is an analysis method to visually represent how antigenically related or distant viruses are to each other. Um, they can be generated either in two or three dimensions, um, and that the maps cluster Omicron variants away from ancestral and earlier viruses variants. Initially, examinations of Omicron lineages indicate that BA4 and BA5 viruses may be more antigenically distinct than BA1 viruses, but notably, all of those published assays were um, done with pseudovirus neutralization. There are quite, quite a few studies ongoing right now using um, authentic viruses, and so um, the, we expect data to vary some between different studies and between uh, serum panels that are being utilized. Um, and that is all for my presentations. I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thornburg. Um, this presentation is now open for questions. Uh, Dr. Lair. Thank you for this presentation. It's a very interesting way of representing the differences. Um, just to make sure I understand correctly, the distances you're talking about are basically how many antibodies you're generating from each individual variant. So that the farther away, you just have different antibody titers. Is that a fair statement? The, the distances are, the distance is um, how the, the change in neutralization titer between two different viruses. Um, and so say if, if the distance is um, two-fold difference, if like one square is two-fold difference, if you take um, the, the serum from a vaccinated person and you measure it against the vaccine strain um, and then one of the Omicrons, if it's, if it's, if it's six-fold lower, it might be three squares separated. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Duchin. Thank you for this uh, great work. Um, there was a, an article published yesterday in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, from Portugal that found that previous SARS-CoV-2 infection had a protective effect against BA5 infection and that they found this protection was maximal for a previous infection with BA1 or BA2. And I'm wondering if you have any comment on those findings uh, in the human population in the context of your antigenic cartography work. Yes. So, um, so actual protection is always, it, that data always sort of trumps any laboratory data that we're generating because it's real world evidence of a protection rather than this is a very limited view of neutralization of viruses. So this is a laboratory setting, serum collected. So there are limitations to this kind of analysis with certainty. Um, so, you know, in that bootstrapped aggregated data I showed you, it did show you there is overlap between the Omicrons. So it's not terribly surprising there is cross protection between the Omicrons. There are differences between Omicrons, but there aren't 50 differences. There are you know, three amino acid changes or 10 amino acid changes. Um, now, BA2 is pretty similar to BA4, 5. Um, it only has three differences in the spike protein. So previous infection with BA2, um, it doesn't surprise me that you get really good protection with BA to, to BA4, 5. Um, and, and the same goes for BA1. It's a little bit more distantly. Um, there's more changes when you compare BA1 to BA4 and 5. Um, in comparison to BA2 versus BA4, 5. Um, but it's not so dramatically different that I'm surprised that there isn't reasonable cross protection between the Omicrons. And of course, the distance, the time since your last infection matters as well because um, it's not just the sequence, it's waning of your neutralizing, neutralizing antibody response in addition to the sequence of the virus that you're being exposed to. Thank you for those comments. Thank you. And Dr. Sanchez, and then we'll move on to the next section. Thank you. Um, very interesting. I just had, I guess I'm um, related to the, one of the previous questions and interpretation. 
when I look at your slide seven, um, and you're looking at, and they didn't do is the uh, more recent variants of four, um, the BA45 are not included, but on the right panel there. So this is uh, among vaccinated individuals. So there's quite a distance of that Omicron BA1 from serum, which would explain some of the breakthrough infections or mm -hmm. some interpretation. Yeah. Yes, you are. There is a more dramatic dif distance between BA1 and the earlier variants in the vaccinated only versus uh, previously infected era. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and let's please move on. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thornburg, for your presentation. It was excellent as always. Um, and we'll move on to Dr. Link Gillis, uh, updates to COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness in the United States. Hi, good morning. Um, so I'll be giving an update today on Omicron vaccine effectiveness in children and adults. Next slide. Uh, as with previous presentations, I've organized by the presentation by increasing severity of the outcome, starting with infection, then emergency department and urgent care visits, and then hospitalizations. Next slide. So starting with infection. Next slide. I'll start with the increasing community access to testing or ICAT platform, which is national community-based drive-through testing data from pharmacies. This platform relies on self-reported vaccine history and uses a test negative design where cases are persons with at least one COVID-like symptom and a positive NAT test and controls are symptomatic with a negative NAT test. Models are adjusted for the variables. Models are adjusted for the variables shown here. Analyses today focused on the BA4-5 predominant period during July 2nd through August 20th, 2022. Next slide. Here we see relative VE for three versus two doses against symptomatic infection by age group with VE estimates in the solid lines and 95% CIs by age group in the dotted lines. Estimates for individual age groups are less important here than the overall trend, which is the same across age groups. We have less follow-up time for the 5 to 11-year-olds due to the booster recommendation being more recent. However, so far the trend is the same as for older age groups. As a reminder, we've seen previously that the primary series VE against infection wanes to zero within a few months, so these results should be taken in that context. Next slide. Here we have VE of three versus zero doses against symptomatic infection on the left and relative VE for four versus three doses on the right with 50 to 64 year olds in blue and 65 and older in orange. As with younger age groups, we see waning at or close to zero VE within a few months of three doses uh, with potentially less waning of the fourth dose, although we have limited follow-up time given when the recommendation was made. Next slide. Moving on to urgent care and uh, emergency department visits. Next slide. The vision network is a multi-state network based on electronic healthcare records. Like ICAT, it uses a test negative design with cases having CLI and a positive PCR and controls having CLI with a negative PCR. VE is adjusted for propensity to be vaccinated weights, calendar time, region, local virus circulation, and age and vaccination is determined via healthcare records and state and city registries. Next slide. This slide shows VE during Omicron for 5 to 11 year olds on the top and 12 to 15 year olds on the bottom by time since last dose. Two dose estimates are in green and three dose in blue. We see similar patterns here across age groups with VE of two doses against ED and UC visits waning substantially. In 12 to 15 year olds, we see a nice bump in VE with a third dose, but did not have enough five to 11 year olds with booster doses to provide an estimate in that age group. Next slide. Now moving on to adult VE during BA2 on the top and BA4 and five on the bottom with the same colors as before, two doses in green, three doses in blue, and now four doses in black, um, which is estimated only amongst those 50 years and up. We see similar patterns in the two time periods with waning by time since the most recent dose. 
during BA4 and 5, when we have uh, more data on the fourth dose available, it appears that the fourth dose wanes somewhat more slowly compared to two and three doses. Next slide. Uh, now moving on to a new VE platform, which has not been previously shared with ACIP. Cosmos is an opt-in database of more than 162 million patient records drawn from healthcare organizations using the EPIC electronic healthcare records platform. Like other platforms presented, this is a test negative design focused on the Omicron BA2 and BA4 and 5 periods among children and adolescents. Cases were symptomatic with a positive SARS-CoV-2 test and controls were symptomatic with a negative SARS-CoV-2 test. We did not have enough vaccinated hospitalized children to assess VE for hospitalization, so this analysis focuses on ED and UC visits only. Next slide. Uh, this slide follows the same pattern as earlier slides with children 5 to 11 years old on the top and adolescents 12 to 15 years old on the bottom, two doses in green and three doses in blue. Uh, and we have similar patterns here as, as we saw from vision for these same age groups with waning of two and three doses, though wide confidence intervals, especially around the third dose. Next slide. Uh, now moving on to VE for hospitalization. Next slide. These are results again from vision, this time against hospitalization among immunocompetent adults. As we've seen from earlier variants, VE against hospitalization continues to be higher and more sustained over time versus less severe outcomes. Note that we've not included estimates for the 14 to 149 days after the second dose due to small numbers of people recently finishing their primary series during the summer. VE during BA4 and 5 was generally similar to VE during BA2 predominance, and so far the fourth dose, shown in black at the bottom of the slide, appears to be waning somewhat more slowly compared with the third dose, although again, confidence intervals are too wide to be conclusive. Next slide. Uh, finally, I'll share data from our IV platform from December 2021 through July 2022, so representing the Omicron period. Adults ages 18 and up from 21 medical centers in 18 states are enrolled. Cases have COVID-like illness and a positive PCR or antigen tests, and controls have CLI and a negative PCR. Next slide. This slide shows VE among immunocompetent adults during Omicron predominance, with dose estimates coming only from those uh, dose four estimates coming only from those 50 and up. Uh, as, we, as with vision, we see waning of the second and third doses, though more sustained VE uh, than against infection. Next slide. And finally, here we see VE against hospitalization among immunocompromised adults. Um, note that we did not have enough statistical power to estimate VE of two or four doses, so we've displayed only three dose VE with uh, evidence of waning here. Next slide. Next slide. So to summarize, VE against severe disease continues to be higher and more sustained over time than VE against infection. VE during BA4 and 5 predominance was generally comparable to VE during BA2 predominance. A third dose provided significant additional protection against infection and severe disease in all ages. And while the third dose did wane, especially against infection, it appears to wane slightly more slowly compared to the second dose, with similar patterns seen across age groups. Finally, fourth dose coverage was too low to draw conclusions, but additional benefits were demonstrated against all outcomes with slower waning apparent, especially against hospitalization. Next slide. Uh, I'd like to thank the individuals shown on this slide for their contributions, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lynn Kellis. This presentation is now open for questions. not see any hands raised, so <laughs> your presentation must have been very clear, and thank you for the efficiency on the presentation. Last call for questions. Uh, we can always, uh, Dr. Long, thank you. Yes. Um, let me just be sure I understood this correctly, because it, it says a lot about what we're talking about today. So did you, you know, I even looked at them before, but I still was still getting it when you were showing them, and you went so fast, it was wonderful data. I want to be sure I got this right and tell me for sure if I do not. It is that 
the effectiveness against B4 and 5 for hospitalization was equal to and had the same decay as it did against earlier. So there was no advantage for hospitalization. There would be no seeming advantage of a bivalent against Omicron 4 and 5 in the short run. We don't know about the long run um, versus hospitalization. Is that correct? Poorly said. Sorry. So these data were all the monovalent vaccines, so we didn't provide any data for bivalent. Um, if you go back to slide 14, um, this is our hospitalization data in adults among, uh, among immunocompetent adults. Um, so again, this is the monovalent vaccine only, so the, the, the existing currently used vaccine. Um, so you see BA2 on the top and BA4 and 5 on the bottom. Um, generally, the patterns are the same. I think I would caution against um, interpreting lower VE during 4 and 5 using these data just because of the wide confidence intervals, but I think we see the same general pattern that there is um, some indication of waning of the third dose. The fourth dose does seem to bump you back up, um, maybe even a little bit higher than the initial third dose. Um, and again, these are uh, much higher VEs and more sustained effectiveness uh, for hospitalization than what we saw for infection. Um, but I think that it's an indication that the bivalent vaccine should provide at least similar or better protection um, against Omicron, since it'll be a better match. But these data are focused only on the, the current uh, monovalent vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Palin. Okay, yes. Thank you um, so much for this um, great presentation. I wanted, uh, the way I was interpreting this data, and I'd like to have verification, is that really the primary series waned a lot, and it's the third and fourth doses uh, of booster that provide uh, important protection against our severe disease, um, even when it, you're using the monovalent vaccine. Is that correct? Thank you. Yes, I think that interpretation would be correct. I think we've seen this pattern um, for every variant so far that the primary series uh, provides some protection, but that it's relatively limited and wanes quickly, and that that third dose is really key for having uh, more sustained protection, and early indications are that the fourth dose um, likewise provides additional benefit um, in those for whom it's recommended. Thank you. Dr. Long, did your hand go up again? Yes, it did. Thanks. Okay. Um, so Thank uh, I, I, I just wonder how confident you are about that last statement when I'm looking at this studies and um, the average time since the fourth dose was 27 days, 38 days, and 84 days. So, um, you know, 90 days before you saw there was significant waning. but considering the small number of subjects and the wide confidence intervals. Tell me statistically, are you confident about that last statement that not about what everything else has shown, but what a, what this four dose um, two boosters has shown that uh, there is slower waning? Um, I, so I think the issue is that we have relatively limited follow-up time after the fourth dose just because of when it was recommended. And so as you say, the numbers are fairly low of um, cases that have been hospitalized after receipt of a fourth dose. So I think we, we can't really conclude here that there is or is not waning of a fourth dose. Um, I, I think the basic indication is that you get a little bit of extra protection versus a third dose and, and certainly extra protection um, after a distant third dose, so like compared to the individuals that got three doses more than 120 days ago, uh, there's definite benefit of the fourth dose there. But I, I think it's too early to conclude one way or the other about waning of a fourth dose. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, let's move on to the next presentation. 
Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Link Ellis. We'll move on to Dr. Tom Shimabukuro, who will provide um, uh, COVID-19 vaccine safety updates for the committee. Thank you. Hi, can I go to the next slide, please? Um, this, this is really going to be a two-part presentation after I cover some brief back background on our monitoring systems. I'm going to present on the safety of primary series mRNA COVID-19 vaccination in children ages six months to five years, followed by data on safety of mRNA COVID-19 booster vaccination in people ages five and older. And I'll actually provide the summaries after each of these individual sections. Next page. Next, next slide. Um, one of the systems that, that we use is an adverse event reporting system, which I know most of you are very familiar with. Um, FAERS is the, is the nation's um, spontaneous reporting or passive surveillance system that's co-managed by CDC and FDA. Next slide. FAERS accepts reports from everyone, regardless of the plausibility of the vaccine causing the event or the clinical seriousness of the event. Key strengths of VAERS is that it can rapidly detect potential safety problems and can detect rare adverse events. Um, the main limitation is, is because of um, uh, the limitations of passive surveillance, generally we cannot determine cause and effect from VAERS data alone. Next slide. We'll also be presenting data from the, the VSAFE after vaccination health checker. Next slide. VSAFE is a voluntary CDC smartphone-based monitoring program for COVID-19 vaccine safety. It uses text messaging and web surveys to check in with vaccine recipients after vaccination. It solicits participants' reports on local injection site reactions, systemic reactions, and health impacts, and parents can register and complete surveys on behalf of their child. Next slide. Lastly, our vaccine safety data link system is our EHR-based system for surveillance and research. It's a collaborative project between CDC and nine integrated healthcare organizations. Next slide. In VSD, we do rapid cycle analysis, which is near real-time sequential monitoring. Um, the aims are to monitor the safety of COVID vaccines weekly using pre-specified outcomes of interest and to describe uptake of COVID vaccines over time in the VSD population. Next slide. So the, the first part of this presentation will be um, safety of primary series vaccination in children six months to five years. Next slide. This is a table of U.S. reports to VAERS among children after primary series. And for Pfizer, it's six months to four years. And for Moderna, it's six months to five years. That's based on the, the ages for the authorizations and the youngest children. Um, for Pfizer, there's been... 890,000 doses administered during the analysis period from Moderna, 664,000 doses. There are 496 reports for Pfizer and 521 for Moderna. Um, the, the key takeaway from this table is that 98% of these reports for both Pfizer and Moderna were classified as non-serious, and there were no reports of myocarditis um, for either of these vaccines. Next slide. Uh, these are the most frequent measure preferred terms to VAERS reports following primary series for Pfizer vaccination in children six months to four years. On the left hand side, it's all reports, which includes um, these MEDRA preferred terms um, that include uh, uh, PTs that are consistent with vaccination errors, you see they're highlighted in, in, in blue font. Um, on the right-hand side, we have excluded um, those non-clinical outcomes. And then when you just look at the clinical outcomes, uh, commonly reported adverse events are systemic reactions. Next slide. This is the same table for Moderna. Um, this is for children six months to five years. And on the left-hand side, all reports to include those non-clinical um, terms, which are primarily error terms associated with vaccination errors. And then on the right-hand side, um, it's clinical outcomes only um, and a very similar safety profile to that observed for Pfizer, um, uh, primarily systemic reactions. Next slide. So moving on to VSAFE, um, in this table you see VSAFE enrollment among children um, for following Pfizer and Moderna vaccination. 
um, the, 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 the doses administered are the same as I previously mentioned, about 664,000 from Moderna, about 890,000 for Pfizer, and 14,725 children enrolled following Moderna vaccination, 8,541 children enrolled following Pfizer. Next slide. Uh, the, this, these figures show reactions and health impacts reported in children aged six months to two years, reported at least once in the zero to seven days following vaccination by dose. On the left is the figure for Moderna. On the right is the figure for Pfizer. Dose one uh, is in the, the, is the, the orange bar. Dose two is the blue bar. And uh, I think what's important to note is that uh, injection site reactions and systemic reactions are, are commonly reported. Um, if you look at dose one, uh, for both Moderna and Pfizer, you get quite similar reactogenicity profiles. For dose two, there's slightly higher reporting for uh, in injection site reactions, systemic reactions, and health impacts for Moderna, um, but we're not seeing that uh, for, for Pfizer. And, uh, in, in fact, there may be slightly lower reporting for dose two. We don't have dose three data yet available for, for Pfizer. We'll get that in the future as more time elapses. Next slide. This is a similar figure, um, but for children ages three to five years. Um, and seeing a, a bit of a similar pattern here, um, injection site reactions, systemic reactions are fairly commonly reported after both vaccines. Um, the dose one reactogenicity profile for Moderna and Pfizer look quite similar. And then we're seeing um, some higher reporting for reactogenicity following Moderna. Um, but not seeing that pattern for Pfizer. Next slide. So moving on to um, VSD data. Um, these are the VSD COVID-19 vaccine rapid cycle analysis pre-specified surveillance outcomes and the settings in which they're monitored. Next slide. So through the uh, analysis period, which is through August 13th, um, there's been about 50,000 uh, Pfizer primary series doses administered. You see the breakdown between first dose and second dose, and about 52,000 Moderna doses administered, so just over 100,000 total primary series uh, mRNA COVID-19 vaccinations in these age groups. And uh, to date, there have been no statistical signals detected for any pre-specified surveillance outcomes for either mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. So in summary, um, for uh, primary series vaccination in children ages six months to five years, the initial safety findings of both mRNA COVID-19 vaccines are consistent with those observed in the clinical trials. Systemic and local reactions are commonly reported adverse events. Vaccination errors are also being reported to VAERS. Um, there's been no unexpected safety findings to date and no evidence of an increased risk from myocarditis following mRNA COVID-19 vaccination in children ages six months to five years. Next slide. So moving on to part two of the presentation, which is COVID-19 vaccine safety of booster doses in people ages five years and older. Next slide. This is a summary table of U.S. reports to VAERS following first and second mRNA COVID-19 booster vaccination for um, uh, all mRNA uh, vaccines combined. You can see there's been a substantial number of first booster doses and, uh, and, and a decent number of second booster doses administered, um, uh, a sm smaller number of first booster doses administered for children 5 to 11 years. And you see the... Uh, the male to female breakdowns, the serious, non-serious breakdown um, on, on, the, on, on the table there at the, on the right-hand side in the right-hand columns. Next slide. So these are the most frequent MEDRA preferred terms in reports to VAERS following first booster dose uh, in children ages 5 to 11 years. Um, this is a similar format to what I showed you. There's, it's all reports on the left-hand side there with, uh, with error terms highlighted in blue. And then on the right-hand side, when we exclude 
those non-clinical outcomes. Uh, you see the, uh, the top 10 clinical outcomes, um, which are mainly systemic and uh, local reactions. Next slide. So uh, a little bit different format on this slide. These are the most frequent measure preferred terms in reports following first booster dose for ages 12 and older. So we have non-serious reports on the left-hand side and then serious reports on the right-hand side. And again, this follows the regulatory definition for serious. And this includes clinical outcomes only. Although I will say um, in these older age groups, there are, proportionally there are not that many error um, reports that we see with the younger age groups. So on the left-hand side for non-serious reports, um, the most common reports are, are local and systemic reactions. And then on the right-hand side, see that many of these serious reports um, uh, likely represent uh, uh, COVID disease or, or signs and symptoms associated with COVID disease. Um, you see vaccine breakthrough infection actually reported there at number, number eight. Next slide. So this is a, a similar slide um, showing um, a med, the most frequent measure preferred terms um, to VAERS following second booster dose in ages 50 and older. Non-serious reports on the left-hand side and serious reports on the right-hand side, clinical outcomes only. You can see for non-serious reports, <clears throat> there are uh, the, uh, COVID, COVID disease or um, terms associated with COVID disease are reported as well as uh, systemic reactions and local reactions. Then on the right-hand side, you'll see somewhat of a similar pattern where COVID disease, breakthrough disease, and signs and symptoms um, likely associated with COVID disease commonly reported for serious reports. Next slide. <clears throat> These are VAERS report. This slide is VAERS reporting rates of verified myocarditis per million mRNA COVID-19 first and second booster vaccinations in the days zero to seven post-vaccination. So on the left-hand side there, we have boosters, um, and that includes uh, five and older. And then on the right-hand side, we have second boosters, and that only includes individuals 50 and older. Um, where the cells are highlighted in peach, that's where the reporting rate to VAERS exceeds the background rate for myocarditis. So for males um, in the age groups 12 up to 29, we see elevated reporting rates for myocarditis um, compared to background rates. And then we are not seeing that in, in, uh, for males in ages 30 and over and not seeing that in any of the age groups for the females and not seeing any elevated reporting rates uh, for males or females for second booster dose in those individuals 50 and older. Next slide. <clears throat> so we wanted to uh, include this slide um, because uh, the, 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 compare, the most apt comparison may be what does first boost booster dose look like compared to dose two. So the, the far right-hand column is actually from the previous slide, and then the, the dose two slide represents <clears throat> the reporting rates following dose two of the primary series. And I think you, the, 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 the trend here is that the reporting rates um, for myocarditis per million doses administered in the days zero to seven post-vaccination are consistently higher following dose two compared to first booster dose. Um, they exceed background uh, rates uh, in the age groups for males from ages five up through 49 and for females from 12 up to 29 um, so a, a general trend here that the reporting rates uh, for myocarditis um, appear to be higher uh, for dose two compared to first booster dose. I'll caveat that by saying that this is based on spontaneous reporting and is subject to reporting biases. Next slide. So moving on to data from vSafe, um, this figure here shows reactions and health impact events reported by VSAFE participants age 5 to 11 years at least once in the day 0 to 7 after homologous Pfizer vaccination by dose. 
So dose one in orange, dose two in blue, and then the booster dose. Um, I think the uh, probably the take home message from this figure is that reported reactogenicity, whether it's injection site reactions, systemic reactions, and even health impacts, um, tends to be fairly similar for booster dose compared to dose two um, for Pfizer in this age group. Next slide. And this is a similar figure, but it's for ages 12 to 17 years. And then again, similar um, to what we see for the younger ages, there is more rep self-reported uh, react in local and systemic reactogenicity and health impacts. Um, but again, uh, booster dose reactogenicity appears to be fairly similar to dose two reactogenicity in this age group for Pfizer vaccination. Next slide. Uh, this is a similar slide for for uh, for um, V-safe participants age 18 and older. Um, we, we include Moderna now because there's um, be, because Moderna is available in this age group. So Moderna figure on the left hand side and Pfizer on the right hand side. Um, there may be slightly more um, reporting of react reactogenic events following Moderna. Um, the, the, the trend here is that the, the booster dose reactogenicity appears to be maybe slightly lower than uh, dose two reactogenicity, but uh, uh, maybe a bit higher than dose one. Um, reactogenicity, uh, reported reactogenicity um, with Moderna, uh, maybe slightly higher than for Pfizer, um, but the same general pattern here for Pfizer that we observe um, for Moderna. Um, booster dose reactogenicity, uh, maybe slightly lower um, reporting for booster dose compared to dose two. Next slide. And lastly, this includes the uh, data for individuals 50 and old, older. And then for this, for this age group, we have the second booster dose available. So dose one in orange, dose two in blue, first booster dose in green, and second booster dose in red. Um, there, Moderna on the left, Pfizer on the right, um, there is a higher self-reported reactogenicity um, for Moderna um, compared to Pfizer. Uh, dose 2 has the highest reported reactogenicity. And then for both vaccines, we see this trend of, of um, decreasing reported re reactogenicity for the first booster dose and the second booster dose after, after dose 2 with a primary series. Next slide. So moving on to uh, vaccine safety data, RCA analysis, um, just to remind you of the pre-specified surveillance outcomes and the settings in which they're monitored. Next slide. So here's mRNA COVID-19 booster vaccine doses administered in VSD in people ages 5 to 11 on top, 12 to 17 in the middle, and 18 and over on the bottom. And for VSD, we're focusing on first booster doses um, there's been about 94,000 uh, booster doses in 5 to 11, about 265,000 in 12 to 17 years old, and then for 18 and older, about 2.2 million Moderna dose one uh, booster doses and about 2.8 first booster doses for Pfizer. Next slide. So in the 5 to 11-year-old age group for the first booster dose, there have been no statistical signals for any pre-specified surveillance outcomes. Next slide. So this table shows VSD signals for pre-specified outcomes in the 1 to 21-day risk interval after first booster in people 12 and older. And we have a statistical signal for myocarditis and pericarditis in the combined um, Pfizer-Moderna um, grouping there. So these are these are individuals who got Pfizer primary and a Pfizer first booster plus Moderna primary and a Moderna first booster. No signals for any other pre-specified outcomes. Next slide. So we do a more detailed analysis to uh, to assess this signal for myocarditis. Um, this is this table shows verified myocarditis and pericarditis during the zero to seven day risk interval post vaccination versus the comparison interval twenty two to forty two days post vaccination with first booster. 
And then for, for the uh, 12 to 15 and 16 to 17 year olds, it's, it's just Pfizer data. Um, and, and you can see there for, for males, 12 to 15 years old, there is uh, an elevated adjusted rate ratio, which is statistically significant. Um, and that translates, it's 18.5. Um, that translates into 61.7 excess cases per million doses administered in the zero to seven day risk interval compared to the 22 to 42 day um, post-vaccination control comparison interval. And then for 16 to 17 year olds, um, the adjusted rate ratio is not estimable because we have an eight to zero split, but it is statistically significant because the lower bound of the confidence interval is, is uh, 2.03. And then for 18 to 39 year olds, for males with the combined doses, and males um, with uh, primary series Moderna, I'm sorry, primary series Pfizer and a Pfizer booster, we see elevated adjusted rate ratios that are statistically significant. Next slide. So this slide is straight VSD incidence rates of verified myocarditis and pericarditis in the zero to seven days after Pfizer and this table, vaccination in people ages five to 30 nine years, <clears throat> looking at dose two compared to first booster dose. So the incidence rates in the zero to seven days for at following dose two are on the left-hand side of this table. And then the incidence rates following first bo booster dose in the zero to seven days on the right-hand side of the table. For most of these uh, incidence rates, uh, the, the dose two incidence rate is higher than the first booster dose incidence rate. However, these are, are small case counts and wide confidence intervals, so not much um, statistical difference. Um, there are exceptions. I will point to the 16 to 17-year-old age group, um, both for males and females, where we see higher incidence rate following first booster dose compared to dose two for both males, 188 compared to 137, and for females, 36.4 compared to 9.3. However, um, again, these are relatively small counts and wide confidence intervals. So those, those uh, estimates of the incidence rates are not statistically different. Next slide. This is a similar table, but for um, Moderna, uh, we have, we have uh, data for 18 to 29 and 30 to 39 years old, which uh, you, you see the, uh, the estimates and the confidence intervals for the incidence rates there. Next slide. So in summary, um, for mRNA COVID-19 vaccine safety of booster doses in people ages five years and older, the safety findings are generally consistent with those observed for primary series vaccination. The evidence suggests an increased risk for myocarditis following first booster dose. However, myocarditis is a rare event following mRNA COVID-19 booster vaccination. CDC has verified 131 myocarditis case reports to VAERS in people ages five and older after 123 million mRNA COVID-19 booster vaccinations. The risk is primarily observed in adolescent and young adult males. There's no statistical signal for myocarditis to date in children ages five to 11 years following first booster. In VAERS data, the reporting rates of myocarditis are lower following first booster dose versus dose two of the primary series. And, and I will just r remind you that, uh, that the, the rates are higher, uh, reporting rates are higher for dose two compared to dose one of the primary series. In VSD analyses, myocarditis and pericarditis incidents following first booster dose and dose two of the primary series are similar so case counts are small and confidence interval intervals around point estimates are wide. Next slide. I'm going to finish up with uh, a couple general slides on COVID vaccine safety, um, monitoring, uh, monitoring of pregnancy and reproductive health outcomes. Um, we, we monitor pregnancy and reproductive health outcomes in multiple systems, including vSafe, the vSafe Pregnancy Registry, VSD, VAERS, and the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project. 
Some of the outcomes or topics that we monitor uh, are shown there on the left-hand side of this slide. Next slide. So to date for outcome study, there have been no concerning findings for pregnancy and reproductive health outcomes following COVID-19 vaccination. Data on COVID-19 vaccine safety during pregnancy and reproductive health outcomes following vaccination will be, will be presented at a future ACIP meeting. Next slide. I'd like to acknowledge the following groups and organizations for their contributions to this presentation. Next slide. Next slide. That concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Shima Bakoro. <clears throat> this presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Long. Yes, I have two um, timing related questions. The first is, do you have any information <clears throat> on the interval between first and second dose in those who got myocarditis or did not? And do you have any information either on just straight the interval between dose two and the booster in the population that you looked at? And it would be great if you also had that on those that got myocarditis or not. But you see where I'm going because this is so much more common after the second dose, we have to believe that some kind of underlying existing um, something, we don't know if it's antibody or if it's something else, predisposes to myopericarditis. So there's generally a bigger interval from dose two to first booster. And could you tell by what the interval was in those who got myopericarditis, um, whether that interval had any effect? The duration of the interval had any effect. So for the interval between first and second dose, we, we, we know from VSD data that there's very little variability um, mm -hmm. and, that, and that the schedule was followed. So that there really isn't enough variability there to draw any conclusions. Um, for the, the intervals between uh, the interval between um, dose two and the booster dose, um, it, it's at least five months. And uh, th there also isn't um, that much variability around that. Um, and and the, the number of, I mean, the number of counts, the, the case counts for myocarditis are, are, are still pretty small. And we just don't, I don't think we have enough information right now on, on, on interval to, to draw any firm conclusions about that. I think probably the best data come from, Canada, where um, because of, of differences in the recommendations in the provinces, they had um, they had substantial variability between first and second dose uh, of the primary series, and uh, and 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 have data that the longer the interval between um, the, the the doses, the lower the risk for myocarditis. So I, I think there is there is mm -hmm. some evidence that extending the interval. Um, may reduce the the risk of myocarditis. Um, in, in the U.S., we we just don't have that much variability, and for a pretty rare outcome, I don't think we can uh, have enough information to draw any conclusions at this point. But it is something I think that um, that, that that is worth looking into uh, more. May I ask a very short follow-up question, Doctor? Yeah, yeah, very brief. brief. Very brief. Thank you. Yes, and the the brief follow-up question is. Um, do you, you know, we're led to believe that probably as we get closer to the current time, at least 50% of these people in this age group have had uh, natural disease uh, with or without vaccine on board. Um, do we have any, do you, uh, first of all, are these data, do they extend into the Omicron surge where there's also of background natural infection, and do we know if natural infection is more common in those who have myopericarditis at, at the booster stage? Uh, can you can you repeat just the last 
part of that question. Do we do we happen to know if those that got the booster who got myocarditis were more likely to have had somewhere in the past or especially the recent past infection? Um, so uh, documented infection in, in the EHR electronic health record is is uh, in these myocarditis cases is is still is pretty rare. It's on the order of um, 10 to 11 percent, depending on what what you're looking at. So it's not it's it's it, it's still fairly uncommon. Uh, and this data does go through the 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 Oma, at least some of this data goes through the Omicron period. Uh, I think it, it it may be difficult because um, because not every infection is is necessarily captured in the electronic health record. So we, we don't know for sure if some of these cases may have been infected, but that, that is just not available in the, in, in the EHR. Um, but uh, we, I, I don't think that we have uh, sufficient data right now to, to, to draw any conclusions about whether natural infection, having natural infection and then getting a booster um, may put you at increased risk for myocarditis versus somebody who hasn't had infection and, and gets a booster. I, I just don't think we have sufficient data right now to uh, to, to address that issue. Thanks, Thanks. Dr. I see Dr. Klein raised her hand, then we'll go to Dr. Peeling daily, and then we'll close the session. Hi, thank you. I, I just want to briefly clarify that the myocarditis case definition, myocarditis pericarditis case definition for the VSD does exclude individuals who had a, a current COVID vaccine, COVID infection in the 60 days prior to the myocarditis, if we know about it. But Dr. smith is right that there's a lot we don't know about. But for those we know about, we do exclude those from um, the VSD case definition. Thank you. Dr. Paley? Hi, Dr. Shimon Bakura, thank you for um, this great presentation and all the work that you and the teams have done to share so much data on safety. Um, of the many millions of doses that have been administered. Um, my, I really have a comment, and I wanted to thank, the, thank you for sharing the VAERS data and the number of reports of vaccine administration error in the children less than 12. We know there's lots of, um, and before the approval, we talked about our concern about the likelihood of error because the files look so similar. And so I just wanted to um, highlight that and encourage as we move forward to have more distinct files to make vaccine errors less common. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paling. And actually, um, I know we have uh, uh, both manufacturers on the call for later in the agenda, so maybe we can come back to this question and ask if they could please respond. Um, Dr. Daly. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Dr. Shimba Bukhara, my question was closely related to Dr. Paling's. Um, can you, I have two questions, but they're both brief. One is, can you put those vaccine administration errors reported to VAERS in context of other vaccines? Is this partially a function of a new vaccine or is it really more a reflection of different doses at different ages? And then I have a follow-up question. Uh, I think we have evidence that when there's, when a, when a new vaccine uh, appears on, on the market um, or there's a, a, a new recommendation for an age group, we, we, do see, we, we do see an increase in reports of errors to VAERS um, while, while during that initial uptake period while providers are getting used to the, used to the products, and that tends to then, then, then decrease. And so we, we may be in that phase where we're seeing a lot of, a lot of errors right now, and that may be um, that, that, that the problem may be magnified a little bit about uh, a lot of, uh, about a lot of recommendations coming rapid fire, and then maybe some issues around the packaging. But it's it's not surprising to us that we are seeing uh, a substantial number of reports, uh, uh, error reports er er early on when there's a new recommendation and a new age group. Thank you. And then my follow-up question is, what do we know about serious adverse events among those who experienced a vaccine administration error? Thank you. Uh, the, the overwhelming majority of, uh, of these error reports do not report an adverse health event. Uh, and, uh, and, when, and when there are 
adverse health events associated with these error reports, they tend to be similar to what we see in general. Um, I, there, the, in, in fact, I'm just, I'm just looking at, at least for the, for the ages, um, five to, there, there are, there are very, for, for the, for the youngest age groups, there are actually no serious adverse events. Um, associated with one of the error reports, and then um, for the five to eleven year old, uh, for the five to eleven year old age group, there were only four that were classified um, as as serious. And uh, when we looked at these, um, although they met the the regulatory definition as serious, they didn't appear to be clinically serious. So that we don't really have any concerns. Um, I think the the one concern we might have is if a child gets an adult dose of an mRNA vaccine, does that put them at increased risk for myocarditis? But we haven't seen a case of that happening. Thank you. Um, and thank you for those questions too. Thank you, Dr. Shimon Shibabakoro and to all of our speakers during the uh, morning session today. Um, we are uh, slightly behind schedule, so I'm gonna give us 10 minutes and ask that we meet at, um, we'll say 20 minutes after the hour to reconvene for public comment. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, everyone. It is now 20 minutes after the hour, and we will reconvene the meeting to begin oral public comment. I'll pause for the background noise. Um, at the start of our public comment session, I'd like to you know, welcome and thank our public comment speakers for addressing the committee today. All of the speakers submitted a request in advance of the meeting, and the final list of public commenters was determined via a lottery. For our speakers today, we have a limited public comment period, and in order to make it through all the list of speakers, it's extremely important each speaker limits his, her, or their remarks to three minutes. There's a timer displayed on the screen so you know how much time you have left. As a gentle reminder, our committee appreciates diverse viewpoints that are respectful in nature and focus on the issues being discussed today at our meeting. Uh, we thank our speakers again, and we look forward to your comments. And give me one moment to pull up the speaker list. Thank you. Uh, our first speaker today is Elizabeth Fashing. Hello, can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Fashing, and I am a parent to two children, one nine and one just recently turned five. And I'm asking the committee today to please do not delay consideration of the booster availability to children under 12. Um, our whole family did get COVID this past April, and three of us were fully vaccinated, but unfortunately, my four-year-old had to suffer the consequences of getting COVID without the benefit of vaccine protection. And he was the sickest among us. He had gastrointestinal issues and a high fever for a week, and I do not think that it was fair for him to have to suffer from this disease without the benefit of vaccine protection because of the delay in approving the vaccine for the under five population. And he is just now going to be fully vaccinated in about a week um, because we just started the Pfizer series on him a couple of months ago as soon as it became available to his age group. Um, I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a research scientist. I understand that there are special liability issues and uh, considerations for studying um, medications in young children, but those cautions cannot be to the detriment of getting children access to life-saving vaccines. There is going to be another pandemic, and it could very well be more deadly to children, and we cannot delay them care due to over-caution. So I would like to ask that the administration of medical and vaccine trials be revamped to ensure that our most vulnerable are included from the beginning in trials. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, next, we will move to Dorit Rice. Hello, can you hear me? We can, thank you, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dorit Rice. I'm a professor of law at the University of California, Hastings College of the Law. Thank you again for the opportunity to comment and for your thorough, careful work. I have four points to make. First, I'm concerned about the process for bringing the BA4 and BA5 boosters forward. FDA's Verbach Committee discussed this with very little data and no human trials and has not been reconvened and there's still no direct human data. I think something like this needs more transparency at open deliberation. And I am grateful to ACIP for giving such a thorough deliberation of the data and where it stands, but it would have been nice to have it earlier. I realize we have no other mitigation me measures in place, that hundreds are dying every day, and there is real pressure to act. Uh, and it's exactly at this time that expert agencies need to act to maintain confidence, and cutting processes does not help. If lack of the transparency decreases usage, where is the benefit? I also understand that ACIP needs to respond to what it has, and your suggested recommendation help with clarity and do address all ages, which is good, but the process is concerning. Second, I've heard from colleagues in the medical field that there's substantial confusion as to when people should give boosters, including the new boosters, after a recent in in infection. Guidance from ACIP on the timing of boosters after reinfection would be really, really helpful in relation to the new one. Third, I want to remind everyone that as Dr. Shima Bukuro set out for us in detail, the vaccines we currently use in the United States, the Pfizer, Moderna, and Novavax, have an extremely strong safety record. They're not risk-free, but the risks are small, and by and large, those seeking to deter others from vaccinating have to resort to misleading tactics like misrepresenting VAERS report, misrepresenting 
non-casual report from the trial data and attributing every death and harm to vaccine with no evidence or against the evidence. We could wish the vaccines were more effective against infection, but they're safe and they prevent a hospitalization and death, as again described here. The extensive misinformation campaign about the vaccine led to many unnecessary deaths and harm, and it's built on a tower of lies. And finally, I would like to ask again that the hardworking and dedicated ACIP staff put up the topic for an emergency meeting when you announce the emergency meeting. I think it will help people decide whether to request to comment and help them tailor comments before the agenda is up. And adding a line like a September emergency meeting by bivial violent boosters would not be that much additional work. I know the staff has worked really hard over the last few years. Thank you for your work and, and uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity to comment. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next, we have Ms. Patricia Neuenschwander. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay. I have been a nurse for over 28 years and have given public comment several times to this committee, but this one takes the cake. Let me start with the absurdity that you are asking for public comments before you present the data being used to evaluate the safety or efficacy of these products. The fact that this committee is meeting today to consider recommending products that have not gone through any human trials, you have gone from junk science to no science. The FDA granted emergency use authorization yesterday without convening for the VERVAC committee to provide any expert opinion. It's absurd. Are you really going to use data extrapolated from different unnamed bivalent experimental products or mouse studies to recommend these products to millions of Americans? You consider this rigorous science? Absurd. The study using the extrapolated bivalent Pfizer product, not the product you're here for today, had 600 adults aged 55 or older, yet authorization is given for 12 year olds and older? Absurd. After one month, one month using a rapidly waning product, the immune response of the participants who received the new bivalent vaccine was better. What immune response data? No data on better protection from infection, transmission, hospitalization, or death? Just better antibody production, which I will remind this committee has not been shown in randomized clinical studies to mean better protection. It's absurd. The FDA says the safety data accumulated from the other experimental products is relevant to these products because, quote, they are manufactured using the same process. So any product that uses the same manufacturing process is deemed automatically safe? Absurd. Use of these products will require unvaccinated people to take two doses of the old vaccine with the original strain that's been long gone before being eligible to take the new boosters. It's absurd. The FDA said the booster you receive does not need to be from the same manufacturer as your primary vaccination or previous booster. Where are the clinical trials? It's absurd. Providers should offer all vaccines for which a person is eligible for with this experimental product without any clinical trials. Absurd. If recommended, the new booster, by the way, fourth or fifth dose if you're keeping score, with no long-term safety will become the CDC's definition of up-to-date. This will impact millions of people's ability to maintain employment, attend school, go to college, or participate in any activity that has a requirement on being quote, fully vaccinated. It's absurd. You have the opportunity to do the ethical, morally right thing today. Healthcare providers blindly trust you. The data is not there and you know it. Do not return us to unethical human experimentation. Put an end to this absurdity and require rigorous large-scale clinical trials before you put your name on these products. Or you can choose to look the other way and potentially put millions of people in grave danger of harm. Thank you Please your do your comment. job. Next, thank you for your comment. Next, we'll move on to Mrs. Mary Mahoney. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Mahoney and I am speaking on behalf of myself and my family. I want to start by thanking this committee for your ongoing commitment to ensuring Americans have access to safe and effective protections against this devastating virus. As COVID-19 continues to evolve, I am encouraged to see how the science continues to evolve along with it. When the vaccines were initially approved and made available, each member of my family was eager to receive our dose. The vaccine has provided us with the protection we were desperately needing in order to return to so many meaningful aspects of our lives that had been on hold such as going to school, attending church, 
and being around the older adults that we love. When the booster shots were approved and recommended, we were just as eager to follow the guidance of this committee and our physicians in adding as much needed layer of protection. We now find ourselves once again looking to this advisory committee and the CDC for clear and straightforward guidance on who should receive the newly approved bivalent booster doses and when. As my children head back to school and we're all head back into another flu and pneumonia season, we are eager to gain access to the best protection available to ensure a strong immunity as possible against COVID-19. I urge this committee to provide clear guidance on this on the use of the new bivalent booster shots and that every eligible American understands how and when to take this next step in protecting ourselves and our families. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next we have Megan Rapp. Hi, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, my name is Megan Rapp. I speak today to enthusiastically endorse boosters as a tool in preventing the spread of COVID and protecting against severe disease. I speak to say thank you for the work you are doing to make bivalent boosters available to people 12 plus. I also speak today on behalf of my one and a half year old daughter, Caroline, because Caroline is really too little to speak, though she can say all done. She is also too little to follow the CDC's guidance on personal responsibility around COVID mitigation, such as assessing risk, wearing a mask, getting therapeutics, or accessing boosters. I speak today to call on you and other federal agencies like the FDA to immediately do everything in your power to stop leaving children like Caroline behind with regards to COVID. Let's speak to the issue of vaccine uptake for under five. Parents like me were told under five vaccines would be coming in February, then March, then April, et cetera. I kept asking CDC and FDA leadership, when would my daughter be able to get a COVID vaccine too? Soon, you said, children are vulnerable and this takes more time. I wonder why, for the most vulnerable, the agencies tasked with keeping my child safe instead allowed delays, which left her more vulnerable and for longer. And while we waited for that under five vaccine rollout for Caroline, she and every single other toddler in her class got COVID. This artificially created delay in taking more time for young children's boosters will have the same impact. Kids will get COVID, parents will decide the kids don't need the booster since they just had COVID, children get left behind on the next variant booster when the new strain crops up and the loop continues. Have we learned nothing from the primary vaccine rollout for children? Delays don't magically increase vaccine uptake. I speak to urge you to create a plan for authorizing bivalent boosters for kids under 12 now based on the same criteria for adults similar to the way the annual flu vaccines are authorized. If you have legitimate reasons not to do this, we as parents deserve to know. I deserve to know if Caroline will finally be able to go to a Christmas service this year or meet Santa in person. Please do better for Caroline and children who can't assess personal risk and who are too little to wear a mask. Take decisive actions now to bring timelines together. Young children need access to boosters in order to be, as Caroline would say, all done with COVID too. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next, we have Dr. Julie Boone. Hello, can you hear me? No, we can, please go Thank ahead. You. Thank you. The last two and a half years have been a sobering reminder of the discomfort and devastation that infectious diseases can cause in our lives. Despite the relentless work of the medical and scientific communities to develop SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, we have lost over 1,040,000 lives to COVID-19. In addition, over 200,000 U.S. children have lost one or both parents to COVID-19. Gratefully, COVID-19 vaccines have dramatically decreased hospitalization rates and deaths since their implementation. Despite strong vaccine effectiveness and outstanding uptake by persons over 65 years of age, COVID-19 vaccine uptake has been suboptimal, especially among children. From a recent summary of CDC data shared by the American Academy of Pediatrics, 60% of teens 12 and older have received two doses of COVID-19 vaccine doses, while only 30% of children 5 to 11 years of age have received two doses. 
Sadly, only 7% of children six months to five years have received one or more doses of COVID-19 vaccine. Even though children have experienced much lower hospitalization and death rates compared to adults, over 1,700 children have died from COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic. As you examine the evidence to recommend bivalent COVID-19 boosters for persons 12 years and up, I urge you to consider one of the most important factors contributing to low vaccine uptake, vaccine hesitancy. Unfortunately, vaccine hesitancy is not only impacting COVID-19 vaccines, but also routine childhood vaccine. As evidenced by wastewater surveillance, poliomyelitis has found its way back into the United States and has caused a preventable case of paralysis in an unvaccinated adult in New York. Even though many thought a serious pandemic would diminish anti-vaccine sentiment, the opposite has occurred. Espousing personal liberty and individualism, many have spread information on social media, preying on worried parents, many who are just trying to do the best thing for their child. Beyond polio, we are now faced with the spread of monkeypox. Sadly, the first U.S. death from monkeypox occurred in my county, Harris County. At Texas Children's Hospital, we are again working quickly and diligently to partner with our local and safe health departments to ensure we can assist with vaccination of persons at risk or who have been exposed to monkeypox. As a general pediatrician with 27 years of experience and director of the immunization project at Texas Children's Hospital, I know that vaccines are the best way to pr protect persons from contagious diseases. We must do everything we can to eliminate vaccine preventable diseases in our communities and globally, which includes not only recommending and administering vaccines, but clearly communicating, communicating vaccine safety and benefit information to address misinformation and hesitancy. I urge you to give these factors your every consideration today. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Ms. Catherine Falk. Ms. Falk, uh, I believe you're still muted. Okay, uh, you may have stepped away. Uh, why don't we move to the next public comment speaker, uh, Dr. Abraham Al Wait, Alhamad. Wait, I got it, I got it, I'm sorry. Well, okay, okay, go ahead, Ms. Falk. <laughs> okay. Please go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Catherine Falk, a parent and vaccine advocate in Oakland, California. I want to again thank the committee for all their work. I've commented before. Um, we're in our third year with this pandemic, and while I'm excited about a new and hopefully better booster, I'm also somewhat trepidatious. Not about any risk from the vaccine itself. I'll be getting it along with my whole family as soon as we can, but about the public reception and willingness to take advantage of it. In Alameda County, where I live, 90.4% of us got one shot, 83.3% got two, but only 56.4% got a booster. This is all ages. Combine this with the lack of real push for mask wearing anymore. And no wonder this season could have been referred to as hot zone summer. We need better communication and clearer messaging from our public officials and the CDC. And for the booster, carefully managed expectations. The other thing I wanna bring up is VAERS because I'm seeing it brought up a lot online. Anti-vaxxers are hard at work as usual doing their utmost worst to scare people into skipping boosters for themselves and their children. And they are using VARES as one of their tools. I've started describing VARES to people as a tip line. I think that's a good analogy since a tip line is an important part of any law enforcement or public safety system, even if some of the tips themselves are not helpful or even accurate. But I think the VARES website could use some refreshing and the communication about what it is and isn't for needs to be clear and reiterated at every level. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And our last speaker is Dr. Abraham al -Hamad. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Abraham al -Hamad. I'm an assistant professor of pharmacology at Texas Tech University Health Science Center, J.H. Og, School of Pharmacy in Amaro, Texas. First, I would like to thank the committee and staff for the outstanding effort to put work in this meeting in the past and during this pandemic, ensuring that life-saving vaccines are recommended in a transparent manner to the public. My only comment and concern today that I share with the committee is the rather confusing messaging about booster and a vaccination rate of our children below the age of 12, which have been lagging in the uptake as we are heading to the full winter season, a period of the year 
In the past year have been shown to be worse in the six suspend handle when it comes to the most cases, hospitalization and death. These vaccines are very safe, they still hold on against Omicron variants. They have been quite aggressive on the population here uh, based on the number of like, COVID-19 pediatric admissions that occurred in the panhandle. The co this concern is particularly even more accentuated in rural areas that I have witnessed here in the Texas panhandle. To give you numbers, we only have yet to reach 50% of the population of the panhandle who fully vaccinated with two doses. We, only, we have only 20% with one booster dose. The Texas panhandle has historically far worse than the state average when it comes to states of cases, uh, stress healthcare system, and facilities in the to the pandemic. It is unlikely due to vaccine shortages. It's like imported due to like a massive anti-vaccine campaign by various entities that have been very successful in favor of it to population needing the most. If the committee and the CDC can improve the communication and outreach to the public with clear, accessible and consistent messaging across the board, but also tailor it to a population falling behind the vaccination rate as the vaccine movement have been very successful in seeing doubts and fears within this population, it will be clearly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, and with that, we have completed our public comment session. I want to thank our public comment speakers for your willingness to engage in the deliberations today. Um, also would like to thank those who provided written comments as well. Um, now, what I would like to do is take a short break um, and just confirm that uh, we will get our next speakers on the line. So why don't we take a, uh, uh, let me ask uh, Stephanie or Dr. Wharton or Dr. McNeil, uh, five, ten minutes. Uh, that's fine, Dr. Lee, either one. Okay. Uh, why don't we take five minutes, if that's okay with everybody? So actually, let's meet. Well, let's meet at um, 50 minutes after the hour, five zero. So uh, we'll see you back in about eight minutes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Lee.
Thank you, everyone, and welcome back to the ACIP meeting. We'll reconvene um, now. Our first uh, presentation for the next session will be from, I want to make sure I get the, oh, thank you, <laughs> from Dr. Miller, who will be speaking about booster doses of Moderna COVID-19 vaccines in adults, adolescents, and children. Dr. Miller. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Um, so, uh, good afternoon. My name is Jacqueline Miller and I'm the Therapeutic Area Head for Infectious Diseases at Moderna. Thank you to the CDC and the ACIP for all of your hard work and excellent guidance through this pandemic. It's my pleasure this afternoon to present the clinical data for Moderna's Omicron-containing booster vaccines. Next slide, please. Thank you. So for the fall U.S. booster campaign, Moderna is producing a 50 microgram bivalent vaccine containing 25 micrograms of mRNA encoding the original strain spike protein sequence and 25 micrograms encoding the sequence for the spike protein of ba 45 The indication is for a single 50 microgram booster administered at least two months after either completion of the primary series or receipt of a booster dose of any authorized or approved monovalent COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. Although mRNA-1273 protects against variants of concern, and especially in the case of severe disease, the purpose of adding mRNA encoding variant sequences to the booster doses is to improve the immunogenicity against Omicron lineages, which have remained dominant for the past eight months, induce a broader cross-neutralization response to other potential variants of concern, and to extend the duration of protection. In the slides that follow, I will share the data that consistently show the ability of these bivalent variant vaccines to address these goals. Next slide, please. Slide. Thank you. Uh, as the virus has continued to evolve, Moderna has evaluated three monovalent and four bivalent vaccine candidates designed to address variants of concern. More than 7,000 adults have received a booster dose of one of these vaccine candidates. Clinical data are primarily available for the beta and Omicron BA1 vaccine. The BA45 bivalent vaccine was in a clinical trial which completed enrollment last week, and data are anticipated to be available at the end of the year. Just a note about nomenclature. You'll see uh, three uh, candidates mentioned in this presentation, which combine 25 micrograms of mRNA encoding the original strain and 25 micrograms of a variant of concern. The 211 uh, vaccine contains the beta variant. The 214 vaccine contains BA1 Omicron. And the 222 vaccine contains BA45. To avoid confusion about the numbering system, uh, I'll be referring to these bivalent variants by the name of the variant of concern sequence that's contained in the vaccine versus mRNA-1273. Next slide, please. So I'd now like to review the available clinical data for the bivalent SARS-CoV-2 vaccines targeting variants of concern. Next slide. Currently available clinical data includes safety, immunogenicity, and six-month antibody persistence data from 300 participants who received the beta-containing bivalent vaccine. Median follow-up in these subjects is 245 days after the third dose booster. After the fourth dose, safety and immunogenicity data are available in 437 participants who received the Omicron ba one containing vaccine. And these individuals have been followed for a median of 43 days. These clinical data form the basis of our submission for bivalent boosters. There are also uh, pending data from the 512 participants 
who were recently vaccinated with the Omicron BA4-5 containing vaccine. So this trial completed enrollment last week and the data are expected um, later this year. Next slide, please. Slide. The demographic data from our study of the BA1 bivalent vaccine are presented here as compared to the mRNA-1273 fourth dose control group. Third doses in these uh, groups were given approximately eight months after completion of the primary series. And then the fourth dose was administered approximately four and a half months after the third. About one quarter of these participants had evidence of prior SARS-CoV-2 infection at the pre-booster time point. Next slide. So on this slide, I am displaying for you in the darkest blue, the fourth dose BA1 Omicron containing bivalent booster compared to in the lightest blue, post dose two with mRNA 1273 and in the medium blue, post dose three mRNA 1273. Um, in this study, the solicited local adverse reactions included injection site pain, erythema, and swelling, as well as axillary swelling and tenderness. And the reported rates after dose two, three, and four um, are at least similar or lower than uh, mRNA-1273 second and third doses in the bivalent Omicron BA1 containing fourth dose vaccine. Um, importantly, there were no grade four events reported after the BA1 uh, booster. Next slide. And now this slide shows the same three groups um, in terms of the systemic solicited symptoms. And um, in this case and in the previous case, uh, the hashed bar represents the grade three events. Overall, both the frequency and severity of the solicited systemic reactions were observed to be lower after a bivalent fourth dose booster than after mRNA-1273 administered as a second or third dose. And once again, no grade four reactions were reported after the BA1 containing booster. Next slide. Now this slide reviews the unsolicited AEs that were reported within 28 days after vaccination. Rates of each category of AE were similar between the mRNA-1273 and BA1 bivalent vaccine groups. Among the three SAEs reported, cases of prostate cancer and traumatic fracture were reported in the BA1 bivalent group and a single case of spinal osteoarthritis in the mRNA-1273 group. None of these SAEs were considered by the investigators to be vaccine-related, and there were no cases of myo or pericarditis reported in either group. Next slide, please. So now we'll shift to talking about the immunogenicity analyses, which were used in this study to infer effectiveness. The primary objectives of our study were to demonstrate the superiority of the BA1 containing vaccine over 1273 in terms of neutralizing antibody responses to BA1 and to demonstrate the non inferiority of the bivalent vaccine to 1273 in terms of the original strain neutralizing antibody titers. So, this slide first shows the BA1 superiority hypothesis. There were two uh, criterion to assess success. The first was that the BA1 GMT ratio had to have a 97.5% confidence interval lower bound, which exceeded 1.0. The actual ratio was 1.75 with a lower bound of 1.49. So this criterion was met. The second criterion was that the lower bound of the 97.5 confidence interval around the group difference in zero response rates would exceed minus 10%. And this was also met with a point estimate of 1.5% and a lower bound of minus 1.1%. Slide. So 
So now in terms of the non-inferiority hypotheses to the immune responses against the original strain. In this case, the lower bound of the 97.5% confidence interval had to be greater than 0.67, and this was met with a point estimate of 1.22 and a lower bound of 0.108, or 1.08, excuse me. For the group difference in serial response rate, the lower bound had to be greater than minus 10%, and this was also met as the response rates in both groups were 100%. And therefore, the study met the primary objective to demonstrate superiority in terms of BA1 antibody titers and non-inferiority in terms of mRNA, um, in terms of original strain neutralizing antibody titers. So next slide, please. So importantly, the primary hypotheses were evaluated in subjects who had no evidence of prior infection. But we also know that at this moment in time, many vaccinated individuals have experienced SARS-CoV-2 infection. And as I mentioned, it was about a quarter of the participants in this particular study. So this slide shows the geometric mean titers and the full rises uh, to BA1 in all participants, regardless of previous SARS-CoV-2 infection. And you see it both for the mRNA-1273 group in medium blue and the Omicron BA.1 containing bivalent vaccine in dark blue. So even in subjects with evidence of prior infection who were observed to have substantially higher pre-vaccination titers derived benefits from the BA.1 bivalent vaccine with a fourfold rise in post-vaccination titers to Omicron BA.1. This exceeds the 2.5-fold rise observed in the mRNA-1273 group and led to a GMT ratio of 1.9 and a lower bound of the 95% confidence interval of 1.5. Next slide. Improved uh, antibody titers to the Omicron sublineages was a major objective for developing the bivalent vaccine. And this slide shows the consistency of that finding uh, across age groups. So you see the antibody titers to BA.1 and the original strain stratified by age groups, 18 to less than 65 years and greater than or equal to 65 years of age. Post-vaccination, the BA.1 bivalent vaccine was consistently immunogenic to both the original and BA.1 strains in subjects over 65 years of age who are at increased risk for the severe complications of COVID-19. The observed antibody titers against the BA1 variant of concern were higher with the bivalent vaccine as compared to 1273, regardless of age stratum. Next slide, please. So we also examined antibody titers to the original and BA1 strains in subjects stratified by race. For both strains evaluated, the BA1 bivalent vaccine was consistently immunogenic across age groups. Next slide. The induction of cross protection to other Omicron sublineages was another major objective for the development of the bivalent booster vaccine. We evaluated the ability of antibody titers induced by BA1 bi bivalent vaccine and mRNA-1273 to cross-neutralize BA45, stratified by evidence of prior infection. Both vaccines demonstrated increase in GMTs to BA45, which showed evidence of cross-neutralization, but the higher antibody titers induced with the BA1 booster give us reason to anticipate that the BA45 bivalent vaccine, which is matched the currently circulating strain will lead to improved antibody titers. Next slide, please. We have also stratified the antibody titers to BA45 by evidence of prior infection and age group. And as observed with the BA1 antibodies, the bivalent vaccines consistently induce numerically higher titers against BA45 across age strata which indicates that those adults over 65 years of age will also benefit from cross-protection conferred by the bivalent vaccine. 
slide, please. Bivalent vaccines were also developed to induce better cross protection to strains which are not included in the vaccine. On this slide, we show antibody titers and relative GMT ratios in terms of binding antibodies for the BA1 bivalent vaccine compared to mRNA-1273 at 28 days post-vaccination. And for all variant studies, including alpha, beta, delta, and gamma, binding antibody titers were significantly higher with the BA1 bivalent vaccine as compared to 1273. Recognizing that neutralizing antibody data are also important with this vaccine, we are in the process of generating those data and we'll share them when available. Next slide, please. So I also wanted to show you uh, data with respect to antibody persistence, because this is another important consideration for the bivalent vaccine. These are data from the individuals who received the uh, beta-containing variant vaccine. And what you see in each bar is the geometric mean ratio compared to mRNA-1273. This is comparing a third dose to a third dose at first day 29 and then day 181 or six months after vaccination. Um, and it's showing it for the original uh, strain with uh, D614G and also the beta, Omicron, and Delta variants. And while the GM GMT ratio for the beta is consistently higher than one, Importantly, the GMT ratios increased even further for the original strain beta and Omicron BA1 at six months after vaccination, which suggests that the bivalent boosters may improve the longer-term cross-neutralizing antibody durability. Next slide, please. So now moving to specific data, which have been generated with the BA45 bivalent vaccine, I would like to present the non-clinical data in mice, which has supported our EUA submission. Next slide. So we evaluated the BA45 bivalent vaccine in a murine animal model expressing a human ACE2 receptor. These mice were previously primed with mRNA-1273 and then were boosted uh, approximately uh, 31 weeks later, with the BA45 containing bivalent vaccine in purple, the BA1 bivalent vaccine in orange, and mRNA-1273 in blue, with a sham vaccination presented in red. The two bivalent vaccines both induce statistically significantly higher antibody titers against the Omicron sublineages as compared to mRNA-1273. Next slide. So these mice were then challenged with 10 to the fourth platforming unit of a BA5 strain four weeks after the booster dose was given. And these graphs show the number of SARS-CoV-2 viral copies obtained from the lungs and the nasal turbinate. The two bivalent vaccines reduced copy numbers in challenged animals, particularly in samples taken from the lungs, which is an important marker of severe disease. And as we have consistently observed that results from our murine challenge studies correlated with observations in human clinical trials, these data are supportive of the immunogenicity of the BA45 containing bivalent vaccine. But and finally, um, I will mention that we are generating data with booster doses in the pediatric population. Next slide. And then one more slide, please. Um, our submissions of booster data generated in children 12 to 17 and 6 to 11 years of age are currently ongoing to the US FDA. The original pediatric studies were extended to evaluate booster studies of mRNA-1273 in these populations. And similar to adults, where the booster is administered at half the dose of the primary series, adolescents receive a booster of 50 micrograms after a 100 microgram primary series, and children 6 to 11 years of age receive a 25 microgram booster 
after a primary series of 50 micrograms. So we expect to complete these submissions by mid-September. Next slide. And then in the youngest age stratum of children six months to five years of age, we're evaluating a primary series with a bivalent BA1 containing vaccine and booster doses with both mRNA-1273 and the BA1 bivalent vaccine. Results from this trial should be available by the end of the year. And we are also exploring ways to evaluate primary series and boosters with the BA45 vaccine. Slide. In summary, the bivalent booster vaccines have been generally well tolerated in individuals over 18 years of age. The local and systemic reactogenicity are generally similar to or lower than that observed with dose two and dose three of mRNA-1273. No new safety concerns have been observed in our booster vaccine studies. Our pre-specified immunogenicity objectives, which align with FDA guidance for the licensure of uh, bivalent booster vaccines, were met for superiority to BA1 and non-inferiority to the original strain. There were significantly higher antibody titers to BA45 with the BA1 bivalent vaccine, and binding antibody titers were also higher than 1273 against more distant um, variants of concern. The higher immune responses were also observed in individuals over 65 years of age who were at the highest risk for the complications of um, severe COVID-19 disease. Our beta-containing bivalent vaccines demonstrated improved durability of neutralizing antibodies compared to mRNA-1273 at six months after vaccination. Preclinical data for the ba 45 containing bivalent vaccine in mice is supportive of vaccine effectiveness, and this is being verified in an ongoing clinical trial. Next slide, please. So I'd like to conclude again with reiterating our thanks to the ACIP um, and for the opportunity to present these data. And thanks once again to the investigators, site personnel, and study participants in our clinical trial. Uh, before taking any questions, um, there was a question um, stated earlier in the discussion around um, the presentation of booster vaccines. And so I'd like to say that um, the bivalent BA45 vaccine um, will be presented in a two and a half ml vial. Um, it's intended to have a 0.5 ml administration uh, to adults over um, 18 years of age. And um, as we're reducing the number of doses in the multi-dose vial, we're working towards um, the future looking for single syringe presentation. I'll conclude there and ask um, if there are any questions I can answer. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. This presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Brooks. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, you showed a slide that had uh, viral particles in the respiratory, upper respiratory and then in the lungs of the mice in the in your clinical studies for your for the other vaccine i mean for the well the other age groups and with um, not booster did you measure uh lot particle viral particles in the respiratory tract that we're going to look at that kind of the, as a correlate of uh vaccine efficacy in adults yeah in so um I, I'm going to call in a moment on one of my colleagues from the research group who actually conducted these studies. But what I will say is um, we did conduct challenge studies in the mouse model um, prior to initiating our first clinical trials with mRNA-1273. And we did so um, to give evidence that um, the vaccine is capable of um, inducing antibodies that can neutralize virus and protect against infection in the various um, areas of the respiratory tract. So ultimately, the best data, of course, come from um, human clinical trials. Um, as we switched from um, the BA1 variant vaccine that we had initially prepared to discuss um, at the VRPAC in June 
Over the summer to the BA45 containing vaccine, we have been able to manufacture um, doses and conduct the clinical trials in the mice more quickly than we've been able to execute the human clinical trial. So the data um, then further supporting the BA45 will come from um, the clinical trial whose enrollment just completed and that will present um, later this year. Uh, but the beta containing variant and the BA1 containing variant vaccine both performed in a similar way, um, demonstrated superior antibody titers to the variant of concern as compared to 1273 and non-inferiority to the original strain. So we believe that the consistency of the clinical results are really the basis um, on, on which we um, are uh, licensing or authorizing the vaccine. But I'm gonna ask Dr. Edwards if you wanna make any other comment about how those challenge studies were done. Yes, thank you, Dr. Miller. My name is Darren Edwards and I've led the research for our SARS-CoV-2 vaccines for the last two and a half years. Um, what I can say about the animal studies that we performed over the course of the development of our original vaccine, as well as the, in the evaluation of our bivalent vaccines, is uh, what was represented as a common measurement that we perform in animal studies. And that includes both mouse studies, hamster studies, as well as non-human primate studies. It's a good measurement um, to indicate the level of protection that's provided uh, for the different vaccine regimens. Unfortunately, it's not something that we can perform clinically due to uh, constraints around certain types of sampling that we uh, could perform within clinical studies. So that's why we've either relied on efficacy measurements or post, um, <clears throat> post clinical um, observations in order to establish efficacy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll move to Dr. Sinaeus. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for that presentation. Um, I have a question about whether uh, we have any data on breakthrough cases, um, clinical cases in the BA1 group versus the mRNA 1273, or whether there has not been enough follow-up time for, uh, for that data. Uh, so we don't have those data yet for the BA45 containing vaccine, um, but because we have the median of 43 days of follow-up after BA1, um, we do have those data. And um, there's disease incidence rates in the 1273 group versus the BA1 containing vaccine group um, were followed and compared. They were followed both for subjects with um, no evidence of prior infection and subjects with evidence of prior infection. Um, in the um, BA1 uh, uh, bivalent group, the um, incidence rate was 2.5%, and in the mRNA-1273 group, the rate was 2.4%. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bata? Thank you, um, and thank you, Dr. Miller, for this um, succinct overview. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm wondering if we could go to slide 18, and if you could talk a little bit. You talked about significantly higher, and it, to me, it looks like the confidence intervals are overlapping. So can you explain this to me? Yeah. Um, so the um, geometric mean ratios, which are given in the top bar, that's immediately below the name of the variant of concern, is followed by a 95% confidence interval. And those 95% confidence intervals um, uh, are all above the value of, of one. Um, and so these are the between group comparisons um, that we perform in an exploratory fashion to look at comparisons between groups. They do, um, to your point, need to be um, interpreted a bit conservatively because um, the multiplicity adjustments are really made for the primary endpoints of the trial. Um, but we do feel that these um, data are really uh, indicative that um, we may expect to see higher neutralizing antibody titers. Um, as we've seen uh, for the beta-containing vaccine at 28 days after vaccination and then um, obviously larger and tighter, uh, uh, higher GMRs and tighter confidence intervals after six months. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you for that presentation. And um, certainly uh, we need to move forward with these um, vaccines to cover other variants. But I do have a, so on, when you see studies that you're planning to do 
or that you're ongoing in children six months to five years? Um, are they also, and I think this is slide 25, and you may have said this, but I may have missed it. Um, these are also with the BA1 vaccine? Yeah, these are um, also with the BA1 vaccine, um, but we have been also requested to conduct um, clinical trial work with the BA4-5 vaccine. And so um, we are currently in the process of figuring out the best way to do that in the pediatric population. Our strategy um, all along, as we've been trying to generate data as quickly as possible to enable implementation of a vaccination program before the um, fall, winter, cold and flu season, um, has been to bracket our investigations of um, the bivalent vaccine um, in adults, and particularly in the oldest adults at over age 65, and then in the youngest um, children, six months to five years of age, to um, provide um, a, a view of the antibody titers at um, both of the extremes of age. But um, we certainly are extending the Kaiser Effectiveness Study that we've talked about a number of times in this committee together. Um, to look at the BA45, um, and that uh, protocol is being extended down to six months of age and to booster doses um, for the pediatric population. So I think that may be the best evidence that we're able to demonstrate in the future. So, um, and I'm sorry, I have a, several questions. Um, oh, Dr. Sanchez, I'm going to give you one question, and then we're going to go down, and we'll see how much time we have left, okay? Can I, well, um, I just want to comment. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that the data that you present in humans is on the, you know, the BA1 vaccine. Um, and, you know, it certainly looks very promising. And I understand the constant shift of, um, of these variants. But we really, you have not, I mean, these studies with the BA4 and 5 are ongoing in humans. And I, I'm just wondering whether it's a little bit premature. Thank you. Yeah, um, so you're absolutely right that the clinical data that we had prepared for the fall campaign was assuming predominance of the BA1 strain for Omicron. Um, it is why we have looked at the BA4-5 neutralizing capability of the BA1 vaccine um, because the two um, Omicron sublineages are obviously related. So there's about a four mutation difference between them as opposed to about a 35 mutation difference between um, the original strain and the, Om the BA1 Omicron um, vaccine. Uh, but we um, you know, will continue to, to generate the BA4-5 containing data. We anticipate that just as the beta containing variant and the BA1 containing variant bivalent data were really consistent with each other. And in the interest of time, I wasn't able to present to you the data from the original um, beta containing variant cohort, but both in terms of safety and in terms of the patterns of immunogenicity. So the improved immunogenicity to variants of concern, both for the sequence in the vaccine, but also um, across uh, other variants of concern as compared to the original strain and the safety data um, and the reducing reactogenicity profile that we see after subsequent doses has been really consistent between um, both of the bivalent formulations um, studied. And so I think by continuing to cover um, through clinical data, the BA45 continuing to study, it's really the best we can do to be able to be ready for the fall um, uh, cold and winter flu season with the vaccine that best matches the current circulating strain. I, I understand, that, um, and the data that you present certainly look excellent for the BA1 variant, but anyway, okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Paling. Yes, thank you for this presentation. I um, wanted to ask um, about the clinical studies, and I, if I understood it correct, the longest follow-up um, at 245 days would be with the beta variant, bivalent vaccine. And one of the big questions that we're trying to understand is to what extent do you see waning? And could you show us um, some clinical data on the waning with the beta variant over the 245 days? 
Thank you. Sure. And um, while we look for that slide, maybe um, what I will say is the reason why we have uh, data from the um, beta variant um, is obviously because the beta variant emerged in um, fall of 2020. And so we've had a bit longer to follow those subjects than with the BA1 containing variant, which emerged around Thanksgiving of last year. Um, so let me uh, look and see um, if I can present to you the slides though that you're asking. It's going to take me a minute and I apologize for that because it's actually CDC that's um, showing the slides right now. Okay, I found it. Hang on one second. Let me see if I can figure out now on Zoom how to how to share. Well, unfortunately, I don't think I can because it keeps telling me that uh, host participants um, has disabled sharing. So I apologize that I'm not able to show you the slide, but perhaps we can provide it to CDC and show it later. Did you want to describe the slide, Dr. Miller? Sure, I, I can do that. I mean, in, in um, all cases, the um, antibody um, titers with the um, uh, beta bivalent containing vaccine um, are numerically higher than what we see with the 1273 vaccine. And the distance between the two actually increases um, at the six month time point. And we believe that there is a biologic basis for this. It's actually why um, we advocated fairly strongly for the bivalent um, composition. And it's because um, when the mRNA in a bivalent formulation is delivered to the cell, uh, both mRNAs, so the mRNA for the um, original strain spike sequence and uh, for the whatever the um, bivalent containing sequence is, are delivered to the cell, which means that the ribosomes are translating um, in the same cell strands of both the original and the variant of concern. These um, uh, amino acid chains still naturally assemble into trimers, um, but we've been working with the University of Washington and uh, been able to demonstrate in a publication that we're in the process of submitting that um, heterotrimers are actually formed. So what that means is unlike with the original 1273, where the original strain spike sequence is the only one available, um, we have uh, sequences from both the original strain and the variant of concern. It actually leads to uh, more open confirmation and exposure of additional antigens. And um, we believe that it's exposure to those additional antigens that's leading to the improved antibody persistence, not only against the variant of concern, but against um, the original strain and other variants as well. Thank you. Uh, and that, that would be wonderful if you're willing to share that uh, to, with the committee. We'd really appreciate it. Um, next, Dr. Cotton. Thanks very much for your presentation, which was um, very clear. Um, I was wondering about 3% um, of the U.S. population is estimated to be immunocompromised, and I was wondering if they were included in any of these cohorts and uh, if you had further data or what plans are for studying that population, which has been exceptionally vulnerable to COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I didn't present the data today, but we've actually conducted a separate Moderna-sponsored clinical trial in patients with solid organ transplants. And then um, we've also supported a collaborator um, in a clinical trial investigating um, booster doses in um, patients with uh, solid tumors as well as hematologic cancers. Um, and in both cases, uh, we've been able to observe that the vaccine is immunogenic and does lead to additional immune responses. So um, in the um, cancer population, we had studied three doses, and then in the transplant population, up to four doses. So those data are actually going to form um, part of the basis of our supplemental BLA um, for booster dose full licensure as opposed to EUA authorization. 
And we're actively working on that submission now by the end of the year to prepare ourselves for the 2023 season. Do you think we would have access to that data so that we can better inform our patients as to what the best uh, plan would be for them? Certainly. Um, the um, data in cancer patients has already been published, and we'll share those uh, that publication with the committee. And then um, we have the data from the um, solid organ transplant patients that we can also share with the committee. Thank you. Thank you. That would be terrific. Ms. McNally. Thank you, Dr. Miller. I'm the consumer representative, and I'd like to try and distill down an issue for the public. If you can answer this question, to what extent, if any, did Moderna's research and development process differ in the creation of the bivalent vaccine from the original vaccine? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, the original vaccine was part of a uh, clinical development program. Uh, that included uh, the phase one, two, and three clinical trials. Um, we view the bivalent vaccines as ex extensions of the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. So much like you change your flu vaccine every year as the um, influenza virus evolves, and you don't study a full efficacy trial each year with influenza vaccines, um, we are measuring immune responses and inferring effectiveness uh, because we have observed that immune responses really correlate um, with protection against disease. And those are data that actually Moderna has published um, in conjunction with the NIH recently in Science um, Magazine and so, uh, or journal. And so um, moving forward, as we have done with influenza vaccines, we continue to evaluate the clinical data and compare those immune responses and show the consistency to the original clinical trial. Thank you very much for the information. Thank you. Dr. Lair? Thank you. I'd like to follow up on Dr. Sanchez's comments and Dr. Miller's last comments. I do recognize that these are animal studies for the B45 variant, but I also agree that this is the future that we're heading for, which is we're going to have more variants, and we should be treating this like the flu, where the variants, if we have evidence that the pattern seems to flow smoothly and that we can use new strain variants every year, I think that's the way we're going to be going over the next several years. So after thinking about it, I am comfortable, even though we don't have human data and just animal data, of supporting the B4 or 5 variant um, booster. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Dr. Duchin? Thank you. Uh, related question. Um, the um, comment that you made about how the mouse study data uh, accurately predicted what we know now through human uh, data um, for earlier, uh, for the 1273 uh, variant. I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about that, um, that, that would help people understand, you know, the relevance of the mouse data and how it, it is, um, at least uh, has been, um, uh, a useful and accurate um, predictor of what we see in humans. Sure, Dr. Um, Dushin, and um, I'm going to start, but then I'm going to ask Dr. Edwards also to fill in because he's much more of an expert in these models than I. But I think the real um, value of this particular murine model is that the um, animals express the human ACE2 receptor. And the reason why that's important is the ACE2 receptor in humans is actually the port of entry into, um, into cells uh, by this virus, into human cells. And so by um, using an animal that is expressing that same protein, um, we're really able to see um, the impact that the um, biology of the vaccine has on the um, animal that would be susceptible to infection in the same way a human would be. And Dr. Edwards, is there anything else you wanna say? Thank you, Dr. Miller. Yes, um, I think it's highly relevant. Two additional points are highly relevant. One, we now have two and a half years of experience with these animal models and how they do correlate to human immune responses. And we have seen very good correlation between effective uh, doses and effective uh, uh, bivalent vaccines between mice, non-human primates, and humans to this point. One particularly relevant point, though, is we do measure in these animal studies uh, the impact of variants on uh, neutralizing titers. 
Um, so, for example, a BA1 neutralizing titer in a mouse vaccinated with 1273 is many-fold reduced versus the original strain. And we see the same thing um, uh, recapitulated uh, when, when we're assessing uh, human sera. So both from a immunogenicity standpoint and an impact of variant standpoint, uh, these animal models have translated very well. Those are very helpful comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Sanchez? Um, thanks again. Um, question. Studies in pregnancy and um, and then the other one is really more basic and just trying to get an idea of how the vaccine is formulated. Are these two different messenger RNA strains that are encoding um, the, you know, the different spike proteins or is this one strand that codes both? And does the ultimate protein cross the placenta? Um, okay, again, I'm gonna start and then I'm going to actually um, ask some other experts um, to help me, particularly Dr. Edwards. Um, but maybe first to start with respect to um, pregnancy. So we are conducting um, a safety follow-up study in, in pregnant women. Um, it's a registry where the study is currently um, ongoing and will examine um, approximately 800 uh, pregnancies overall. Um, the question around um, the mRNA sequences. So there are two distinct mRNA sequences. Um, the first sequence is the original sequence that was in uh, mRNA 1273. It encodes for the full-length spike protein from the original Wuhan strain. The second um, sequence um, includes uh, the sequence from a BA45, and it's important to note that the um, spike protein sequence is identical from BA4, BA5, which is why um, we refer to it as a BA45 um, sequence. Um, those two uh, are individual um, sequences on lipid nanoparticles. Um, the, those lipid nanoparticles, though more than one, is able to enter the cell, and that's how um, both uh, mRNA sequences are able to be translated inside the same cell. Um, and then in terms of um, transfer across the placenta, so we have conducted um, developmental and um, reproductive toxicology studies with mRNA-1273, but also um, with other vaccines in our pipeline, um, maybe in particular a CMV vaccine that's actually a hexavalent vaccine. Um, and we do not see um, that um, the uh, pregnancy or fetus is impacted by vaccination. But I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Edwards uh, to comment further on the pregnancy piece. Thank you, Dr. Miller. So um, on the mRNA uh, uh, response, um, just one clarification. So the two mRNAs that are included are co-formulated in the same lipid nanoparticles and delivered then to the same cells. Uh, further, we also um, introduced to both mRNAs the two proline mutations that stabilize the confirmation of the spike protein into the prefusion confirmation. <clears throat> Um, and then on the pregnancy piece, we do have evidence from, from animal studies that there is placental transfer of um, both IgG and to a limited degree IgA. And that also includes uh, uh, maternal transfer via breast milk. Thank you. How about the protein? I, Sorry. <laughs> what was your question? How about the protein that's, gen the, um, you know, the the protein that's generated by the, by the messenger RNA, it, does that cross the placenta? Uh, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, done uh, developmental and reproductive toxicity studies, um, and um, maybe we can come back at a, a later time point during this call to, to share the results from those studies. I, unfortunately, am not the expert on that study, um, and I don't believe our, our tox expert is, is available. But we can, we can get back to you on, later on this call. Thank and, you. And Dr. Edwards, I apologize. I was on mute. What I was going to say, Dr. Sanchez, is um, I didn't understand your question initially. But, I mean, in terms of the, the protein, this protein has been engineered to be cell surface expressed. So um, it's not a protein that is secreted um, in the same way that like a subunit protein um, might be injected and, and flowing freely. It is mRNA 
that um, is um, entering the cells, and then the protein itself is cell surface expressed, so it's not secreted protein. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have one last question, then we should move on, uh, and hopefully mine is quick. Uh, on slide seven, I was noting the um, interval between the third and the fourth dose. Uh, looks like the average is four and a half months, uh, but the lower range is at around three months. And so this is probably a combination question. Uh, the authors uh, to Moderna and to FDA, um, but the lower uh, lower band or sort of lower end of the approval is two months from the last prior dose or the last dose. Uh, do we have any safety data for that two to three month window? So um, we are generating data um, with respect to the two month window um, in collaboration with the NIH in the Covail study. The data we have available now comes from previous collaborations with the NIH um, in the three month window. Um, and I think um, the two month window um, had been requested of us based on um, the desire to uh, make boosters available prior to potential increases in infection rates. But um, others may want to um, comment, at, perhaps from the FDA. Yeah, hi, this, this is Doran Fink from the US FDA. So it, that's correct. We, we don't have uh, clinical trial data or significant uh, real world data with a booster dose. Uh, at a two-month interval. Um, however, we, we do have data with booster dose intervals ranging from three months through up to six, seven, eight months or longer that for vaccine reactogenicity uh, really don't, don't seem to show uh, a difference uh, in, the, in the level of reactogenicity uh, uh, compared to uh, the, the interval. Um, I, I, I know that one uh, specific concern about the interval is the, the risk of, of vaccine-associated myocarditis um, that, that has been observed most prominently following uh, the second primary series dose and also uh, a first booster dose in, in certain populations. We don't have data one way or another uh, that would suggest that a, the risk of myocarditis um, would be higher or, or lower uh, following an interval of, of two months as opposed to, say, three months. And frankly, any clinical trials uh, of, of the, the size that, that we really um, uh, are able to, to look at for, for considering the uh, authorization of these booster doses wouldn't be adequately powered to look at at myocarditis anyway. We, we do have experience, as, as the committee knows, with uh, the risk of myocarditis relative to the primary series interval between first and second doses. And, and those data uh, uh, indicate that, that the risk when, when the primary series doses are separated by at least two months uh, uh, appears to be lower than, than when the primary series doses are administered closer together and no uh, further reduced risk with, with intervals longer than two months. So based on the totality of, of evidence that we do have at hand and also considering the, the timeliness of making this booster dose available to, to uh, individuals who, who may have received their last vaccination more recently, um, those, those considerations really underlie uh, FDA's uh, decision to authorize uh, these bivalent boosters with a minimum interval of, of at least two months. I, I also do want to um, stress that, that that we understand that most people uh, who would be eligible for these second boosters will have received their uh, COVID their, their last COVID nineteen vaccination uh, well beyond two months previously, and so um, we we are talking about really a, a relatively small uh, fraction of, of individuals who might be considering uh, getting one of these bivalent boosters at, at an interval of, of close to, to two months. Thank you. Thank you both for that thorough response. Um, one last question for you from prior. I just want to make sure we close the loop. 
the question came up at the last meeting and earlier during this meeting around the VAERS adverse event reporting uh, regarding uh, potential administration errors and the concern that the committee has had with regard to labeling. Could you comment on whether or uh, you commented on the, you know, hopefully single dose syringes, but is there any plan to uh, modify or make that labeling more clear to minimize the risk of administration errors going forward? Yeah, um, I'm going to um, ask um, my colleague Louise from the um, manufacturing um, group to maybe comment further, but um, it certainly is the intent that we get to product-specific presentation um, for each individual presentation. But Luis, anything else you want to say? Yeah, good afternoon. This is Luis Mustafa, uh, VP of CNC Strategic Operation. Yeah, Dr. Miller, you're absolutely correct. It is in our plan or in our uh, forecast to move to a specific presentation by age. As we move out of the pandemic configuration, we we are uh, we have that as part of our long range strategic planning for uh, having a specific X SKU a presentation for them. Okay, thank you. I, I mean, it would be really uh, very much appreciated to sort of have a timeline and um, and a sense of when that will occur. Uh, in the interim, I do feel like some of the pediatric vaccination programs. Dr. Lee, I think you're muted. We can't hear you, Dr. Lee. The next presentation. Thank you, everyone. Um, we didn't yeah. hear you, uh, Grace. You cannot hear me? Or you cut off for the last. Oh, no. Yeah. My request, my request was to actually both manufacturers, you know, either to FDA or to CDC to provide a clear plan and timing of that plan for when changes would occur to the labeling. Because I just, um, I just honestly feel uh, terrible about the fact that there are, are so many administration errors that seem disproportionate to what we've seen with other vaccines or with the adult vaccines. And I feel pretty strongly that anything we can do to support implementation uh, by providers and by public health and by pharmacists, it would be extremely helpful in the delivery of these vaccines and getting them to kids um, that need them. So but that's my request out to both, both, <laughs> um, both companies. Uh, but let's move on to the next presentation uh, because we are uh, running out of time. So I would like to move on to uh, the next presentation by our colleagues from Pfizer and who will speak about the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 Omicron modified um, bivalent vaccine candidate. And it looks like Dr. Swanson will be presenting. So please go ahead, Dr. Swanson. Great. Thank, thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tina Swanson, and I am the head of viral vaccines R&D at Pfizer. And the on behalf of Pfizer and BioNTech, it is my pleasure to share both immunogenicity and safety data today for our bivalent Omicron modified variant vaccine. So if we could go to the next slide, and then I think we can just go straight to the next one. So this is likely a familiar graphic, but really we want to highlight here that of course, throughout the pandemic, we have seen the rapidly changing SARS-CoV-2 variant epidemiology indicated by each of the colors on this graphic over time. And in particular, the emergence of the more antigenically distinct Omicron variant of concern with demonstrated increased transmissibility and evidence for partial immune escape. So this brings us to the focus of today's discussion on the bivalent vaccine that includes an Omicron BA4, BA5 component to address COVID-19 due not only to the Omicron sublineages, but also due to potential subsequent variants of concern. Next slide. So over the past two plus years, we have gained substantial clinical experience with variant modified vaccines across different age groups. And this is illustrated on the present slide. We initially uh, evaluated early on in the pandemic when the beta variant of concern was, was of initial particular interest uh, when it initially emerged. We evaluated a monovalent form of the beta variant modified vaccine in individuals 18 to 55 years of age, both as a primary series and as a third and fourth dose booster. 
And of course, more recently, we have subsequently evaluated the Omicron BA1 uh, variant modified vaccine, both as a monovalent uh, formulation in 18 to 55 year olds as primary series and fourth dose booster, and a bivalent formulation in greater than 55 years of age. And those data will be in today's presentation. And we do also have ongoing uh, study of the bivalent BA1 vaccine in 18 to 55 year olds. And throughout the clinical evaluation of each of, that, each of these vaccines, the preclinical data also generated with these same formulations have reliably predicted responses in humans. And so that's across the beta monovalent, the Omicron BA1, both monovalent and bivalent. And of course, now the focus of today's discussion being the Omicron BA45 bivalent vaccine. We have an ongoing clinical study evaluating this vaccine in individuals from 12 years of age to greater than 55 years of age. And we'll also describe some of the preclinical data, which again has, been, has um, shown some evidence that we anticipate will be translating to uh, observations in humans as we've seen in the prior preclinical evaluation of variant modified vaccines. Next slide. So first to go through the, the immunogenicity data with our Omicron BA1 containing variant vaccines. So I want to show a, a couple of data slides around actually the monovalent composition, and this supports some of the discussion of a bivalent vaccine approach. So in this first clinical study, which included participants 18 to 55 years of age, we evaluated a primary two-dose series of the monovalent Omicron BA1 containing vaccine at a 30 microgram dose level. And if we go to the next slide, we can show the neutralization responses in a sentinel cohort of these individuals. So these are participants without evidence of prior SARS-CoV-2 infection. And these are the serum neutralizing titers one month after the second dose of a primary series of the monovalent Omicron BA1 vaccine. And if you focus on the dark blue bars on the far right, you can see the Omicron BA1 neutralizing titers in dark blue and Delta in the middle in green, and the reference strain USA Washington uh, 2020 in gray on the left. And what we observed is a very Omicron-specific neutralizing response with a monovalent Omicron BA1 vaccine in naive individuals. So if we go to the next slide, now we're looking at preclinical data. So we can go to the next slide. There we go. So in the preclinical study, if you focus on the middle of this figure, it's the same monovalent Omicron BA1 containing vaccine, again, evaluated at the same uh, dose regimen, so day zero and 21 in naive mice. And this was at a dose level of 0 0.5 micrograms. You see again, a very Omicron specific response with the BA1 strain in dark blue and the BA45 in light blue. And in addition, we also evaluated neutralization um, against not just the reference strain, but also beta and delta. And then if you focus on the right-hand side of this figure, you can see the bivalent composition. So the original uh, ancestral strain spike combined with the Omicron BA1 spike, which elicits a more balanced immune response across the different variants of concern, including the reference strain in this preclinical study. So, providing some evidence and support that bivalent uh, will provide a better and broader uh, immune response compared to a monovalent approach in a naive background. Next slide. All right, so this gets into the evaluation of the bivalent Omicron BA1 containing vaccine. And in this clinical study, this was in participants greater than 55 years of age and the either bivalent Omicron BA1 containing vaccine at a 30 microgram dose level was administered as a fourth dose um, or the prototype vaccine at 30 microgram was administered, administered as a fourth dose. And that fourth dose um, was administered a median of 6.3 months from dose three. We go to the next slide. So first we wanted to understand 
the Omicron BA1 neutralizing antibody response as part of the evaluation of the superiority uh, criteria that needed to be met in order to demonstrate a substantial improvement in the Omicron BA1 neutralizing response with the bivalent vaccine compared to the prototype. So you're seeing in this table the geometric mean neutralizing titers of Omicron BA1 neutral neutralization activity, and this is in the validated uh, SARS-CoV-2 neutralization assay. And in order to meet superiority criteria, the geometric mean ratio of the neutralizing response in the bivalent vaccine had to be greater than 1.0 to meet simple superiority criteria. And this is for the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval. So if you see the yellow box on the far right, you can see that superiority was met with a lower bound of 1.17 and a GMR of 1.56. We move to the next slide. So this is now looking also at the Omicron BA1 neutralization response, but uh, instead of GMR, evaluating zero response rates. And for this particular analysis of zero response, non-inferiority criteria needed to be met with a lower bound of the 95% confidence interval uh, for the percentage difference in the zero response rate between the bivalent vaccine group and the prototype vaccine group being greater than minus five. You can see the, the lower bound of the confidence interval for the bivalent vaccine was greater than minus five, which had a lower bound of 4.0. So non-inferiority met for the zero response trait. Next slide. And this is just to show the um, both before vaccination and one month post dose, the substantial increases observed in Omicron BA1 neutralization activity in the bivalent vaccine containing group compared to the prototype. So the geometric mean fold rise from before vaccination and one month post fourth dose is shown across the top in the yellow box with 9.1 for the bivalent vaccine compared to 5.8 for the prototype. Next slide. So moving beyond the Omicron BA1 neutralizing response, it was also important in this bivalent composition, which also includes the original ancestral spike to demonstrate non-inferiority of the reference strain neutralizing response. So here you're seeing, again, in a validated SARS-CoV-2 neutralization assay, uh, the results of this analysis. And in this case, for non-inferiority criterion, the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval for the geometric mean ratio between the bivalent and the prototype vaccine required to be greater than 0.67. And you can see we had a GMR of 0.99 with a lower bound of 0.82. So non-inferiority criterion was met. Next slide. Okay, so that is the summary of the immunogenicity data. And now we wanted to share a summary of the safety data. So what you're seeing on this slide is a summary of the reactogenicity profile of the bivalent Omicron BA1 containing vaccine given as a fourth dose compared to the prototype vaccine given as a fourth dose in this same study <clears throat> in participants greater than 55 years of age. And I've just highlighted in green um, in, in both local reaction at the injection site focusing on pain as an example, and then in the systemic events category highlighting fever, you can see we have a very similar reactogenicity profile between the variant modified vaccine uh, compared to the prototype vaccine. And not shown on this slide, but we also have data uh, we can share later showing that we've seen similar trends in the original beta variant uh, modified vaccine study and also with the monovalent uh, Omicron BA1 containing vaccine. Next slide. Okay. So, of course, we've seen over time uh, the emergence of the BA4 and then now the dominance of BA5. These two sublineages encode the same spike antigen. So we evaluated the neutralization activity um, both with the prototype vaccine group receiving the fourth dose and the Omicron BA1 containing vaccine with the fourth dose. And we see nice increase in the Omicron neutralizing response in this subset analysis 
We do see neutralization of BA4.5. However, you can see this is reduced compared to the BA1, which is why we have subsequently gone on to evaluate a BA4.5 containing bivalent vaccine. Next slide. So before getting into some of the preclinical data on the BA4.5 uh, variant modified vaccine, this is just to round out the translation of preclinical to clinical data. So similarly, when we showed the primary series analysis in mice translating to uh, observations in humans, this is looking at the booster uh, setting of the Omicron BA1, both monovalent and bivalent, in mice that have received two prior doses of the original ENT 162V2 vaccine. And you can see with the monovalent again in the middle and the bivalent on the right-hand side and the prototype vaccine on the far left, we see similar trends with improved Omicron neutralizing responses in the Omicron-containing vaccine groups, but similarly reduced neutralization activity against the BA4.5. So a nice translation of preclinical to clinical data. Next slide. All right, so this gets into the BA4.5 uh, monovalent and bivalent vaccine compositions, which were evaluated as a booster dose, again, looking at a third dose in mice that had previously received two doses of the bnt 162 v 2 vaccine. And so the neutralization uh, data that you're seeing on this slide is seven days post third dose and evaluating neutralization activity against the ancestral strain, in this case, which is Wuhan Fu-1, um, compared to as well the Omicron sublineages BA1, BA2, 2.12.1, and BA4.5. And the key takeaway for this slide is the two groups on the far right, which is the monovalent Omicron BA4.5 in pink and the Omicron 4.5 bivalent in purple on the far right, you can see a much more balanced immune response against the Omicron sublineages with the 4-5 containing vaccine, including substantial increases, of course, in the matched strain of BA4-5 compared to the Omicron BA1 monovalent and the prototype vaccine. So following this initial evaluation in mice, we subsequently uh, performed a follow-on study to confirm these results, and that's shown on the next slide. So here again is looking at the monovalent BA4-5 uh, vaccine on the left and the bivalent 4-5 vaccine on the right. And again, you see a nice balanced response across the Omicron sublineages when these vaccines are administered as a third dose booster in, in mice. We can go to the next one. So overall, we've shown number one, of course, the reactogenicity profile of the variant vaccines that have been evaluated clinically, which include beta, Omicron, BA1. We have also evaluated alpha and delta in prior clinical studies. And in each of these studies, the reactogenicity profile has been similar to the prototype vaccine, bnt 162 b 2 In the evaluation of the Omicron ba one containing vaccines, both monovalent and bivalent, we demonstrated superiority for the Omicron ba one geometric mean ratio and non-inferiority for the zero response, as well as non-inferiority for the reference strain geometric mean ratio. And across the evaluation of variant modified vaccines to date, the preclinical immunogenicity data have reliably predicted observations in humans. And including the latest Omicron BA45 modified variant vaccine booster data in mice, supporting improved neutralizing responses across Omicron sublineages. So collectively, we anticipate to see similar trends in the ongoing BA4-5 bivalent clinical study. So to summarize, uh, the emergency use authorization has been granted for use as a booster dose for eligible populations 12 years and older, the bivalent Omicron BA4-5 variant modified vaccine, 
at the 30 microgram dose level. And just to wrap up the presentation, just to note that we will also be further evaluating clinically the four or five bivalent vaccine in pediatric populations. Next slide. So just to briefly thank um, the committee and of course the participants in our clinical studies, the investigators, and my fellow colleagues at Pfizer and BioNTech, and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Swanson. This presentation is now open for questions. Ms. McNally. Hi, Dr. Swanson. I am the consumer representative. I wanted to ask you the same question that I asked Dr. Miller um, regarding to what extent, if any, Pfizer's research and development process differed in the creation of the, this vaccine from the original vaccine. Thank you. Right. So I will probably provide you a very similar response. So I think what's important to note that from the very first very modified vaccine that we evaluated, which was the beta monovalent, through the current Omicron BA45, the only change is the variant specific uh, sequence changes in the mRNA itself. The, all of the uh, processes from both making the mRNA drug substance to formulating into the lipid nanoparticle follow the exact same process as has been used uh, throughout uh, generation of the COVID-19 vaccine, bnt 162 b 2 Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Pamela? Dr. Paley? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. I can. Oh, there we go. Yep, thank you. Oh, apologize. I too wanted to ask you a very similar question that I asked um, Dr. Miller. And um, among your variant studies in humans, do you have any um, long-term follow-up in what have you learned about the persistence or the waning of the uh, immune response? Thank you. So we do have ongoing follow-up for looking at the duration of the antibody response in our clinical studies. Um, we're still you know, following out to later time points, six months um, and, and beyond. Um, the data that we currently have available on persistence would be in a subset of participants that received three doses of the BNT162B2 prototype vaccine. And we evaluated neutral activity against the reference strain and the Omicron BA1 uh, variant of concern at the time. So this was before BA45 came along. Um, and we see similar antibody decay rates between the reference strain and Omicron BA1 at least out to four months uh, after dose three. So we're continuing to, to follow with more subjects and, and more time uh, the, the overall kinetics, but those are the data that we currently have available. Thank you. Dr. Cotton? Thank you for your presentation. Um, similar to uh, my last question, uh, for immunocompromised patients, what work is underway and what information might inform our decision making for this vulnerable population? Yes. So maybe I can make a start and if there's anything else to add, I'll, I'll ask uh, Dr. Nick Kitchen to, to add any further comments. So we are conducting a study in immune compromised individuals, uh, but to date the enrollment rate uh, has, has not been, um, you know, as expected. Uh, since the vaccination in this population is generally recommended. So at this point, we don't yet have data specific to that study uh, in the immunocompromised group, but maybe I'll ask um, Nick Kitchen to see if he has anything else he would like to add. Thanks, Keena. No, I think you've, you've summarized well, obviously, the, the, with broad recommendations in, in, in most countries now for immunocompromised to be vaccinated in the face of the the threat of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2, it has been, as you said, um, difficult to enroll individuals into, into clinical trials. So we don't have data yet in that population. 
what about what about research uh, looking at these additional doses in people who had the appropriate number of vaccines given already? Has anything been done there, or do you have any plans for that? You, you mean administration of the bivalent BA45 vaccine to immunocompromised individuals? We don't currently have a study um, ongoing in in that in that regard. No. Okay, that's that makes it challenging to for us to think about how we would best couch our recommendations. So I would encourage you to think about um, studying that highly vulnerable population. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you and um, so my comments would be similar, and I presume the packaging of this vaccine is similar to what was described previously by the Moderna, but. My question again is uh, your studies on pregnancy, and then I have a question also on um, on slide 17. Um, so, you know, I know you presented the data on the BA1 vaccine that the, you know, you know, I guess my idea when when a different, you know, a combination of vaccines does one, does it affect the immunogenicity of one component versus the other? And I know with your BA1, certainly it did not appear, it, it was not affected. But when I look at this one, and, and I think in a previous slide also in the mice, um, you know, the levels of, you know, the part of the, um, the, you know, the neutralization titers in some of these look lower than with the combined um, the a um, four or five variant than with the one um, alone is, I mean, those may not be significant, but can you comment on that? And I think it was also um, in the previous slide that you also had um, looking at it with the, um, in the mice as well. And I guess my concern would be if they generate lower antibody neutralization titers, would we expect the decay to be faster? I guess I have several questions. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask one clarification. Are you referring to monovalent versus bivalent presentation yes. of the variant vaccine? Yes. Okay. So in the clinical study, we did evaluate in individuals greater than 55 years of age, monovalent Omicron BA1 versus bivalent Omicron BA1 and we, we did see a trend for slightly higher Omicron BA1 neutralizing responses in the monovalent vaccine group compared to the bivalent group. Whether that difference is a clinically meaningful difference, I, I don't think we can speculate. Um, but what I can say is that preclinically, we are seeing <clears throat> similar trends um, with slightly higher strain matched responses with monovalent versus bivalent presentation, both with the BA1 containing um, and the BA45 containing vaccine. Um, and I, I think I would also refer back to the, um, the primary series immunogenicity data that showed a clear benefit of having that bivalent composition. So I, I think what the goal here is to ensure that we're solving for the current circulating variants, but also anticipating potential future variants um, by applying that bivalent approach. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I think that's the, the general concept. No, no, I understand. Um, but are the, when you look at, at this slide here and the monovalent BA4-5, versus when you combine the two. Is that a, a statistically significant decrease in titer or not? I guess that's my question. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think the confidence intervals, um, it's probably not shown clearly on this slide, um, but we can we can run, um, I can go back and look at the, the analysis and, and follow up with you, but I think it is overlapping. Okay, and pregnancy? So we do have a study um, that we had ongoing or have ongoing with in pregnant women. 
Um, and I think we also have run into similar challenges of enrollment, um, given that the vaccine um, was made available for this group. But maybe I'll ask um, Nick Kitchen to, again, if, if he would like to add any more details to that. Yeah, thanks, Kenny. Yes, in, indeed, that's correct. We, we did uh, um, conduct a study uh, in pregnant women um, uh, for which the data analysis is ongoing with with following not just the pregnant women but also their uh, their infants as well. So that was with the with the original vaccine, but we will be generating data from that study despite the difficulties in enrolment. Again, for similar reasons, due to the um, the wide recommendations for vaccine uh, for pregnant women to be vaccinated, but we will generate those data for sure. Thank you, um, Dr. Daly. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, because of the concerning data presented earlier about vaccine administration errors, I want to I want to uh, ask that question. I realize we're focused primarily on the the adult presentation here, but but what are what are your specific plans around presentation of a uh, of any pediatric products um, to minimize dose administration errors, and kind of what's the timeline for that plan as well? Thank you. Thank you for the question, and I'm also recalling that there was a, a question on also the, the current rollout of the VA45 um, for the 12 years and older. And so maybe if we could bring up the last backup slide in the, in the deck, which should be slide 37. And while that's coming up, I'll um, ask uh, Adam if he can speak to First, the BA45 presentation, uh, and then also the pediatric mm -hmm. files. Thank you, Kina. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. I can. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. If we could go to the, the next slide, please, just to cover the, the first question related to the uh, bivalent 30-microgram uh, dose. I think this may be a slide build. If we go to slide 38, please. Thank you very much. So the Omicron-containing bivalent vaccine will retain the gray cap as per the original vaccine. Um, and the reason for this is the Omicron-containing bivalent vaccine is essentially the same drug product. It contains the same formulation as the original vaccine, albeit it contains the, the different strain, much like the flu vaccine. Uh, and the gray cap is a visual indication that the product is the same dose, requires the same storage conditions, and the same handling as the original cap presentation. And you can see from the, uh, the information on the right-hand side of the slide is that we differentiate between the original uh, primary series vaccine, so the original uh, vaccine, and the ba 45 containing bivalent vaccine uh, through the label that is uh, highlighted on the, the right-hand side. So I'll pause there. Does that answer the question related to the, uh, the gray cap presentation, which is the bivalent the A45 containing vaccine. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, I, uh, Dr. Daly, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in no. and say <laughs> maybe when we get to the clinical considerations, it'll be clearer why we're asking these questions. But um, I do think that uh, you know dilution, no dilution, colors of the cap, you know, all of these things have just been. Um, a, a bit overwhelming. And actually, I still don't see on here like the microgram dosing. So that uh, is it 30 30 or is it 15 15 uh, for the Omicron components? Um, uh, 15 so anyway, 15. 15 15. And, you know, like having that information on the dosing would be incredibly helpful. Uh, hopefully, we're beyond the point where the expiration date is actually accurate and the all the information on the label is actually accurate. Is that correct now? That for is all correct. The, all the pediatric formulations? So that is correct, yes. And, and just to, to make a quick statement around that, this, this, I think it's been flagged as a, as a potential mislabeling, which is not the case. We were labeling the product um, conservatively with the information that was available at the time to try and make sure that we had the product um, available to patients as soon as possible. And as soon as we got the, uh, the information uh, to update the label and, and the approval that allowed us to update the label, uh, that was done so as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. So may maybe we can revisit this. I just want to make sure that we are clear in our recommendations to uh, our own providers <laughs> or our own health systems about what the right thing to do is. Um, 
Uh, but again, if there's any any questions or continued confusion, would appreciate your partnership on that, and also any transparency you have on uh, any updates. Uh, uh, let's go to um, Dr. Paling, and then we'll go to Dr. Deeks and Dr. Anderson. I'm sorry, I forgot to take down my hand. Thank. You. Thank you, Dr. Deeks. Thanks very much. I just have a question for a clarification. In terms of your slide um, with respect to your various studies, it looks like the um, monovalence uh, beta and Omicron went down to age 18. And of course, the bivalent studies went to 55 years, um, over 55 years of age. So can you clarify that this, that the bivalent um, BA45 has actually not been studied in anyone 12 to 17 years of age at the age group for whom there is um, an authorization. Thank you. So, thanks for the question. I think if we could go to slide four. Okay. So, you're correct, the bivalent um, Omicron BA1 uh, the data that was presented today and that we currently have available is in individuals greater than 55 years of age. Within that same study, we've also um, enrolled and will be generating additional data in participants 18 to 55 years of age with the BA1 bivalent containing vaccine. So the BA45, you can see the age groups listed here. So we've actually stratified the 4-5 uh, clinical study for, to ensure we have sufficient numbers of individuals 12 to 17 years of age, 18 to 55 years of age, and those greater than 55 uh, for receiving the BA4-5 bivalent as a fourth dose booster. Um, so if, if there are more specific questions that I can ask um, Nick Kitchen to address them, but if that answers your question, let me know. Yeah, it does. So just no data. Um, in humans yet for 12 to 17. Thank you. Study is ongoing, correct. Thank you. And Dr. Anderson? Yeah, so um, this is Dr. Anderson from Pediatric Infectious Disease Society. Uh, Dr. Deeks actually asked the question that I had, uh, had planned to ask, but I did want to say thank you to both manufacturers for what sounds like uh, efforts to move uh, clinical trials of uh, the bivalent vaccines into children of all ages, and obviously we anxiously await all that data. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And uh, Dr. Long, last question. Yes, uh, I, I, I want to thank you also, both manufacturers, for moving so quickly and bringing this data. And now, uh, my problem is a little bit, it, it, you know, there aren't, aren't many data upon which we really can make um, confident decisions. Do I understand? Let's just talk about your bivalent uh, and um, uh, the bivalent of four, BA4 and 5. You don't have any human antibody, DK, even over or response, even over a very short period of time. I guess my thought is, and it's, it's really naivete on my part. Um, We've seen that many doses have been purported to lengthen the antibody response. But we haven't seen any data on whether you add something new, which is as distance as BA4 and 5, and are you still going to have to see that three and four times before there is more than three months? So. As we just decide on whom this vaccine might be used, I just want to be clear that we're seeing all of the clinical data, all the human data that you have on four and five, which is little. Thank you, Dr. Long. This is a very good question. Um, I think that where I would, um, you know, focus on is yes, we have extensive data, of course, on the prototype vaccine. Uh, where we have seen very consistent responses through the third dose uh, against both the ancestral strain and different variants of concern, including Omicron. And with the 
EA 455A list, that study is ongoing. So we um, you know, don't yet have specific clinical data for that bivalent vaccine composition. However, the Omicron lineage has been the most antigenically distant uh, variant of concern to date uh, for SARS-CoV-2 throughout the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And when you combine a much more antigenically distinct spike with the original ancestral spike, the more distant there is, you know, just the um, you know, following of the diversity of antigen-specific memory B cells uh, over time, the anticipation would be that combining something so distant, you would have some chance of improving uh, upon not only memory B cells recognizing epitopes that are shared between the ancestral and the BA45 but also potentially specific to the BA45. So a broadening of that protective immunity. And of course, we'll generate the data, um, but that you know, it is within the realm, of, I think, across different disease areas, including, for example, influenza, um, where that could be an anticipation in the data that we will see. We have also seen in the preclinical studies a maturation of the neutralizing antibody response. So the initial data um, with a third dose booster of the BA45, uh, the data in this presentation we had available to include is seven day post dose three. But we've also um, gone on to look at one month um, with the BA1 containing bivalent vaccine and now generating data for the BA45. And we do see nice continual increases in the neutralizing antibody response um, against uh, the, either the BA1 or the BA45 um, over time. So I, I think there is some opportunity here that we may see some expansion in the breadth of protection. Thank you very much. I, I just want to ask, do you have an anticipation of when you might um, be um, asking for authorization for boosters uh, for the bivalent in the 5 to 11? So maybe I will ask, I think we have Bill Gruber um, with us as well today. So Bill, would you yeah. like to speak to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer that, uh, Dr. Long. Uh, we anticipate that we'll be taking data from the existing study, the BMT162B2, uh, in the 5 to 11, that booster data, uh, providing uh, information about uh, cross-active uh, um, immune response against BA1, BA45, and anticipate we would file for submission uh, sometime in the first part of October. And then, as, as Keena said, just uh, maybe anticipating an additional question, we obviously, as Keena said, are uh, working with uh, our uh, FDA uh, partners uh, to identify the best way to move forward into the younger age groups uh, with appropriate trials and getting data uh, as quickly as possible so that we could uh, further <coughs> extend the potential for the bivalent uh, BA45 and, and original uh, containing vaccines uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'd like for us to um, thank our speakers uh, today and for all the uh, questions and clarifications that were given. Um, and we'll end the session now. Why don't we reconvene in, I'm actually going to give us a whole 15 minutes today. So uh, we will come back at uh, 45 minutes after the hour as planned uh, to return to Dr. Oliver and Dr. Hall to hopefully wrap us up. Thank you, everyone.
you everyone. It's 45 minutes after the hour and we will now reconvene the ACIP meeting. Um, next up, we have Dr. Sarah Oliver, who will be speaking on evidence to recommendations framework for the bivalent COVID-19 vaccine booster doses. Um, Dr. Oliver, if you're ready. I am, thanks so much. Good afternoon. Next slide. Next slide. So you guys are well aware of our evidence to recommendation framework, describing the totality of the information considered in moving from evidence to ACIP recommendations. Next slide. This is the ETR framework as we have seen before. However, I do want to highlight the equity domain. As you've seen as we've walked through numerous ETRs to date, we've really had trouble answering a single question for equity to highlight the impact of the intervention on health equity. Next slide. So for the last several months, we've been engaged with a review of the equity domain and gathered input and feedback through consultation with health equity experts and other partners, such as the National Medical Association, the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, Throughout this process, it's become clear that consideration of equity is integral to every aspect of the production, study, authorization, and recommendation of COVID vaccines. Next slide. The need for a systematic, reliable, and action-oriented review of evidence towards enhanced equity was also made clear that structural problems require structural solutions. The adjustment of the structure is required for meaningful change and an adjustment of the ETR framework to enable systematic and reliable review of evidence towards actionable recommendations to enhance equity may help facilitate meaningful change. Therefore, for at least today's presentation, we have proposed a change to the equity domain now as a consideration across each other ETR domain. We recommend a systemic, systematic, reliable inclusion of data to speak to the equity considerations in each domain, both to demonstrate the data and encourage actions needed to enhance equity as relevant to each domain. Therefore, for today, we will remove the voting question on equity and will enhance attention to equity across all the other domains. Next slide. This will be an iterative process that will require feedback from ACIP and others. We will then take this feedback and continue with the process for future ETRs, but this is the ETR framework that we'll walk through today. For each of the domains, we will address an equity question for that specific domain. Next slide. So then for this ETR presentation, as you've heard previously, the EUAs are issued for the bivalent Pfizer vaccine in those 12 and over, and the bivalent Moderna vaccine for those 18 and over. We'll have votes for those specific uh, vaccines and age groups specifically, but we're also asking ACIP to consider the larger question. Does ACIP support the use of updated or bivalent COVID-19 vaccine booster doses for those individuals and age groups already currently recommended to receive a COVID-19 vaccine booster? Next slide. On the left are the current recommendations, where the focus was on counting dose numbers. And those five through 49 years were, are recommended for three doses, and those 50 and over were recommended for four doses. On the right is overall future proposed recommendations, where individuals recommended for a primary series and a bivalent booster dose regardless of the previous booster doses given. Age and vaccines for this will be as authorized by FDA and recommended by ACIP and CDC. So this is not necessarily the recommendations today, but where we envision the future of the program going. We'll hear from Dr. Hill later today around the details for the schedule, but I wanted to orient us to the broader discussion that we hope to have for today. Next slide. Next slide. So this figure shows the daily trends in reported COVID-19 cases. As of August 29th, there have been over 94 million COVID cases reported to CDC. Next slide. We've seen this previously, but this figure shows the weekly trends in COVID-associated hospitalization rates by age group from COVID-Net. 
Hospitalizations rates peaked for all age groups during last winter's Omicron wave, and since April, hospitalization rates in older age groups have increased relative to the other age groups. Next slide. Here again, we see the age adjusted rates for COVID associated hospitalizations by vaccination status among adults. In June, unvaccinated adults had 4.6 times higher COVID associated hospitalization rates compared to those who are vaccinated with at least one booster. Next slide. Then this figure shows the age adjusted rates of COVID associated deaths by vaccination status. In June, unvaccinated people ages five and over had eight times higher COVID associated death rates compared to those with at least one booster dose. Next slide. Then when we focus in on death rates by vaccination status among people 50 years and over, we see that in June 2022, people with two or two booster doses had 14 times lower risk of dying from COVID compared to unvaccinated individuals and a three times lower risk of dying from COVID than people with one booster dose. Next slide. So moving to our vaccination data, here we see the trends in the cumulative percentage of the US population vaccinated with a primary series by age group. Persons age 65 and over in the dark orange have the highest coverage at 92%. Then the coverage decreases as age decreases with the lowest coverage among uh, ages five through 11 years in dark blue at 30%. I'll note that individuals um, six months through five years of age are also recommended to receive a vaccine but aren't yet on this figure. Next slide. Here we see a similar figure with trends in coverage for first booster doses by age group Again, we see the highest coverage among those 65 and over and the lowest coverage among persons 5 through 11. Next slide. And then if now we take a look at trends in coverage for second booster doses by age group, again, the highest coverage is among those 65 and over, but overall only 41% have completed a second booster. Next slide. So now for the equity question for this domain, does the problem impact all populations equally? Next slide. This slide shows COVID case and death rates in the US by urban or rural classification. In the recent Omicron surge, the case rate on the left was higher among the large metro classification, while the death rate on the right was higher in the rural population. Next slide. You can also see here weekly cases by race and ethnicity Throughout the pandemic, we have seen cases higher among racial and ethnic minority populations. Next slide. This slide also shows COVID hospitalizations by race and ethnicity. When we look at hospitalizations, we can also see that hospitalizations are higher among racial and ethnic minority populations as well, although it was more pronounced earlier in the pandemic. Next slide. Then for COVID associated deaths, again, throughout the pandemic, mortality rates have been higher, again, among racial and ethnic minority populations. Again, they were more pronounced earlier in the pandemic. Then as highlighted in the box, the recent mortality rates show less evidence of these disparities. Next slide. So in summary, as of August, over 94 million COVID cases have been reported in the US. Since April, hospitalization rates in older age groups have increased relative to other age groups. In addition, in June, during Omicron predominance, ad unvaccinated adults, 18 and over, had 4.6 times higher hospitalization rates compared with those who received at least one booster, and unvaccinated individuals, five and over, had at eight times higher death rates. We know that vaccination rates are much higher among older adults relative to the other age groups. And we know that people of racial and ethnic minority groups have been disproportionately burdened by COVID-19 illness, hospitalization, and death. Next slide. So the work group felt that yes, COVID is of public health importance, especially among populations recommended to receive a booster. Next slide. Now to benefits and harms. Next slide. So first we'll review the clinical trial data. Then we'll also review other considerations to emphasize that we're reviewing the totality of the data able to inform these recommendations. Next slide. This highlights the available clinical trial data 
first from the Moderna bivalent booster clinical trial and then from the Pfizer BioNTech trial, both of which investigate vaccines comprising an ancestral and BA1 strains. There's no international data yet available for bivalent booster and no clinical trial data for bivalent boosters with BA4-5 yet. Next slide. So in the Moderna phase 2-3 trial, persons were given a 50 microgram bivalent boost again, which was 25 micrograms each of ancestral and Omicron BA1 spike as a second booster vaccine and were compared to those given the ancestral booster as a second booster. The trial participants were in adults 18 and over. 437 participants received a bivalent booster. 377 received an ancestral booster. The dosing interval uh, from first booster to the bivalent was 136 days um, and 134 days for the ancestral booster. And the median follow-up was 40 to 57 days. Next slide. Immunogenicity was assessed by the antibody response on day 29 after the study vaccination. Based on the geometric mean ratios, comparing the antibody response in participants that received the bivalent booster to those that received the monovalent ancestral vaccine, the bivalent vaccine met superiority criteria for both Omicron and ancestral SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. Next slide. The superiority criteria were also met in participants with or without evidence of infection on day 29, with the highest geometric mean titers observed in those with prior infection on the far right. Next slide. Local reactogenicity with the bivalent booster as a fourth dose was similar to the second and third doses of the ancestral Moderna vaccine. The most commonly reported grade three local reaction was redness. Systemic adverse reactions with the bivalent vaccine were lower than systemic reactions from second and third doses and the, of the ancestral vaccine. And the most commonly reported systemic adverse reaction was fatigue. No grade four events were reported in the trial. Next slide. This graph shows the percentage of participants reporting uh, local systemic uh, local or systemic reaction following vaccination with the Moderna bivalent vaccine. Next slide. There were no serious adverse events assessed as related to the vaccine. Two participants uh, experienced two serious adverse events, one prostate cancer diagnosis and one traumatic fracture within 28 days of the booster dose. There were no deaths or adverse events of special interests, including no cases of myocarditis or pericarditis. In the bivalent booster group, all severe events included reactogenicity events and one patient reported lymphadenopathy. Next slide. So now moving to the Pfizer BioNTech bivalent booster clinical trial, individuals re received a fourth dose of a 30 microgram bivalent vaccine comprised of ancestral and an Omicron BA1 strain and were compared to those that received a fourth dose of 30 micrograms of the ancestral monovalent vaccine. The study evaluated safety and immunogenicity among participants aged 55 years and over. 305 participants received the bivalent um, uh, Omicron uh, vaccine and 305 received the monovalent uh, ancestral vaccine. The dosing interval from the first booster to the second booster was 6.3 months and the median follow-up was 1.7 to 1.8 months. Next slide. Again, immunogenicity was assessed by the antibody response one month after the study vaccination. Based on the geometric mean ratios, comparing the antibody response in participants that received the bivalent booster to those that received the monovalent ancestral vaccine, the bivalent vaccine met superiority criteria for Omicron antibodies and non-inferiority criteria for ancestral SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. Next slide. In participants 50, uh, over 55 years of age, local and systemic reactogenicity with the Pfizer bivalent vaccine were similar to the prototype vaccine. Four participants reported fever between 38.9 and 40 Celsius in the vaccine group, and no grade four events were reported. Next slide. Then these graphs show the percentage of participants reporting local or systemic reactions following vaccination with the Pfizer bivalent booster. Next slide. No adverse events were assessed as related to the vaccine. There were no life-threatening adverse events or deaths reported by participants. No cases of anaphylaxis, hypersensitivity, myocarditis, pericarditis, appendicitis, 
or other adverse events of special interest. In the bivalent booster group, all severe events included reactogenic of re included reactogenicity events such as fatigue, chills, arthralgia, and headache. And some mild to moderate, moderate events of lymphadenopathy were also reported. Next slide. So a summary of the clinical trial data, a bivalent booster dose of both Moderna and Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines increased the immune response in those who've completed a primary series and a previous booster. Compared with ancestral booster dose, the bivalent booster doses demonstrated a superior response to Omicron and either a superior or non-inferior response to ancestral. The bivalent booster doses had a similar reactogenicity profile to the primary series and to an ancestral booster dose. It should be noted, though, that the data from the clinical trials are limited in size, age, and bivalent booster type. Next slide. So now we'll move to other considerations. We'll present available data to assess the potential risk of myocarditis following a bivalent booster dose. The risk of myocarditis following a bivalent booster dose is unknown, and there's limited data from second booster doses of the current COVID vaccines as it's recommended for adults over 50 years of age. So we'll review the risk of myocarditis following a second dose in a primary series and the first booster dose. Next slide. Here we present the VAERS reporting rates for verified myocarditis per 1 million mRNA COVID-19 vaccination in the seven days post-vaccination. The rates that exceeded the estimated background rates of myocarditis in the same interval are indicated by the peach shading. This is the same slide that was shown by Dr. Shima Bakuro earlier. Next slide. These are the incidence rates of myocarditis and pericarditis following primary series and booster dose in another surveillance system, the vaccine safety data link, zero to seven days uh, after Pfizer vaccination. Next slide. And this is the same data following primary series and booster dose after Moderna vaccination. Again, these are the same slides that were shown uh, in Dr. Shima Bakuro's presentation. Next slide. Then this slide is from surveillance data in Ontario, Canada, demonstrating their reporting rates per million doses administered. In the box on the right, we see the myocarditis rates after dose two and dose three in males. You can see that across all ages, the rates of myocarditis are lower after a booster dose than after dose two of the primary series. Next slide. This slide is from the long-term follow-up study for myocarditis participants and was previously presented to ACIP. As a reminder, at least 90 days after the myocarditis diagnosis, most patient, patients who were reached reported no impact on their quality of life, and most did not report missing school or work. And of the healthcare providers who completed the surveys indicated uh, the patients were fully recovered or probably fully recovered. Um, next slide. So in summary around myocarditis and pericarditis, we know that the risk of myocarditis has been identified after COVID vaccine. This risk is rare and primarily observed in adolescent and young adult males. Among the VAERS data, the reporting rates of myocarditis are lower after a booster dose compared to the primary series. Among VSD data, the incidents following dose two of a primary series and a booster dose are similar, but the case counts are small. Among surveillance data from Canada, what indicates that the risk of myocarditis or pericarditis following the first booster dose appear lower than the risk following the second dose of the primary series. And this was observed for both Pfizer and Moderna products across all age groups. Most individuals with myocarditis and pericarditis had fully recovered at follow-up. And we know that using data from pre-Omicron estimates, the risk of adverse cardiac outcomes were 1.8 to 5.6 times higher after SARS-CoV-2 infection than after mRNA COVID vaccination among males in that 12 to 17 year age group. And we've also discussed previously at eight weeks that we know an interval, we've discussed previously at ACIP, we know that an interval of eight weeks between vaccine doses may further lower the myocarditis risk. Next slide. Then this is from the COVID-19 Vaccine Safety Technical Group that closely reviews data from US safety monitoring systems as well as from other sources 
and this is their report. Um, through August, they had held over six or had held 64 teleconference meetings. Um, this is their interpretation of the safety data with a special focus on myocarditis. Overall, they felt that for vSafe, the reactions and health impacts were not higher after a booster dose than after a primary series. For VAERS, there were no additional concerns and that the myocarditis reporting rates were lower after a booster dose than a primary series. For VSD, there were few myocarditis or pericarditis cases after booster dose and the risk esti estimates were imprecise. The risk after booster doses appeared similar to the risk after the primary series dose too. VAST also reviewed additional vaccination data in pregnancy and no safety concerns from any of the systems that have data on primary series and the first booster dose. Then as always, VAST will continue to closely review the safety data, including data after a bivalent vaccine booster once available. Next slide. So now moving to additional, uh, other additional considerations. To better understand the impact of a fall booster rollout, we'll look at projections from the COVID-19 vaccine or COVID-19 scenario modeling hub. The scenario modeling hub is a multi-team effort aimed at creating and modeling planned scenarios for the mid to long-term COVID-19 situation. There are typically five to 10 submissions per scenario round at the national level and results are ensembled and summarized by the hub. Round 14 and 15 were planning scenarios were projecting COVID-19 burden through mid-2023 under different booster policies that I'll walk through. Next slide. This slide details the scenarios for each round. In round 14, the VE of the bivalent boosters was assumed to be 80% against symptomatic disease with non-immune escape strains. The scenario included a targeted booster campaign in ages 50 and over versus a flu vaccine-like uptake in ages 18 and over, and also looked at no variant versus a fall variant X with a 40% immune escape and 20% increased severity. Then round 15 was a rapid round aimed to update round 14 and consider booster dose timing. The same VE and variant assumptions were used as round 14, but assumed booster recommendation with flu-like uptake uh, in 18 and over, starting in September versus starting in November. Next slide. The round 14 national ensemble projection intervals showed that regardless of the presence of a new variant, influenza vaccine-like uptake in individuals 18 years and over would lead to over 20% reduction in hospitalizations and over 15% reduction in death versus a recommendation for individuals aged 50 and over only. Next slide. The round 15 national projection intervals showed that absent a new variant, boosters to individuals 18 and over in September could prevent over 100,000 more hospitalizations and nearly 10,000 more deaths compared to a booster rollout in November. Next slide. So we've previously discussed immune tolerance and concerns for COVID-19 vaccine booster doses. As a reminder, immune tolerance is the concern that giving additional doses of COVID-19 vaccine would lead to lower antibody levels or a failure to restore antibody levels to what was seen after a previous dose or T cell exhaustion. However, again, we aren't seeing data at this point to suggest that this is occurring. Bivalent vaccine is able to improve vaccine titers in individuals without prior infection and also provided robust boost in antibody titers for individuals with prior infection. As you can see here on the right, we continue to see high antibody titers for the bivalent vaccine prior to SARS-CoV-2. Um, as we, you can see here on the right, the high antibody titers that we see for this bivalent vaccine plus prior infection could lead to slower waning and prolonged protection against COVID-19 and severe disease. Next slide. We also had discussed imprinting previously. Imprinting, sometimes known as the original antigenic sin con uh, concern, is the concern that the initial exposure to one virus strain primes B cell memory and limits the development of memory B cells and neutralizing antibodies against new strains. 
However, data suggest an improved diverse response obtained with bivalent vaccines. Antibody titers to all SARS-CoV-2 variants tested were higher with the bivalent vaccine compared to the monovalent ancestral vaccine. Next slide. Then we heard from Dr. Thornburg earlier around antigenic cartography or ways to map out the antibody responses. Antigenic cartography uses 2D and 3D maps to visualize how closely related the antibody responses are for different viruses. An example of this um, with SARS-CoV-2 is in the figure on the left. Antibody landscapes are another form of cartography and they evaluate the diversity of the immune response. The landscapes are the things that look like different color sheets of paper in figures D and E. A flat landscape is better as it indicates that the response to all viruses or variants are similar. When the sheet of paper or the landscape is sloped, as you can see at the bottom of panel D, it means that the responses were very skewed to one particular variant. For this study that was done by the NIH, they looked at antibody responses on day 15 after giving a variety of vaccines, including several different bivalent vaccines. For the day 15 antibody response, which is the top sets of the landscapes, and especially for those with a history of prior infection, which is shown in panel E, the bivalent vaccines with a prototype plus Omicron composition, which is the landscape at the top shown in purple, provided the best robust response that was diverse and similar across the different variants. Next slide. So now we'll talk a little bit about Omicron itself and what it means that we're talking about bivalent Omicron vaccines and a little bit around the differences between BA1 and BA4.5. As we've discussed, the clinical data from the bivalent vaccines are primarily obtained using BA1. Here's a little bit about what that means and the difference. Compared to the ancestral virus, which was circulating in early 2020 and is what is currently in the monovalent vaccines, all Omicron sublineages have shared mutations highlighted here in the black arrow. Many of these mutations are in the receptor binding domain highlighted in the box with RBD. The receptor binding domain, as the name implies, is the primary binding site for antibodies. These mutations contribute to decreased neutralization and increased transmissibility for the Omicron sublineages. So any vaccine that uses any Omicron subvariant would include all of these mutations. Next slide. So what about the differences between BA1 and BA4.5 specifically? First, I want to clarify why there are two numbers, why we say BA4 and BA5. BA4 and BA5 are two different Omicron sublineages, but the spike protein for each, which is the focus of the vaccine, is identical. So what we're talking about in the vaccine is the spike protein for both BA4 and BA5, but it is still just one single sequence, not two different ones. Then the bar at the top for BA1, and then there's the bar at the bottom is BA4.5. The numbers and letters seen are areas where they differ from the main virus of comparison. The text you can see on the bottom right lists all the differences between BA4 and BA5. Without this sounding like an organic chemistry class, the figure highlights where several of these are in the red arrows. Overall, as you can see, there are differences, but they fundamentally are not a completely new or different virus. They actually share most of the same genetic code, except the highlighted um, red differences. Next slide. So we'll get out of the chemistry lessons and much more back to traditional vaccine data. We fully acknowledge that we're in a different position now than we were in 2020 or 2021. Within the, with the first two, within the two years of the pandemic, especially the recent Omicron surges we've seen for the past year, many of us have also had a SARS-CoV-2 infection. We saw on the previous slides how that impacted the antigenic landscapes, but now we can look at how that impacts vaccine effectiveness. This is a study from Qatar 
looking at VE with two or three doses of mRNA vaccines with or without prior infection. The figures are similar, just looking at Pfizer on the left and Moderna on the right. Um, and you can see that in both figures, uh, the point estimate on the far right, the hybrid immunity that's shown in the orange square, having three doses of the vaccine and having prior infection, those individuals were the most protected, having a VE of near 80%. The effectiveness of prior infection alone was around 50%. Next slide. Then as we saw with Omicron, the risk of reinfection fundamentally changed um, during the Omicron surge as well. This study looked at electronic health records in the US and looked at risk of reinfection through the calendar months. As you can see at the figure on the right, as we went into the Omicron surge, the risk of reinfection significantly increased. Next slide. So then while today's discussion is primarily focused on the bivalent mRNA vaccines, we are asking you to consider the broader program as well. So I wanted to briefly provide some information on non-mRNA boosters. At this time, the published data are limited, but we'll show what we have. The study looked at a handful of individuals who received a Novavax primary series and a booster in teal, highlighted in the middle, compared to those who received the original monovalent mRNA vaccines in dark blue on the left. I'll note we don't have any data to compare, um, to compare what this would look like with the updated bivalent vaccines, but we can see the responses overall were fairly similar to what was seen with the monovalent mRNA vaccines. Although I will note that this was only with four or five individuals in the Novavax group. Next slide. This study then looked at a boost, various booster doses given after being primed with two doses of a Pfizer vaccine. The study was, had a randomized third trial given um, of various boosters given 10 to 12 weeks. All booster doses resulted in an increase in anti-spike IgG concentration. But you'll notice that third doses of the mRNA vaccines resulted in geometric mean concentrations that were about three times higher than those observed in the Novavax booster recipients. And all boosters uh, in the study showed acceptable side effect profiles. Next slide. So now to the equity questions for this domain. Next slide. I'll note the equity question for this domain is, are the desirable and undesirable anticipated effects demonstrated across all populations equally? This language was very specifically chosen. First, were they demonstrated across all populations? Were the persons of diverse race and ethnic backgrounds included in the clinical trials? Do the demographics reflect the demographics of the US population? Then are the effects equally demonstrated? Were the desirable or undesirable effects evaluated by population groups? And do they differ in uh, any of those population groups? For all future ETRs, we commit to evaluating the benefit risk data through this lens as well. Next slide. So we'll highlight that this is the demographic makeup of the Moderna clinical trial for the bivalent vaccines. It consisted of a smaller percentage of Hispanic and Latino participants than that make up the US um, census data. Likewise, the trial was comprised of a larger proportion of white participants than the US um, population. Next slide. This is similar data for the Pfizer trial. And in a, um, similarly, the Pfizer trial had less racial and ethnic diversity than the US population. Additionally, because the trial was conducted in persons 50, uh, older than 55 years, the median age of the trial participants was obviously much higher than what is seen in the US population. Next slide. So then for results by race and ethnicity, the Moderna vaccine bivalent vaccine demonstrated that Omicron BA1 and original strain neutralizing antibodies after the fourth dose were comparable across racial groups. In the Pfizer BioNTech trial, Subgroups of participants 55 and or over 55 in the safety population generally had similar adverse event profiles from steady vaccination to one month post dose across various vaccine groups when evaluated by subgroups of sex, race, and ethnicity. And overall, there were no meaningful differences between the subgroups for the Omicron variant or the original strain. However, it should be noted that in both trials, the subgroups of race and ethnicity included a limited number of participants, and so results should be interpreted with caution. Next slide. 
So overall, we'll summarize what data we have to inform the recommendations as it relates to benefits and harms. We have experience from using COVID-19 vaccine mRNA platforms for nearly two years, over 600 million doses in the United States alone. We have extensive vaccine effectiveness studies, as well as robust post-authorization safety data across multiple platforms. Clinical human data from bivalent COVID-19 vaccines are available in over 1,700 persons. This includes bivalent vaccines with both beta and Omicron variants, and both from manufacturers and NIH studies. Over 1,400 individuals received a bivalent vaccine with the Omicron component specifically. Then as we discussed, there are subtle differences in mutations between the BA1 and BA4-5 spike protein sequences. But overall, we don't anticipate that we would see differences in safety or reactogenicity of the vaccines based on these limited mutations. The overall composition of the vaccine, as well as the total antigenic load, are the same as the current booster doses. Then we also review data from the antigenic cartography and antibody studies, as well as modeling data. Next slide. So here's what we know. COVID-19 vaccines have a high degree of safety. We know that there are rare events of myocarditis that have been seen after the mRNA vaccines and post-authorization studies and cases of myocarditis that have been attributed to the vaccine in the Novavax clinical trials. But the, we know that they have a high degree of safety. COVID vaccines also provide high levels of protection against severe disease. Initially, the COVID vaccines also provided high levels of protection against infection and transmission. However, as the virus evolved, we noted more rapid waning of protection against asymptomatic and milder disease. We know that COVID booster doses further increase protection against severe disease. And we know that the bivalent COVID vaccines expand the immune response after vaccination. Vaccines that contain Omicron will improve the antibody response to Omicron. And bivalent vaccines appear to provide a more diverse response overall, which may actually improve the immune response to future variants as well. Next slide. It is important, however, to acknowledge what we don't know. Right now, we don't know the rates of myocarditis after bivalent COVID-19 vaccines. It's unlikely that the inclusion of Omicron would increase myocarditis rates. What we know that does impact myocarditis is age and sex of the individual, um, intervals since previous dose, and potentially total dose may be related. But it's unlikely that um, the inclusion of Omicron would have an impact. We don't know the incremental increase in vaccine effectiveness. Antibody titers to, cur to currently circulating variants were higher after a bivalent booster dose than with the current monovalent booster. However, most of the data to inform recommendations were from that BA1 bivalent vaccine. The incremental benefit from going from by, uh, BA1 to BA4-5 are unknown. We also don't know the duration of protection for these vaccines. However, antibody titers after bivalent vaccine and prior uh, infection were robust. This combination of prior infection and the bivalent vaccine may prolong the duration of protection, which could actually decrease a need for frequent boosters. However, as with all vaccines, the duration of protection may vary by age and immune status. Next slide. So in summary of the benefit, uh, the balance of benefits and risks for these bivalent vaccines, we know that for both Moderna and the Pfizer BioNTech vaccines, the bivalent vaccines increase the immune response for those who've completed a primary series and previous booster. We saw similar reactogenicity profiles. We know that the myocarditis risk is unknown, but anticipate a similar risk to what's seen after the monovalent vaccines. We know that the modeling proje uh, projects more hospitalizations and deaths would be averted when booster doses are recommended broadly for persons 18 and over compared to those 50 and over, and when the booster campaign began in, would begin in September compared to beginning in November. We, and we also know that the benefits and harms for the US population are best assessed when the clinical trial and study populations are optimally representative of the US population. Next slide. 
So the work group felt that the substantial uh, desirable anticipated effects were moderate. Next slide. The undesirable anticipated effects were small. Next slide. And that the balance of those favored the intervention. Next slide. Now moving to values. Next slide. This slide shows survey data from an online survey conducted in partnership with CDC and the University of Iowa. You've seen results from this partnership frequently um, over the course of several ETRs. This survey was conducted very recently over the month of August and showed that 72% of eligible respondents said that they definitely or probably would get an updated booster that protects against Omicron. Next slide. Among people who said that they were unsure about getting a booster, people both felt that they have enough protection from their prior dose or that the booster may not be effective. Next slide. However, when asked why people would get a booster, preventing them from spreading to others and preventing severe disease were the most common. Next slide. Then as we move into fall, we know that implementation of a COVID booster program will overlap with the influenza vaccination season as well. Here we have data around co-administration of COVID and flu, and we'll, we'll hear more about the data uh, in trials to look at that. But for this, when survey recipients were asked if they would be willing to get a flu shot and the updated COVID at the same time, 63% of individuals were extremely or somewhat willing to receive them together. Next slide. So now for the equity question for this domain, is there important variability in how these and um, how patients or populations value the outcome? Next slide. Booster uptake has remained relatively steady with those groups with higher initial vaccine uptake also more likely to have received their booster dose. This means that older adults, college graduates, and those with higher incomes remain the most likely to be both uh, vaccinated with the primary series and boosted. There is notable difference though in the vaccinated versus, uh, in the vaccinated with the primary series versus boosted status among adults of Hispanic or Latino ethnicity. Despite a high vaccine uptake, around a third of these adults who say that they've completed a primary series have not yet received a first booster. Next slide. Then this shows information for why people have not received a booster, this time shown by race and ethnicity you can see a higher proportion of vaccinated but unboosted adults of Hispanic ethnicity feel that they have enough protection from prior infection or may have had side effects from previous doses or could be worried about missing work from the symptoms post-vaccine. Next slide. So in summary, the value of this in intervention appears high to most of the population. 72% of survey respondents reported that they were likely to receive an updated booster with the prevention of spread to others and a change in case severity uh, appearing to lead uh, as the main reasons why they would want to get an updated booster. We also know that nearly two thirds of adults were willing to receive a COVID vaccine and a flu shot at the same time. However, we know receipt of a booster to date demonstrates persistent vaccine inequity. Adults of older age, those with college degrees or higher income remain most likely to be vaccinated with a primary series and booster Notably, about a third of Hispanic uh, or Latino uh, ethnicity adults have not yet received a booster despite completion of a primary series. Next slide. So the work group felt uh, that the target population felt that the desirable effects were moderate relative to undesirable effects. Next slide. However, there is probably important uncertainty or variability. Next slide. So now to acceptability. Next slide. As we think through the acceptability of bivalent boosters, we can think through the COVID vaccination program overall. There have been over 800 million doses delivered to date. Over 600 million doses have been delivered. Over 90% of the population has received at least one dose, and over 223 million individuals have completed a primary series. Next slide. We have a broad network of COVID vaccine providers, including critical pharmacy providers, federal partners, as well as jurisdictional providers. Next slide. Then for the equity question for this domain, is it the intervention equally acceptable across all populations? Next slide. 
So taking a look at the percentage of the population with a completed COVID vaccine primary series by race and ethnicity over time. As shown here, Asian, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander populations have the highest percentage among those who are fully vaccinated or have completed a primary series. Whereas the uh, black populations have the lowest vaccination to date. Next slide. As it pertains to booster vaccination trends by race and ethnicity, multiracial and Asian populations have the highest percentage among those who've received their first booster dose and second booster dose receipt is higher again among multiracial populations relative to other racial and ethnic groups. Next slide. We see that there have also been disparities by population for those who've completed a primary series by county urbanicity, with those in large metro areas having a higher vaccination than those in rural populations. Next slide. Then we'll also see that vaccination rates vary by both race and ethnicity and disability status. On the left, on the far left, you can see that vaccination rates for those assessed as having different abilities with vision, hearing, mobility, or cognition have lower vaccination rates. And you can see how this varies by race and ethnicity as well. Next slide. We've shown throughout ETRs before that a provider's recommendation remains very important to COVID vaccine acceptance. And this importance appears highest among individuals who are over 65, black, retired, or with incomes under 30,000. This indicates that the potential for healthcare providers to increase the acceptability of these bivalent vaccines through communications with their providers. Next slide. So in summary, we know that over 800 million doses of COVID vaccines have been delivered across a wide network of vaccine providers. However, significant disparities in completion of the primary series and receipt of booster doses still persist by race and ethnicity, urbanicity, and differences in abilities, including vision, hearing, mobility, and cognition. However, it's important to note that the detection of the disparities does not necessarily explain the disparities. Differences in acceptability can be um, what contributes to the disparities. But as we heard frequently through listening sessions when we were revising the equity domain, we heard caution against explaining all disparities as vaccine hesitancy or low acceptability, when there may be other drivers also present. Differences in access may contribute to these disparities as um, many others may as well. Identifying and understanding these and other drivers of inequity is a critical step towards closing these equity gaps, and we have further work to do here. In the meantime, we know healthcare provider recommendations are important and continue to appear to increase the acceptability of COVID vaccination, particularly among adults who are Black, over the age of 65, retired, and of lower income. Next slide. So the work group felt that the vaccine is probably acceptable to key stakeholders. Next slide. So now moving to feasibility. Next slide. Here we see trends in completed primary series and first boosters for persons uh, age 5 through 11 in purple, 12 through 17 in orange, and 18 to 49 in blue. And you can see the primary series is the darker shade of those colors, whereas the first booster receipt is a lighter shade. For most individuals ages 5 through 49 years, you can see that it's been six months or more since their last COVID vaccine dose. Next slide. Here we see the trends in completed, series, in completed primary series, first and second boosters for persons aged 50 to 64 years in orange, and then 65 or over in blue. While many have received a second booster in the past six months, you can see comparatively few have received a dose in the past eight weeks. You can also tell that uh, overall the numbers have declined with each of the booster recommendations as we've progressed. Next slide. This actually shows that based on, uh, that um, in September, based on the total number of persons eligible which includes those who've completed a primary series but not received a COVID vaccine in the past two months, consistent with the language in the EUA, is almost 210 million individuals, while the number ineligible, which would be those who had a vaccine dose in the past two months, is less than 5 million. Next slide. 
Overall, the U.S. government has purchased approximately 171 million bivalent mRNA vaccine booster doses for the fall and beyond, with the options to purchase additional doses as needed. Based on this, there will be a sufficient but finite supply of these vaccines. We do not anticipate limited supply settings overall. However, jurisdictions have been given considerations for selecting sites to receive the initial doses based on ability to rapidly use the vaccine. These considerations were in the operational planning guide provided to jurisdictions with the link at the bottom, and they include location and access to a range of populations to ensure equitable distribution, the ability to reach those at highest risk of COVID, the ability to handle the large product shipments, and the ability to administer the vaccines. Next slide. We'll hear more from Dr. Hall in the next portion of the presentation around these details. But overall, the bivalent vaccines have the same storage and handling parameters as the monovalent vaccines that they're used to handling. However, both manufacturers' bivalent vaccines will have gray label borders, but different injection volumes. And again, Dr. Hall has pictures with much better details, but I'll note that the monovalent and bivalent labels for the Pfizer vaccine have identical cap and label colors. For Moderna, the bivalent vaccine will be distinct from the adult monovalent dose, but may look similar to the product for ages 6 through 11. Next slide. And for the equity question for this domain, is it feasible to implement across all population? Next slide. Again, we've looked at data from the data tracker demonstrating persistent racial and ethnic disparities in receipt of the first booster among those who are eligible. We previously reviewed the survey data demonstrating that about a third of adults of Hispanic or Latino ethnicity had completed a primary series but not received a booster. Here in the data tracker, we see that those 12 and up who are eligible for a first booster, over half of those of Hispanic or Latino ethnicity had not received it. And in fact, more than half of eligible populations of uh, many populations, the American Indian Alaskan Native, Black, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander populations have also not received their first booster. Next slide. In summary, use of the bivalent COVID vaccines appears feasible, but with some important limitations. Over 200 million people will be eligible for these bivalent vaccines. Most are at least six months out from their last COVID vaccine dose. CDC has provided an operational planning guide for jurisdictions preparation, and has noted there will be a sufficient but finite supply of these bivalent vaccines. Some aspects of these vaccines will be easy for implementation, but vials and labeling may require additional education. And importantly, significant racial and ethnic disparities persist in receipt of a booster, suggesting that the implement in intervention may not be equally feasible to implement across all populations. Next slide. So the work group felt the feasibility that it was probably, yes, uh, feasible to uh, implement. Next slide. Moving to resource use. Next slide. This study is a preprint and it evaluated COVID attributable, attributable disease and direct medical costs that could be averted by a booster program under two potential scenarios. On the left is with coverage similar to influenza vaccination rates, and on the right is if we achieved broader uh, coverage of 80%. They estimate that an early fall booster vaccination program that reaches coverage similar to the 2020-2021 influenza season could prevent up to $62 billion in direct medical costs, and this would further increase with broader coverage of the vaccines. Next slide. So this shows that data in a graphical format showing the cost could, um, comparing the cost that could be saved compared to their estimate of the vaccination cost. Note this isn't a peer-reviewed publication quite yet or a model that CDC has conducted, but it includes data of possible estimates of a cost-benefit scenario using their model estimates. Next slide. Then for the uh, equity question uh, for this domain is the intervention a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources across all populations. Next slide. Note that cost effectiveness data are not yet available for most demographic subgroups, but there is some one study that was available for older adults. Looked at the cost effectiveness of the first booster dose of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine administered six months after the second dose among 65 uh, adults 65 and over from a healthcare system perspective. Compared to a two dose primary series, but without a booster, the booster strategy 
and 100,000 older adults resulted in a net monetary benefit of over $3 million and a 3.7 quality adjusted life years over 180 days. Uh, noting that the cost effectiveness of the boosters is highly sensitive to the population incidence of COVID and the vaccine effectiveness, the study estimated that offering COVID boosters to adults 65 and over in the US was likely to be cost effective. Next slide. So overall, a fall vaccination campaign that expands eligibility for booster and moves um, to reach people could avert a surge of hospitalizations and deaths that would result in substantial consider uh, savings and direct medical costs. Next slide. So the work group felt that, that the bivalent vaccines uh, probably, yes, were an efficient and allocation, uh, reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. Next slide. In summary, next slide. So this slide looks like a lot, but I'm just trying to walk through the compositions of the updated or bivalent vaccines on the right compared to the current or monovalent vaccines on the left. For the current Moderna vaccine, there's 50 micrograms of the ancestral strain. For the current monovalent Pfizer vaccine, there's 30 micrograms of the ancestral strain. Then on the right, the updated or bivalent Moderna vaccine contains 25 micrograms of the ancestral strain and 25 micrograms of the spike protein from uh, Omicron BA45. For Pfizer, it's 15 micrograms of ancestral and 15 micrograms of BA45. But note that overall, the bivalent vaccines have the same total antigen amount as the monovalent vaccines, just with the additional Omicron composition. Next slide. So the summary of the data that was presented in ETR show that the current monovalent COVID vaccines have dramatically reduced COVID hospitalizations and deaths. However, we know that as the virus has evolved, declines in neutralizing antibodies and, vac and declines in vaccine effectiveness have been noted, as well as more rapid waning from the vaccines. Inclusion of a second SARS-CoV-2 variant in the vaccine broadens the antibody response. Omicron-specific bivalent vaccines were studied in over 1,400 individuals. An Omicron-specific bivalent vaccine resulted in higher antibody titers for Omicron variants, higher titers for other SARS-CoV-2 variants, and titers that were as high or higher for ancestral SARS-CoV-2. And we know that broad uptake of COVID vaccine booster doses early this fall could prevent over 100,000 hospitalizations compared to a later or more limited rollout and may uh, even uh, save billions of dollars of direct medical costs. Next slide. So to avoid, uh, I know that was a lot. Um, what we're gonna do right now is walk through, I've finished the evidence to recommendation framework, uh, the data. So congratulations, we made it to the end of that. We'll break it up just a little bit. So right now we're going to break for clarifying questions on data presented to ETR. Then I will turn it over to Dr. Hall and Dr. Twentyman as they walk us through the clinical considerations for the bivalent vaccines if ACIP votes to recommend them today. After that, we'll break for clarifying questions on the clinical considerations. Then you'll get me back for an encore discussing the overall work group interpretation of the data, and we'll open it up for discussion of possible recommendations. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Lee for clarifying questions on ETR. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. That was um, terrific, and we really appreciate the break and the ability to ask some questions. So I'll open it up to uh, my colleagues to see if there are any questions about the ETR domains. Ms. McNally. Thank you, Dr. Oliver, for a really informative presentation. I'm going to state in advance that I don't know if this question is more appropriate here or for the work group interpretation, but I would like to try and see if anyone can answer the question of whether the strain alteration change, um, whether it changes the vaccine safety risk benefit analysis. Yeah, thanks. I'm happy to, to kind of summarize um, the, the current understanding. So as we walked through the uh, differences between, so we have extensive safety data on overall the mRNA platform um, and use of the monovalent mRNA vaccines. Then we have safety data from over 1,400 individuals who received a bivalent Omicron vaccine, and there were no safety concerns raised there. We know that the differences between BA1 
and BA45 um, are enough to impact some of the, the antibody titers, which is why FDA chose to, to ask for the BA45 vaccine. But we do not anticipate that this, those amino acid substitutions would overall change the safety um, or overall uh, you know, benefit risk balance. What we do know is we don't know the incremental benefits that would be going from the BA1 to the BA45. Um, but given the experience, um, the experts that have weighed in on this, we do not anticipate that the safety or reactogenicity of the vaccines would be different with the BA1 vaccine versus the BA45 containing vaccine. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Palin. Um, I, too, want to say thank you for um, presenting so much information clearly, and I really appreciated how equity was um, reviewed with each part of the domains and thought that was highly effective. My, um, I, can you go back to the um, area where we were looking at modeling? And we had two different approaches. And... Um, I just need to, re if you could help me review that data, it would be really helpful. Thank you. Absolutely, I know it goes by fast. I uh, will also say, I'll, I'll walk through a little bit and then we have some of our um, uh, individuals who actually did the modeling. So I'll, I'll see if, if uh, they have anything else uh, to add. So there have been many rounds um, as the virus has evolved. Uh, there was round 14 uh, that kind of looks like a two by two um, table. So they looked at um, for vaccines, if we went with 50 and over only or 18 and over, then they also looked at, at no new variants or kind of a, a new variant um, and those four possible permutations. Then round 15 said, we're gonna have the same no variant versus variant, but the vaccine assumptions are gonna change. Instead of going with age, we're gonna look at time. So it, we're gonna assume everyone 18 and over is recommended, but what if we went from uh, rolling it out in September versus rolling it out in November? Then next slide. This, as you can see, there's kind of the four boxes. So um, uh, there's the four permutations, and we're highlighting what would kind of the, the most relevant here, which was um, while we may not be able to control the variant, we could control the age of the vaccine uh, recommendations. And so a broader uptake leads to uh, more hospitalizations and deaths averted. Then I'll go ahead and just go to slide 15. I may turn it over to Dr. Lessler if he would like to, but one more slide. Oh, sorry, just round 15. <laughs> um, and then this also shows that in round 15, oh, yeah, no, whatever, uh, yes. Um, that this was then again looking at kind of the early rolling out vaccine in September versus rolling it out in uh, November. And we saw that there was more hospitalizations and deaths that could be averted by early rollout. But that is a way opler simplification. So I'll see Dr. Wallace and Dr. Lessler are on. So I'll turn it over to them if they want to explain further. Justin, are you? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, yeah, so I think that was a good summary. Uh, you know, round 14, ignoring the, the, the potential impact of, of a new variant, round 14 was really looking at this contrast between you know, something that looked like earlier booster rounds versus this idea that we could achieve annual flu-like vaccine coverage in those 18 and older. And we did find this, you know, project a substantial impact of that um, in that round. Now that round was done in early June. So, you know, or, or based on data up to early June. So the amount of data we had there about, um, exactly what the impact of BA5 would be and how things might go, might progress as we enter the fall uh, was less than the second round. So, so, so there is a change between the two rounds, both in exactly how much data we have and in the, you know, in what we're looking at. So going on to round 15, round 15 was really a, a kind of a redux of, of, of round 14 with you know, the idea of we're going to do everything the same, except we're going to look at, you know, based on um, input from, from a variety of folks, we're going to, we're going to like zero in on this 
18 or older flu-like uptake scenario and see how much big impact timing has. Um, it does, is September, you know, a September flu-like campaign prevent more deaths than deaths and hospitalizations than, than in November one. And uh, we, we did see, as shown here, you know, a, a, an impact of that. Uh, you know, but that's not the only difference because, of course, here we have a lot more data to fit. So you'll notice these uh, confidence intervals. And to, to explain these figures, the, the darkest is a 50% projection interval. The next darkest is an 80% projection interval. The next darkest is 90 and the next darkest is 95. You'll notice those have gotten narrower. Uh, which is largely because we have more data at, at this point. So um, hopefully that, that that's clarifying. Thank you. Um, Dr. Long? Um, it's about the same thing, um, but I don't know that it would be helpful for me to understand rounds. I just, or exactly what this, what we're looking at 552 means it would look like you anticipate in January of 2023 we're going to have a whole lot of cases. Is that what that looks like? So that right column is under the assumption of a hypothetical immune escape variant, what we call variant. I see. So the variant X starts entering the country in the late fall. Take it has a the variant that that variant is assumed to have 40% immune escape, including to the vaccine. So of course we see, I see. some probability of a big wave there. Okay. Um, the left side is the no new variant scenario. I see. And did that does I, I, what I'm trying to understand is this advantage of September. Because you think making it an influenza-like recommendation in September will immunize more people? Or because you, you think that the Omicron 4 or 5 going on right now is still robust enough to get a lot of people sick and dead or in the hospital? It, it's that second. It's that the... It's the second. Yeah, so in the two scenarios, we're assuming the exact same uptake. Um, uh -huh. so the exact same okay. number of people get them in round 15. And okay. this is for round 15. So in, yeah. in round 15, we're, we're assuming the exact same uptake in, in the early, what we're calling the early booster and the late booster scenarios. It's just the timing that's different. And it's because there's still Omicron going on now. Yeah, and, and and some of the models, if not most of the models, assume that if, you know, absent a booster, seasonal effects and immunological waning could could allow additional cases to occur in the fall, and particularly you know potentially a reasonably high number of them. So that was my last question. You in this model, you assumed no early waning. So, like three months, four months. So, because what if we, I mean, it, it looks as if Omicron is falling. And what if we did transition to a, a seasonal or a new variant in January and the vaccine immunity only lasts for three months, four months? So, so that would be a bad choice. Right. So, so I, I can I can dig into that a little bit. That that is something that came came up. And and so one thing I say is you know it's important to remember about the scenario modeling hub is this is a multi team effort. So we're really bringing together information from five from in this case at the national level five different teams. So we have more teams at the various state levels. Uh, those teams were. All of those teams had to have some level of immune waning in their model, but they were free to, within certain parameters, have the speed of that immune waning be based upon their best interpretation of past data. So some teams had relatively rapid immunological waning that, that you know was closer to you know the four three to four month range, and some had had longer waning. 
Um, you do see in in a couple of scenarios that um, in a couple of scenarios that or, or sorry for a couple of the models because of that, you do see exactly the phenomena that you're saying, that the um, that you see a little bit more hospitalization in the early booster sec early booster um, scenario than the late booster scenario in that later wave. But um, for any of the models, um, you know, but overall, the majority of the models um, did not show that, and even those that did, it, it tended to be it was tended to be offset by the benefit you get from the earlier boosting overall. So, um, so that's all to say this was something that you know was covered by the space of models. The imp the effect you're saying um, does exist to some extent, but you know, because we're not weaning, I think partially because we're not weaning to zero, um, the net effect being uh, projected by um, most of the models was still more beneficial, you know, uh, benefited earlier boosters versus later, even with that effect in there. Thank you so much. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, Dr. Sanchez, last question, and then we'll move to the next section. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to make a comment. I think on your side, 80, just to defend my Hispanic heritage. When you said that, when you comment about a third of adults of Hispanic Latino ethnicity, and I'm glad you say Latino, not Latin X, say they're fully vaccinated for COVID-19, but haven't received their booster yet. Actually, I think by current definition, they are fully vaccinated. They are correct but they may not be up to date. That's just a minor comment. I just, I'm just, you know, struggling with a recommendation. I understand that we need better vaccines, whether it's a messenger RNA, whether it's some other platform, but we need better vaccines because obviously we're still, um, you know, the, we're still having a lot of COVID despite vaccination. Um, even though it has been extremely helpful and uh, protection against severe disease, but there's no question about that. But I'm struggling with making a recommendation for a vaccine, uh, bivalent vaccine, and I fully support the need for such. But to make a recommendation for a vaccine that has not been studied in humans, um, and that, at least that I'm not seeing the data. I'm, I know there's ongoing studies. Um, we're going to make a recommendation for um, 18 and over, um, and you know, and then the other one, um, you know, I, I just, I'm just very, um, I just want to bring that up. That yes, bivalent vaccine, the, the, um, you know, the, the BA1 um, has been studied, but that's not the vaccine we're going to be recommending. And um, so I just want to bring that up as a, as a concern. Um, and I guess I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Um, Dr. Daly, really last comment. <laughs> okay, well, I, I think I, I would like to then, either now or later, come back to the, to the sort of fundamental point that Dr. Sanchez is raising, but we can, we can also do that after ICC if, the, if you feel like that would work, after clinical considerations if you feel like it's a better time. You know, um, I think it's okay to address now. We, we're we're going to get back to this when we get to the full discussion. Um, I think there, this is actually, but it feels like that would be for the, um, the last section after clinical considerations, and maybe we can talk about that uh, together as a group. So I imagine there's multiple uh, individuals that have um, diverse opinions on this. So. Okay. <laughs> I'll yeah, let's my, do that. I'll okay. Put my hand down. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, so let's move on to clinical considerations at this point. Uh, Dr. Hall, would you be able to put up your slides and lead us through? All right, thank you. Um, so I'll be sharing anticipated updates to the interim clinical considerations for COVID 19 vaccines contingent on a recommendation for these vaccines. Next slide. 
So yesterday, Moderna and Pfizer bivalent vaccines were authorized. Moderna for use in people ages 18 years and older, and Pfizer for use in people ages 12 years and older. These vaccines were authorized for use as a single booster dose administered at least two months after either completion of primary vaccination with any authorized or approved monovalent COVID-19 vaccine or receipt of the most recent booster dose with any authorized or approved monovalent COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. Along with the authorization of bivalent vaccines for ages 12 years and older for the booster, monovalent mRNA COVID-19 vaccines are no longer authorized are, are no longer authorized as booster doses for individuals ages 12 years and older. This means that monovalent booster doses can no longer be given to people ages 12 years and older, even if the person had not previously received a monovalent booster dose. Next slide. So with this new authorization for an updated bivalent booster, at a high level, everyone ages 12 years and older is recommended to receive one age-appropriate bivalent mRNA booster dose after completion of any FDA-approved or authorized monovalent primary series or last monovalent booster dose. So this means people cannot get a bivalent booster without first completing a primary series. Homologous and heterologous boosters are allowed as long as they are age appropriate, meaning only Pfizer bivalent can be given to people ages 12 through 17, but either Moderna or Pfizer bivalent can be given to people ages 18 years and older. There is no preference. At this time, there are no changes to schedules for children ages 6 months through 11 years. Next slide. So again, the bivalent booster recommendation replaces previous booster recommendations for people ages 12 years and older. This means that now everyone ages five years and older who are eligible for a booster dose are only eligible for one booster dose. People ages five through 11 who received Pfizer are eligible for the one monovalent booster dose currently and people 12 years and older one bivalent booster dose. Next slide. If you perceive this is a big change to dose counting, you are right, our recommendations are simplified. We are changing the way we're thinking about these vaccines from dose counting monovalent boosters to one bivalent booster for everyone uh, eligible. So this table just reinforces that regardless of whether you've had zero, one, or two monovalent boosters, one bivalent booster is now recommended next. So since some people may have already had three, four, or even five doses for those who are immunocompromised and had a second booster already, we want to emphasize we're no longer looking at total number of doses. If eligible, meaning age 12 and older, have completed at least a primary series, and are two months out from the last dose, a bivalent booster should not be denied based on the number of total doses the person has received. Next slide. Shown on this slide is a visual of what the revised schedule for people who are not moderately or severely immunocompromised would look like. The schedule is going to look a bit different as it has been significantly simplified. So starting at this top row for people ages 12 years and older, you're recommended to receive a primary series, either Moderna, Novavax, or Pfizer is recommended. And then this would be followed by an age-appropriate bi bivalent booster dose at least two months or eight weeks after completion of the primary series or most recent monovalent booster. As shown in this arrow, um, the bivalent booster is now recommended regardless of how many previous monovalent boosters were received. In certain limited situations, Janssen can be used followed by a bivalent booster at least two months later. Next slide. Now looking at the schedule for people who are moderately or severely immunocompromised, the primary series is not changing. This remains the same. Again, Moderna, Novavax, and, or Pfizer are recommended. So for Moderna and Pfizer, this is three doses. For Novavax, this is two. And the bivalent recommendation is the same for everyone 
one bivalent booster dose at least two months after completion of the primary series or most recent previous monovalent booster dose. Again, Janssen is only used in limited situations for those 18 years and older. Those who got a Janssen primary dose get an additional mRNA followed by a bivalent booster. Now I'll hand it over to Dr. Twentyman to talk more about supplementing the schedule for people who are immunocompromised with Evusheld. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall. This simplification of recommendations is a great opportunity to look closely at the spectrum of resources we have available to protect people with moderate to severe immunocompromise. Therefore, in addition to the potential new recommendation to receive an updated bivalent booster we're discussing today, let's also look at existing recommendations for pre-exposure prophylaxis, which can be used in complement to our COVID-19 vaccines to protect our immunocompromise compromised population. Next slide, please. Pre-exposure prophylaxis refers to a medication that is given before exposure to an infectious disease to protect an individual against that disease. The pre-exposure prophylaxis Evusheld is recommended for those ages 12 and up who weigh at least 40 kilograms or 88 pounds with moderate to severe immunocompromise due to a medical condition or receipt of certain immunosuppressing treatments. Examples of such medical conditions or treatments are included in the Evusheld Emergency Use Authorization Fact Sheet on CDC's website uh, and are similar to those um, previously uh, leading to eligibility for multiple boosters. Evusheld is also recommended to be given to those who are unable to receive COVID-19 vaccine due to a history of severe adverse reaction to a COVID-19 vaccine or one of its components. Next slide, please. Tixagivimab and Silgavimab, or Evusheld, is a combination of two long-acting human monoclonal antibodies derived from B cells donated by convalescent patients after SARS-CoV-2 infection. The FDA issued an emergency use authorization for use of Evusheld for pre-exposure prophylaxis in December of 21, revised the EUA to increase the dose to 300 milligrams of each monoclonal antibody in February of 2022, and revise the fact sheet for healthcare providers to recommend Evusheld be administered every six months in June of 2022. Evusheld must be prescribed by a healthcare provider. Doses can be found through the US government therapeutic locator tool on ASPR's website linked here. As of last month, there is also a new ordering pathway available through the HHS Health Partner Order Portal, or HPOP, such that in addition to the large orders available through the HPOP distribution process, providers who aren't participating in that process can now order up to three doses through the small volume orders portal linked here. Next slide, please. Use of Evusheld is evidence-based. In a randomized clinical trial, Evusheld had efficacy for the prevention of COVID-19, and in multiple other studies, including real-world data, Evusheld was observed to have efficacy against severe COVID-19 outcomes, including during this period of Omicron, Omicron variant predominance. Additionally, in vitro studies show that Evusheld is predicted to work against BA.4.5. Next slide, please. Despite the protection that Evusheld can provide, most people with immunocompromise in the U.S. have not actually received Evusheld. Among the almost 7 million individuals with immunocompromise, a very small percentage, or about 5%, have actually received doses of Evusheld. This is not an issue of supply. Current Evusheld supply far exceeds demand, and more than 390,000 doses are already distributed and available for use today. Evusheld is distributed by the U.S. government at no cost to participants, although some locations of administration may have an association associated administration fee. Next slide, please. Here, we illustrate how use of monoclonal antibodies for pre-exposure prophylaxis can complement receipt of COVID-19 vaccines for optimal protection of those with immunocompromise. Specifically, after any dose of COVID-19 vaccine, an individual should wait two weeks before receiving Evusheld. After Evusheld, there is no minimum interval to the next COVID-19 vaccine, either within a primary series or if receiving a booster dose. 
Ebuchild is recommended to be administered every six months and individuals should consult with their physician for a prescription. Next slide, please. CDC is in the process of updating several web pages to make this information more widely available. Updated content for health healthcare providers will include descriptions of patient eligibility and detailed Evusheld administration guidance, as well as those links to options for ordering Evusheld as were shown earlier. Updated content for the general public will include additional information about how to know if you're eligible for Evusheld, as well as the dose finder shown earlier. Updated language within our interim clinical considerations for use of authorized and approved COVID-19 vaccines will clearly describe how use of Evusheld complements COVID-19 vaccination to optimally protect people with moderate to severe immunocompromise. Thanks very much, and back to you, Dr. Hall. Thank you, Dr. Twentyman. Uh, next slide, please. Now I'll dive into specifics on timing considerations for bivalent boosters. Next slide. Our current timing guidance for vaccination in persons with current or prior SARS-CoV-2 infection also applies to bivalent boosters. If a person has current or prior SARS-CoV-2 infection, at a minimum, vaccination should be deferred at least until recovery from acute illness and criteria to discontinue isolation have been met. This is the minimum. Additionally, these people may consider delaying vaccination longer by three months from symptom onset or positive test if infection was asymptomatic. Individual factors such as risk of COVID-19 severe disease, community level, or characteristics of the predominant strain should be taken into account when determining whether to delay getting a COVID-19 vaccine after infection. Next slide. With new bivalent vaccines, co-administration guidance has not changed. Routine administration of all age-appropriate doses of vaccines simultaneously is recommended as best practice for people for whom no specific contraindications exist at the time of the healthcare visit. I'll note that orthopox virus vaccine does not follow the same routine guidance, and further information on that very specific situation can be found in CDC's interim clinical considerations. Extensive experience with non-COVID-19 vaccines has demonstrated that immunogenicity and adverse event profiles are generally similar when vaccines are administered simultaneously as when they are administered alone. Therefore, providers should offer all vaccines for which a per person is eligible at the same visit. Next slide. With both influenza and COVID-19 vaccine campaigns, we've received a lot of questions about co-administration of these vaccines specifically. Providers should offer influenza and COVID-19 vaccines at the same visit if eligible. This includes adjuvanted or high-dose influenza vaccines, but the recommendation in this case is to administer in separate limbs. With both influenza and SARS-CoV-2 circulating, getting both vaccines is important for prevention of severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Getting both vaccines at the same visit increases the chance that a person will be up to date with their vaccinations. Next slide. Studies looking at co-administration have shown that immunogenicity is similar between, um, between those who received co-administered COVID-19 vaccine and seasonal influenza vaccine and those who received these vaccines separately. We know many people have received simultaneous vaccination with influenza vaccine last season. 9.4% of vSAFE participants reported simultaneous vaccination with an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine and seasonal influenza vaccine. 8.7% of persons enrolled in the vaccine safety data link received simultaneous vaccination with a COVID-19 booster and seasonal influenza vaccine during the 21-22 influenza season. Next slide. Finally, this slide summarizes studies to date on reactogenicity of co-administered COVID-19 vaccine and seasonal influenza vaccine. This chart shows the percent difference in participants reporting reactogenicity between COVID-19 and influenza vaccine versus COVID-19 alone. On the left axis is listed which vaccines were co-administered, including any seasonal influenza vaccine, adjuvanted, cell-based, recombinant, and high-dose influenza vaccines. In the chart, systemic reactions are shown in green and local in blue. 
To the left of the zero are the differences in which more reactogenicity was observed with COVID-19 vaccines alone, and to the right are differences in which more reactogenicity was observed with COVID-19 and influenza vaccine co-administration. Generally, COVID-19 vaccines administered with seasonal influenza vaccine showed similar or only slightly higher reactogenicity and no specific safety concerns were identified. Next slide. And this just um, states the conclusion I just mentioned. Next slide. So in terms of best practices for multiple injections, we recommend to label each syringe with the name and dosage of the vaccine, lot number, initials of preparer, and beyond use time if applicable. Administer each vaccine in a different injection site and separate injection sites by one inch or more. And finally, administer the COVID-19 vaccine and vaccines that may be more likely to cause a local reaction in different limbs if possible. I mentioned this earlier, an example would be adjuvanted or high dose influenza vaccine and COVID-19 vaccines. Next slide. Now take a look at the bivalent vaccine products in comparison to the current monovalent products. Starting with Pfizer, monovalent and bivalent cap and border label colors will be identical. They are both gray. Most characteristics are the same, authorized for 12 years and older, 30 micrograms. The injection volume is 0.3 milliliters. Dilution is not required for these specific products, although other Pfizer products require dilution. And they have the same beyond use of 12 hours and the same storage. The differences shaded in gray on this chart are the composition, monovalent and bivalent, and the type of dose. The monovalent is primary series and the bivalent is booster doses. Next slide. Can you go back one slide? Um, so here are the labels. So on the left is the monovalent, on the right is the bivalent. They are almost identical aside from on the right in the red box, um, the name is different and that is about it. So um, this is something to be aware of for errors. We're going to be having um, education on strategies to prevent admin errors so that um, um, we can try to reduce these errors uh, in provider offices. Next slide. So for Moderna, I'll highlight two different vials in comparison to the bivalent. The one for the older age group, ages 12 years and older, and then the one with the most similar appearance, and that's actually for ages 6 through 11. Next slide. So first, the monovalent product authorized for ages 12 years and older is fairly visually distinct from the bivalent product authorized for ages 18 years and older. The monovalent is in a red, red capped vial with a light blue label border color. And this is now only authorized for primary doses. Comparatively, the bivalent product for booster doses in people 18 years and older is in a vial with a dark blue cap and a gray label border. Um, again, the injection volume is the same, the same beyond use date of 12 hours and the same storage. Next slide. So here are the labels of the two products I just highlighted. As you can see, they're much more visually distinct. Uh, the bivalent booster is clearly labeled booster doses only in all caps, and there are different colors on these labels. Next slide. So the vial that looks the most similar is actually the monovalent product authorized for primary doses in people ages 6 through 11 years. This vial also uses a dark blue cap, and the visual distinction is the purple label border. Next slide. Here's a look at the label comparing. So both say booster doses only in all caps. However, of note, the monovalent vial authorized for primary doses in ages 6 to 11 is not authorized for booster doses. The main distinction is the name of the vaccine and the color of the border um, and the background for the booster doses only text, um, purple versus gray. So this is also something to keep an eye out for and implement strategies to prevent errors. Next slide. And finally, uh, CDC continues to encourage people to stay up to date with their COVID-19 vaccines. 
Staying up to date keeps people current with the COVID-19 vaccine recommendations. With new recommendations, people are up to date if they have completed a primary series and received the most recent booster dose recommended for them by CDC. Next slide. And now we'll break for questions. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Ms. McNally. Thank you. I'm thinking about um, recent infections. And I just want to clarify whether there is data to answer the question of whether prior recent infection plus vaccination with the bivalent vaccine has any indication of um, increased myocarditis. Thank you. Alicia, this is Tom. Do you want me to take that one? Sure. I, I was going to say no, but I did not have a okay. more detailed answer. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think we have any, any information on on the bivalent booster dose, but um, we we do know that that um, individuals who have uh, a recent COVID infection and then are are vaccinated for for COVID can experience increased reactogenicity events, um, but we don't have any evidence that that places them at increased risk for myocarditis. Okay, Dr. Shimabukuro, can you can you clarify whether we're talking about a time frame that is less than 90 days or more like recent infection just after 90 days when you say that? I I don't have the exact time frame um off the off the top of my head, but we've th there's actually a couple of studies um which aren't which aren't published yet. One looks in vSafe data. Um, and it, it looks at it looks at people who report having uh, a vaccination, and I'm not sure how they define it, but I, I, I suspect it's on the order of, um, uh, you know, within several months. Um, but but uh, based on that information, you know, self-reported reactogenicity appears to be, and that's things like systemic reactogenicity, fever, um, fatigue muscle aches, that type of thing, um, is, is reported with higher frequency if you've had a recent infection. But again, uh, th there's, n there's no evidence or there's a lack of evidence that that, that that places you at increased risk for myocarditis. Okay, that's helpful. I have one follow-up question since we have you. Um, can you confirm for us that that the CDC and the work group, and whether that's VAST or the, the COVID work group, will be following the international safety data for this particular vaccine? Uh, I would defer to maybe um, Dr. Oliver about the, the U.S. vaccines versus the international um, new booster vaccinations. I, 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 I'm not sure about the, the formulations for those, but I will say that we, um, we, we, uh, uh, we regularly consult with our public health and regulatory colleagues, international colleagues to exchange information um, and, to, uh, and to, to better keep on top of the, the, the safety data. So the answer is yes. Yeah, and I'm happy this is uh, Sarah for the, the COVID work group as well. Yes, we will collaborate. Um, there are our NITAGs, which is the things like ACIP um, that are across the globe uh, and with other safety agencies to look at any available safety data for bivalent vaccines, whether it's the BA1 vaccine that's used in some countries in Europe and uh, potentially Canada, as well as the BA4-5 vaccine if that's used internationally as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, Thank you. Thank you. And we have Dr. Deeks on. If she wants to raise her hand later and make any comments, um, that would be great. I don't want to put her on the spot in the moment. <laughs> we'll move to Dr. Paling. Um, thank you. Um, my um, big question, and I'm going to outline it a little bit more before um, I ask it, is really about the um, switch immediately from bivalent to monovalent boosters. 
And here's the thought process behind my question so that we can have a robust discussion. The data reviewed today highlight great benefits of booster dose on preventing hospitalization and death, and this data includes the monovalent vaccine. We have also reviewed and discussed disparities. In this discussion, we noted that factors like access may contribute to those disparities. It was implied um, in the discussion that there will be sufficient supply to replace monovalent with bivalent booster dose. My concern is that this information differs what we're receiving locally, that our initial supply will be small. And so could you please clarify what the anticipated supply distribution is and how we can make sure not to exacerbate disparities? Thank you. Hi, this is Sarah Meyer. Um, so thank you for that comment. Um, I guess what I'd, I'd like to say is, you know, we've been working through all of our established channels um, for uh, making sure that this bivalent booster vaccine is accessible nationwide. Um, we have hundreds of thousands of doses being delivered around the country today. Um, and by the end of the holiday weekend, millions of doses will be in the field um, with more arriving every day. Um, so we anticipate that we will um, you know, quickly be able to have you know, an authorized available booster product out there over the next couple of days. But then to your longer term question about how can we make sure that we have um, you know, sufficient supply access and ensuring equity, um, we will uh, be distributing this vaccine to tens of thousands of sites um, across the country. Um, you know, the vast majority of people will be within a five mile radius of, of a vaccine, a COVID-19 vaccine site. And we've been um, working for years now to make sure that we have equitable access, including um, efforts to um, make sure the vaccine is available for high risk populations, including long-term care facility residents, and also in areas that serve um, people who may be at higher risk uh, because of their race or ethnicity um, and underlying conditions. Uh, we've been working with um, many partners for years now to build those um, networks um, to ensure that we can, can continue to have equitable access for this vaccine. Um, so I hope that helps to answer the question. It does, except I worry about our children because the vast majority of children get vaccinated in the primary care setting. And um, I, I, I hope that has been an important component of what has been, has, has been included in this thought process. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, I see Dr. Deeks has raised her hand. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Dr. Meyer, did you want to add any additional comments? Um, well, no, I, I don't need to, but I, I was just going to acknowledge that comment and just say that, um, yes, and as we think about uh, bivalent booster authorizations, potentially in the future moving down in the age groups. Um, we'll continue to rely on our strong network of providers. Um, again, you know, most VFC, uh, you know, a large number of VFC providers also participate in the COVID-19 program. Um, we do have a pretty robust network of pedi pediatric providers um, that are participating and we would anticipate continuing to leverage um, all these partnerships for pediatric vaccines as well. Yeah, just uh, sorry to jump in, but just to augment that issue, I mean, I, this is why I've been so worried about the labeling issue, because it's impairing our ability to actually deliver vaccines without fear of causing any adverse events. So we are, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, partitioning out sort of the way we think about these doses in order to make sure we give it in the safest and most reliable way. But it would just be a lot easier if some of these labeling issues got um, fixed, to be honest. Uh, Dr. Deeks. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, we um, had uh, licensed the bivalent, Moderna bivalent, uh, BA1 was licensed today in, in Canada and the uh, NASI recommendations were also released today. Um, similar to the US, we are um, approaching the fall booster as a fall booster and stopping dose counting. So recommending that individuals receive a, a fall booster regardless of um, previous number of booster doses. 
Um, unlike the U.S., our um, ancestral products are remain licensed, um, and because there is a concern of potential, of potential supply, and these at least initially, our recommendations were that um, an authorized uh, dose of a bivalent vaccine should be offered as a booster dose, but if the bivalent Omicron-containing vaccine isn't ready, readily available, an original or ancestral vaccine should be offered. And then our timing is a recommendation for six months. Um, as opposed to, I think, what you're talking about, which is two months, um, but noting that it could, it can be decreased to a minimum of three months um, if epidemiologic conditions uh, warrant it. And then we have given an off-label, NACI does a lot of off-label recommendations, so we have given an off-label recommendation for bivalent um, uh, Moderna for adolescents 12 to 17 years of age, but only those adolescents with moderately to severely immunocompromising conditions or who have a biologic or social risk factor that put, puts them at place of um, um, high risk for severe outcomes, given that there are no data that for, um, for Moderna in this age group. So it was only authorized in, in Canada, as I said, to um, 18. Pfizer is not yet authorized, so we don't have nasty recommendations for them. Thanks, uh, thank Grace. You. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, and, you know, Dr. Deeks is my counterpart in Canada, so just for clarification. Um, Ms. Bata. Thank you. Um, I think I need a little clarification. Um, when uh, you had been going through the, the, the scenarios for um, bivalent versus monovalent um, for kids versus adults. Um, and my question is, right now, the, the one monovalent booster is recommended. Now, are we assuming that will change once we have an authorized product, a bivalent product? And so right now, um, the only monovalent that can be used for a booster dose is um, the, prod the Pfizer product for people ages 5 through 11 years who received a Pfizer primary series. That's essentially the only small population that the monovalent booster dose would still be recommended in. And um, we would anticipate to respond when uh, when and if FDA authorizes a bivalent for the younger age group to then um, make uh, applicable recommendations afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Thank you, Dr. Tineas. Thank you. Um, I share the concerns of Dr. Lee regarding the labeling of these vaccines. Um, and given that the Pfizer monovalent and bivalent look very similar, uh, in fact, in our system, um, the monovalent is uh, to be ordered in EPIC as the gray cap, uh, and now we'll have two gray, gray caps. Uh, what happens, or what is the clinical recommendation when um, a patient receives inadvertently a bivalent vaccine instead of a monovalent as part of their pr uh, primary series? What will be the guidance on that? Because I do see this scenario happening. So um, if I, I, I'm going to do both scenarios just in case. Um, so if uh, it, for the Pfizer gray label, if a monovalent is administered instead of a bivalent for the booster, in general, the recommendation is going to be do not repeat the dose. Um, vice versa, if a bivalent as is administered instead of a monovalent for a primary dose, again, we're going to say um, do not repeat the dose. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Cotton. Thank you very much for your emphasis on uh, encouraging Evusheld. Uh, I think it's a really important option, especially for the most immunocompromised and most vulnerable. Um, could I ask you to comment on, uh, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of people are making up uh, rules about um, when they should get vaccine and when they should be uh, getting Evusheld. And it's pretty clear in the Evusheld EUA that um, people should not get vaccines for two weeks afterwards. But can you comment, you or 
anyone else on the call comment as to whether there's actually an immunologic impact by getting Evusheld as far as decreasing response to uh, vaccination. And maybe you could go back to the Evusheld slides and just put that, could we put up the interval recommendation. Slide 129, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Cotton. There it is, excellent. So to review the schedule, um, it is true that by Evusheld EUA, emergency use authorization, um, Evusheld needs to be given um, at least two weeks after any dose of any COVID-19 vaccine. However, after Evusheld, there is no minimum interval to the next COVID-19 vaccine. And we did want to underscore that today because um, you may be quite correct that there is a misunderstanding of in which direction that two weeks works. Uh, I hope that is helpful. Thank you. Yes. Thanks very much for providing the clarity here. Thank you. Dr. Bell? Well, thank you. Um, I likely missed this, but um, could you review what um, the clinical, clinical considerations are going to say about the interval uh, between the last dose and the booster dose, um, not for people who um, had, were known to previously have COVID? Is it saying two months? Is it saying at least two months? How are you going to deal with that? Okay, so for, for people um, who um, did not have a recent infection, I, I think if I'm understanding you correctly, um, from the last dose, the interval is going to align with the EUA, which is at least two months. Okay, that was my question. And it, are, has anybody been giving any thought to um, providing any additional data around that uh, with respect to um, you know, the effectiveness of the booster dose with a longer interval, other considerations, anything like that? Are you planning to add any additional data, uh, verbiage or are you just planning to leave it like that? I, 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 as you can tell, I feel a little bit, um, I would, I think it would be unfortunate if people interpreted the two months, uh, at least two months as two months since it seems to me there's at least some suggestion that waiting is, is perhaps would improve um, performance of the vaccine. You think, Dr. Bell, since this is um, more around kind of the, the authorization and the vote. So, I mean, I think the, the EUA, uh, what is kind of authorized is, is this at least two months. Um, there was uh, slides in, uh, Um, slide that did kind of break down where people were. So you can see that for most of the population, uh, less than 50 years uh, of age, it has nearly all of that population less than 50 years has been at least six months since their last uh, vaccine dose. So I think there's both the kind of what is the earliest interval legally allowed by the authorization. And I think, you know, it would be important that We'll get into this there, uh, as we kind of walk through what the votes may be, but that the CDC recommendations and ACIP recommendations mirror what is in the EUA. Um, however, acknowledging that for most of these individuals, um, it, it, it's been at least six months uh, since their last vaccine dose. Um, we know that that's different for those 50 and over, um, uh, where there are some individuals who have had uh, a second booster in that kind of six month time frame. Uh, that's also the population that may be at the highest risk of severe uh, outcome um, uh, if they have a COVID infection. Um, so I think the decision, you know, there's the, the minimal interval that is authorized with the two months. And then I think the decision for when exactly to get this booster dose, and we can talk about this as we move into the recommendations as well, but can be informed by personal circumstances. When you recently had COVID, when your last vaccine was, uh, what your age and kind of individual risk factors for COVID are, um, uh, you know, and so, and what your kind of upcoming um, 
risk activities may be if you're going to be you know traveling or in a congregate uh, setting uh, in the future so i think there's a lot of kind of personal experience that can go into when exactly it's given the dose the the legally you know minimum interval is that two months and then for the most of this population five to fifty years they're they're well beyond that uh, at least six months from their last dose yeah okay thank you i understand that from a practical perspective this isn't really you know, it's not going to be a big problem for most people. Um, and I also understand what the EUA says, but I, I do think it's something that would be nice to at least provide some, as you say, some context for uh, individuals. Thank you. Dr. Lair. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. I've got two comments. Um, the first is an area for ongoing research. My Awareness of immunocompromised people has been raised by Dr. Cotton, and I have been paying attention to the data which suggests that they are simply not responding to the doses well, and that they might need more than just three doses. And so I would encourage people to be aware of that, that this booster dose might be great, but it might not be enough for immunocompromised people, and we might have to revisit that down the road. My second comment is, it is incredibly confusing, and it took me literally 15 minutes while I was on this call trying to find comparisons of all the doses and vials and who can use it for what. And I would encourage that this somehow get delineated with pictures for everybody so they can see what vial is being used for what situation. I finally found it on the CDC without pictures. But it was pretty helpful but I encourage possibly the CDC to put it out with pictures. Thank you. And I'm not sure if the manufacturers are still here and can comment, um, but I believe there are some wall charts um, that have pictures on them that are available from those websites. And we just essentially did not recreate the wheel um, since they were already available. But um, if, if you're on the line to confirm if those have been updated for bivalence, Dr. Lee um, just put a, a link in there, so I'll go looking some more on the internet and see what I can find. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. And I, I just um, so folks know, the AAP has put out a really nice uh, vaccine dosing quick reference guide after the last round of approvals for pediatric vaccines. I am hopeful that something similar could exist for this uh, 12 and older population. Uh, let's go to Dr. Sanchez. Um, and then I see four additional hands raised. I'm just going to ask we to go uh, with quick questions uh, and quick answers so that we can get to the uh, additional discussion. This is um, only the clinical consideration section. Thank you. Um, one question. Um, with Evyashield, has it been looked at for IV administration at all? I know the product that says I am, but I would imagine that that question may come up. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Uh, do we have either of our uh, representatives from the AstraZeneca sponsor on the phone, please? This is Gavin Cole. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. So, uh, you know, so, so Avisha was studied intravenously in the first in human study. In um, the treatment studies in tackle, uh, sorry, in active two and active three, they were also studied IV, and uh, the active three data is currently published online. So it can be done IV or IM, the picture that says IM. It's not authorized for that use in, um, in, in, in the EUA, but the data exists uh, in the Active 3 publication, which is in the public domain. Um, the formulation that was used is not different. Thank you. And, and another comment, um, thank you on that. Um, I, I really like the movement towards a almost like a yearly booster type thing. I, I do like the, um, you know, uh, despite my misgivings, as I mentioned previously, I like the, the fact that we're moving towards just a, like a booster dose. And I, um, and I think that's going to be helpful. I do want to echo Dr. Bell's comments, though, because although most, most individuals who may be getting it soon, if it is approved, um, or recommended um, may already be six months out. We're going to be seeing people who um, may have only been, you know, a couple months out from their last one, 
And I do want to echo Dr. Bell's comments that it appears that waiting uh, a little bit longer than that may improve um, the immunogenicity plus have less potential for um, for side effects, particularly at cardiac. Um, and I think that's that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Uh, Ms. Roth? Thank you. Representing AIM, I'll try to be fast. Um, back to the labeling, we're also concerned. Today was the first time I actually heard the rationale behind the why, right? Why they're labeled, how they are. And I think sharing that um, more broadly with immunization programs and providers could help alleviate some of the frustration while we also tackle it from a training and education perspective. And then I'm wondering if um, you can speak to the expectations regarding providers having to document inadvertent uh, monovalent boosters having been given since yesterday as vaccine administration in VAERS and considerations for any increased wastage we might expect to see with that removal of authorization. Um, so that would be considered a reportable vaccine administration error. Um, Tom, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I believe that would be a reportable vaccine administration error to VAERS. What is the actual, um, so what is the actual practice again? Can you just describe that? Um, if a monovalent- if somebody who, sh oh, go ahead. Yeah, if a monovalent was administered incorrectly, now, now that it's not authorized as a booster dose intended to be the bivalent or vice versa, if the bivalent was administered as the primary series, which also it is not authorized for. Uh, yes, uh, that, that would be a vaccination error. Um, uh, and and I, 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 I believe that's a vaccination errors are a reporting requirement. Thank you, Doc, um, Dr. Hahn. And, and sorry, just for clarification, Dr. Shumabakar, you mean reporting requirement to VAERS, correct? Yes, to VAERS. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Hahn? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, we can, thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, I just have a quick comment. Uh, state and local health departments are in the throes of putting on large monkeypox or you know, orthopox virus vaccination clinics, targeting in many cases young males. Right now, the Genios vaccine clinical consideration says, uh, and I quote, people, particularly adolescent or young adult males, might consider waiting four weeks after orthopox vaccination before receiving Moderna, Novavax, or Pfizer COVID vaccine uh, because of concerns about myocarditis. I didn't hear, and I'm sorry if I missed it, but in the clinical considerations presentation, I didn't hear anything about monkeypox vaccines. And in light of the fact that we are trying to ramp up efforts, I would just ask that those recommendations be harmonized, you know, make sure that uh, the message is the same. Um, we're, we have a large one coming up, uh, a large pride event in a week. And I'm not sure right now we're going to have people offering uh, monkeypox, flu, and COVID. And now I'm not sure whether they should be doing them simultaneously. So uh, if that could be addressed, I'd be very grateful. Yes. Thank you. The COVID um, interim, clinical, interim clinical considerations do match the monkeypox ones. Um, apologies, I did not highlight that specific situation on today's presentation, but it is in the text. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Duchin? Thank you. Um, I, I would um, just like to remind folks that achieving optimal and equitable vaccination coverage requires more than just vaccination doses or vaccine doses. Your uh, state and local health department colleagues are now in their third year, as well as our health uh, clinicians are in the third year of a COVID uh, pandemic response, as well as trying to respond to monkeypox uh, outbreak and uh, vaccination campaigns on top of other local infectious disease outbreaks. Many areas are also grappling with climate related health emergencies like heat, flooding, wildfires, and the, the work of achieving optimal vaccination coverage and equitable vaccination coverage requires significant investment in building relationships with community partners, empowering community partners, and developing trust. And that trust requires consistency. And that consistency and the adequacy of the response overall requires funding. We have not received additional COVID funding. We have not received any monkeypox funding. And we are very much um, running on fumes after uh, such a long outbreak response uh, that is being now um, multitasked 
um, with all the other um, overlaid responses by the same uh, staff and healthcare providers. So I do want to put uh, this information front and center for funding the necessary response at every level, not just the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duchin. Dr. Pilling, last quick question. Yes. Um, I wanted, I'm still very concerned about, um, and this tag teams beautifully with uh, Dr. Duchin's comment, that um, by saying we're going to do a massive switch on one day, and then if you inadvertently administer monovalent vaccine, which looks really similar to some of the others, now you have to report, yet need to submit a VAERS report. If we're trying to, the opportunity is to increase booster doses overall, and there's a huge opportunity. And it seems like we might be making this much harder than it should be. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is it okay, uh, Dr. Oliver, if we move on to your presentation? I'm happy to have the time for additional comments or uh, responses, but perhaps at the end, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so just to summarize the um, overall work group interpretations, as Dr. Daly mentioned at the beginning of the day, the work group has met frequently over the course of the last several months to review data that would inform these recommendations. In addition, the work group has had broad policy discussions around the use of the updated bivalent COVID-19 vaccines for people in age groups currently recommended for booster doses. Again, as a reminder, based on the current FDA authorizations, the recommendations would be for the, the, the current recommendations would be for Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine bivalent for individuals ages 12 years and over, and the Moderna vaccine bivalent for individuals 18 years and over. However, we expect that additional authorizations for other ages and vaccines may follow over the next several weeks to months. Next slide. We do, the work group discussed that the current population recommended for these boosters is very heterogeneous. Many in the United States have had Omicron infection over the past nine months. In addition, individuals recommended for the bivalent COVID-19 booster doses may have previously received a primary series only, uh, one booster dose, or for the population 50 and over immunocompromised, two booster doses. The work group also noted that the balance of benefits and risks for individuals may vary by age, by previous receipt of booster, or by recent SARS-CoV-2 infection. And there are uncertainties around the incremental benefit for some individuals, including those with recent infection or recent vaccine receipt. Next slide. Then the work group also discussed recommendations in the setting of prior infection. We know overall that COVID-19 vaccines are recommended even for those who have received or who've had prior infection. We also know that the rates of reinfection increased during the Omicron period. Bivalent COVID-19 vaccines in the setting of prior SARS-CoV-2 infection, some of which called hybrid immunity, resulted in the highest antibody titers. And encouragingly, these high and diverse titers may result in a longer duration of protection and increased need for frequent COVID-19 vaccine booster doses. We also know that studies have shown that increased time between infection and vaccination may result in an improved immune response to vaccination. Those with recent SARS-CoV-2 infection may consider delaying the vaccine dose by three months from symptom onset or positive test. Next slide. Then the work group also discussed that time since most recent vaccine dose may be more important than total cumulative number of doses. We also fully acknowledge that there will be a time of transition as the recommendations move from counting dose number to optimal timing of the vaccination campaigns. And we very clearly know and have learned for the last two years that vaccine recommendations that are simple and easy to communicate are important. The work group also discussed that if SARS-CoV-2 becomes a seasonal virus, an annual vaccine program could be an effective strategy for the future. So all of this highlights that there's a distinct effort to simplify vaccine recommendations 
through a transition to what could be a more sustainable and long-term COVID vaccination program. Next slide. I also just briefly want to highlight the new framework for the equity data we use today. Next slide. And a key important part of the discussion through equity is that equity isn't a yes no question, but requires considerations for implementation. Discussions on the work group also identified several of these implementation considerations, some of which have been discussed already, ensuring supply, ordering, and provider readiness for an equitable distribution of the vaccine. Next slide. Communications is also integral for uh, equitable implementation, creating COVID communication plans that understand existing data around attitudes and perceptions for COVID vaccines and adjusts actions accordingly. Leveraging trusted partners to deliver the vaccines as well as trusted messengers to communicate with a broad population. Next slide. So the work group reviewed the totality of the data presented today. And while acknowledging some uh, uh, this, and so as a reminder, this was the summary of the work group judgments for ETR. Next slide. Then as they reviewed the totality of the data presented today and acknowledging uncertainties around aspects of the data, they felt that the desirable consequences probably or clearly outweighed the undesirable consequences. Next slide. And the work group proposed to ACIP to recommend the intervention. Next slide. So then the question to ACIP, it will turn it back over to you guys, is should the updated or bivalent vaccines be recommended for persons already recommended to receive a vaccine booster dose broadly, very specifically pointing out the votes for today would be for the Moderna vaccine in 18 and over and the Pfizer vaccine in ages 12 and over. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Oliver. Uh, we can now proceed with a robust discussion. Oh, apologies. A uh, robust discussion of uh, um, the question that's put on the table, should updated slash bivalent vaccines be recommended for persons already recommended to receive a COVID-19 vaccine booster dose? And actually, I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to actually call back on um, Dr. Daly, if you're able to um, maybe provide some thoughts and comments from your perspective. Well, yeah, thanks so much. I mean, I, I, you know, this is in, in direct response to or or thoughts about the comment that Dr. Sanchez made. And, and I think for me that that comment about, um, you know, lacking clinical data for a bivalent BA4-5, that, that is um, to me one of the most important um, and fundamental sort of considerations and questions for us to discuss today. And, and I guess my thoughts about that are, are, are as follows. You know, I think and it's something I really struggled with as well, but, um, you know, in the abstract, if not in a pandemic with 90,000 cases a day or something, um, I think it would have been uh, better to have clinical data from a bivalent BA4-5 um, um, vaccine. But I would highlight a couple of points. I mean, the, the, the FDA um, considered that issue very carefully and met with their advisor committee, Verpac, and, and made the decision that they felt it was safe and appropriate and important to extrapolate data from, from um, bivalent BA1 vaccines to this decision. And then they made their EUA authorization yesterday based on that. So I think if we were to ask um, what would be the harm in waiting for clinical data from a BA45 um, bivalent vaccine, the, the, the idea would be, to me at least, uh, my understanding is we would need to wait till November or December to start a vaccination campaign. And then, and then based on the modeling that we saw, there would be a cost to that. And that cost might be somewhere in the range of 9,700 deaths and 1,000, or excuse me, 137,000 hospitalizations um, potentially averted. So I think that is the tension that I feel um, for sure. But I think I, I am reassured about several aspects of the vi bivalent vaccines. You know, I, I, I find it um, quite reassuring that the immune response in general to the bivalent vaccines really does seem more diverse, and I'm hopeful that it'll protect against ad additional um, variants. And then, then there's also sort of a, a, a practical aspect to it, too, for me, which is that um, given the decisions that the FDA has made, we're now in the position where we have a we have millions of doses of a bivalent vaccine that are 
um, ready and available. And I think they're going to be an effective tool for disease prevention this fall and into the, into the winter. So even though I also struggle with the exact issue that Dr. Sanchez raised, those are my, those are my thoughts about, about why um, I feel like there is, again, this is going to be an important tool to pre prevent additional uh, disease over. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Dr. Yeah, th thank you. And, and my comments address the same issue that was there with uh, that, that Dr. Sanchez uh, raised. I mean, first of all, Sarah, and I wish I had this slide in front of me, but B, the BA1, which had clinical, the Bible of BA1, that had clinical data showed activity against BA4 or 5. So theoretically, that I would have thought that might be a vaccine that we would consider for recommendation. The other side of that is that, you know, we've already, we've done immunobridging and that has been done with you know, vaccines for you know, decades. Uh, but I really do struggle with a vaccine that has no clinical data that, that's reported uh, for, uh, for humans, for you know, those that would be actually receiving the vaccine. O overall, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just, I have an issue with that. And keep looking back on the BA1 uh, bivalent vaccine and thinking yeah, perhaps that might have been a, a way to go. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Dr. Long? Uh, yes, I, I agree with Dr. Sanchez and Dr. Daly. Uh, come down on the side, I think, of Dr. Daly, mainly because it, we would have not much expectation that this vaccine would be clinically inferior um, to what we're already giving. And um, because it has the potential, I think, to decrease hospitalizations and even death. So I, I think I will reluctantly come down on that side and know that we don't usually have much information too much clinical information for sure for efficacy when we are thinking about change in influenza vaccines um, when it is the same scaffolding part of the same roof we're just putting in a, you know some dormers and windows um, that's that's one thing the second thing I would say is that I, I'm with Dr. Um, Bell and others that I don't even though most people would be at least six months out, I don't think we want to give the message that this is a two month after uh, your primary series or booster um, vaccine. And on one slide, you said you may want to delay it for three months. I, I, I would give the feeling that usually this is six months after your primary or your last booster, which it will be for most anyhow. And that there would be reasons that you um, might want to give it sooner, as soon as two months. That is, um, that uh, you haven't had a booster for some time and you're in some risk category. Or that I really do want to delay in people who have been recently infected for three months. And I'll tell you why that is. It's not only because of uh, what Dr. Oliver says, which I think is true, is that if you wait a little more time, you get a better immunologic response. I am really concerned that there are an awful lot of people who have very recently had Omicron infection. We are now going to recommend this for the group that is at risk for myopericarditis. And we clinicians know that those few patients who got myopericarditis, the adolescent boys who got it after their first dose, if we looked hard and we did serologic tests, we found that they had been infected symptomatically or asymptomatically in the short time before. And then with the added comment of Dr. Fink that it looks like if you got your um, second dose 
uh, in less than eight weeks after your first dose, you're more likely to get pericarditis. So I want to do no harm. So I, I like all the things that you said about um, the three months might be a better, there might be reasons to do sooner and later. Uh, and as early as two months could be justified. But in people who've had infection, I would like that to be three months. And I would like the idea to be that this booster is six months. And the very last thing, which is all grammar, is although we know you're talking about boosters, even on the slide that's before us, you want to say uh, er, currently authorized by FDA for booster doses include because I think people are going to start misunderstanding and wanting to give these as primary. That's all from Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Long, and thank you for picking up on that as well. Ms. Bata. Thank you. Um, I, I have some similar um, hesitations about moving forward with the recommendation um, for which we have no um, human clinical data. Um, I'm reassured by the neutralizing antibody data that has been done for for DA four DA four five, um, and I'm also reassured by the the hundreds of millions of doses that we've been giving. It's um, I, I I think that um, we're we're being asked to um, take a leap into a, a whole new. Um, dimension of how we move forward with COVID vaccination. And, and that's going to be um, a, a much more routine um, cycle of vaccination. And uh, I think that the data that we've had presented is very reassuring. And so it would incline me to support that the recommendation um, in front of us. But I, I do want to make sure that um, the concerns that I have are, are voiced. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Paling. Yeah. So um, first, I want to say thank you for framing this question broadly. Um, and I do like um, this approach. Um, I um, also agree that um, in the conversations and looking at the clinical data we have, how it compared to animal data and using that as a bridging um, does answer a lot of questions for me. And that the modeling data shows it clearly um, waiting to November is a cost in 137,000 hospitalizations and um, over 9,700 deaths. So waiting for more data is not um, costly. I remain concerned about saying you can't use monovalent vaccine. And I would really like to understand the thought process behind that and why we're not taking an approach more similar to Canada. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bell. Yes, thank you. I um, want to agree with um, what um, my colleagues have been saying. Um, and also, just on the side of my um, discomfort, um, note that um, the Canadians, the Europeans, are using a bivalent vaccine with a BA1. And it's not clear to me that we have fabulous data about what the incremental benefit is of using a 4 or 5 as opposed to VA1 against the somewhat discomfort um, about you know, recommending a vaccine that we have no clinical data about. Having said all of that, I think there are good arguments for going forward with that. Um, the other um, comment that I wanted to make is that while I wholeheartedly embrace this idea of being more routine and, you know, this will now we're going to have, you know, just maybe one booster and that, that sort of path forward, as Dr. Wharton outlined at the very beginning of this meeting, I think it is important for people to understand that while we will, you know, we hope that we can go in that direction and we're all, um, you know, ready to change the way uh, we're dealing with this pandemic, um, I just I think it's important to recognize and to say that things might change. We don't know what the future is going to hold, 
And while we would like to be more routine, it may be that um, we, you know, have to continue in this vein, depending on what happens um, with the virus and with the pandemic. I just don't want people to totally get their hopes up when I think we all recognize that um, we might not um, get there as quickly as we would like. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bell. I'm going to remain optimistic. I'm just going to say, <laughs> Dr. Sanchez. So I guess it's um, my turn. Um, you now, so I, my concern, as others have voiced, but I guess um, is that we're, so first of all, it's not that I'm against the bivalent vaccines. It makes sense to have bivalent vaccines. Um, my, but however, which bivalent vaccine are we talking about? And the data that we have on the B1 um, is really for 18 and over for Moderna and Pfizer. We have nothing less than 55 years of age. And yet we're going to make a recommendation for 18 for 12 and over. Um, so I, I have a concern for that. And we are, and that is the, the younger age group where there are, I mean, myocarditis is, is a real side effect. And yes, there, you know, um, and so we're then extrapolating the, the data that has been seen with the bivalent B1 to hopefully similar data for the, um, you know, for the, um, you know, the, the, the B4 and 5. I'm, um, so I'm, I'm just concerned about the, that extrapolation and because, and ultimately, I really don't want to establish a precedence of recommending a vaccine that we don't have clinical data on. And I think, and I am concerned about that. Um, so that's, that's what I have to say. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Lee, uh, this is Melinda Warden. Can I make a brief comment? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Um, I, I, I just would like to remind the committee that every year we use influenza vaccines that are based on new strains without clinical studies being done. Um, this is what we do every year. We have well-established platforms. There are changes made in the the vac the the particular strains that are included, but overall the vaccines are incredibly similar year to year, and. In a lot of ways, this is really analogous to that, and we've had hundreds of millions of doses of these vaccines used. We've got a lot of familiarity with the vaccines and their performance, and what's happening is a, um, a change in the, the particular virus that the vaccine is targeting uh, that is not a huge win. And um, so I think the ex extrapolations that are being made, as well as the, the preclinical and clinical data that is contributing to this discussion, um, really do provide a lot of information uh, upon which uh, uh, the Food and Drug Administration uh, based the authorization. And I see that Dr. Fink has his hand up, and he may want to add something to that. Yes, Dr. Fink, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I, I did want to weigh in on this discussion on, on behalf of the FDA, and I, I, I do appreciate the, the amount of discomfort that, that I'm hearing uh, from committee members who are being asked to take this, this leap um, with the COVID vaccines that, that you haven't been asked to, to make uh, previously uh, with the COVID vaccines, but yet, as, as Dr. Wharton just uh, reminded us we we do on a on a regular basis um, uh, annually with with influenza vaccines and it, it, as Dr. Long mentioned uh, with with her wonderful uh, construction analogy we, these these are vaccines that that we understand uh, very well uh, in terms of the the, the original uh, monovalent vaccine and we are talking about bivalent vaccines that are manufactured using the, the very same process uh, and which contain the same total amount um, of, of RNA and are otherwise uh, the same except for the fact that they now 
uh, contain uh, two, two mRNA sequences in, instead of one. Uh, and so FDA felt very comfortable um, with the approach of, of extrapolating uh, the safety and effectiveness, or, or rather the known and potential benefits and risks uh, which underlie our emergency use authorization uh, based on uh, ex clinical trial experience with uh, the bivalent vaccine containing the BA1 uh, sublineage component, which is also an Omicron sublineage component. Uh, we felt uh, similar enough to BA4.5 uh, to allow us to make that extrapolation. Um, we recognize that we've taken a, a different path uh, than the regulatory authorities have in, in Europe and in Canada. Um, but we made our decision uh, based on several factors, including uh, feedback and advice that we got from our vaccines uh, and related biological products advisory committee meeting in June, as well as uh, data that we had toward the, the beginning of the summer, um, uh, including some out of South Africa indicating that uh, uh, neutralizing antibody responses uh, against BA4.5. Uh, natural infection uh, appeared to be uh, more cross-reactive uh, than uh, responses against BA1 infection. And so for the purposes of, of improving uh, protection heading into the fall and winter, uh, uh, the best we could against the, the strain that we, we knew uh, or sorry, the variant in, in sublineage that we knew would be uh, predominant. We we went with the, the choice of, of a BA4.5 component, and we, we felt confident in that. I, I also just want to address briefly the, the uh, concern about extrapolating across age groups. Um, again, we, we have uh, a tremendous amount of experience uh, with the, the monovalent original vaccines in the age groups in which they're they're authorized. There are some, some differences uh, across various age groups in terms of uh, uh, reactogenicity profile or immune response. But, but by and large, uh, the experience uh, and trends are, are very similar across age groups and even more so. Um, what we're seeing uh, as we move from primary series doses to booster doses, trends in, in the, the exact same direction, no matter which age group you're talking about. And so for that reason, we, we felt very comfortable taking data from a, a specific age group, uh, whether it was adults 18 years of age, of age and older or adults 55 years of age and, and older, and extrapolating that experience with, with a bivalent product uh, to authorize uh, another bivalent product, again, manufactured using the exact same process. Um, to authorize use of that product uh, in all age groups. And I think we, we will be intending to, to take that approach um, uh, for consideration of, of authorizing the bivalent vaccines in, in younger uh, pediatric age groups uh, uh, once you know, we have uh, product and manufacturing information um, that would allow us to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fink. I'm just going to jump in really uh, briefly here and uh, let my colleagues know that I would like us, to, if there's any additional comments, I see uh, Dr. Long and Ms. McNally. I just wanted to say uh, a couple of quick things at the end, uh, but we cannot go backwards and change anything, so I'm just going to su um, suggest to our committee members um, any additional comments. Uh, please look ahead, look forward. Uh, we have a decision in front of us that we need to make, uh, and we can't change what is being put in front of us today. So. Uh, given all the uncertainties and the recognition that uh, we have to um, ensure that uh, we make the best possible decision going forward, given all the uncertainties, um, I'll just ask that we focus the comments on the uh, uh, on this decision right now. Uh, Dr. Long. Yes, I, I I wonder, Dr. Fink, would you can you tell us? I, I don't remember seeing a vote on this by Verpac. Was there a vote, and if so, was it unanimous so, on this authorization? No, no, we we did not we did not take these authorizations to to our VERPAC. We relied on uh, what we felt was was pretty clear um, advice uh, that we received at the end of June, um, and and also uh, an approach to uh, extrapolation that 
um, that scientifically made, made sense to us. Thank you. And then my next question, I'm sorry, Dr. Lee, it is related um, in reference to Dr. Sanchez's comments Did and asking uh, Dr. Daly and others on the work group, did you consider at this point only recommending this vaccine for maybe 50 and older, realizing that's where the main mortality is right now, and it would not it would not put at risk uh, the younger people who are at risk for mild pericarditis who may have recently been infected and A, not need it, not benefit as much as you would think, and two, might be at more risk for mild pericarditis. Did you consider limiting this today to 15 and older? I don't know what to say. Dr. Brooks, I'm sorry, thank you. if you want to answer briefly, Dr. Daly, I'm happy to ha- allow you to jump in, and then we'll go to Ms. McNally and Dr. Talbot. Um, so, um, Dr. Long, in response to your question, we did we did discuss this at the work group, um, and um, still came to the general work group consensus that that uh, um, the work group was in favor of this at all ages. Although there were there were voices that expressed your sentiment too, and that's sort of trying to weigh the totality of the benefits against the totality of the risks. And part of that is looking very carefully at the risk of myocarditis following, what we know about the risk of vaccine-associated myocarditis following booster doses to date. Um, and so, yes, it was discussed at the at the work group, um, but the work group's general consensus, again, although there were some um, who expressed your, 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 your thought to, or who, or who raised that, but the general consensus was to, um, make a recommendation across all ages. Thank you. So Matt, I was the, it's Kip, I was the um, the odd voice. Um, so Sarah, I had the same thought as you, because um, I was looking at risk of hospitalizations um, and incremental benefits. And so we had actually talked about, you know, what if you did everyone over 50 or even over 40, those who have comorbid conditions like immune suppression and healthcare work. Um, and then the concern by the majority of the work group was that then that becomes too complicated and the recommendations are already too complicated. So I think that was the concern of the work group is trying to keep it simple so that actually people were immunized. Matt, does that summarize the... Yeah, I mean, I think... I think and not just not just simplicity, but also the feeling that of some members that benefits would still outweigh risks at a younger age. But there's more unknown about the incremental. I think some of this, um, Dr. Long, is that we're, um, we don't have great data about the incremental benefit of this for, say, a, a 25-year-old who's already had um, maybe two doses and a booster plus an infection, for example. That, that data doesn't exist. So I, I, I think... I agree with what Dr. Talbot said, other than to also acknowledge that there's um, more uncertainty about the magnitude of the benefits um, compared to the magnitude of the risks in younger ages. Thank you. Um, Ms. McNeil. Thank you. I just wanted to offer some comments for my colleagues to consider. I, I definitely share in the concern that there is a desire for more information. But as I think about our experience with COVID-19 vaccines over the past several months, uh, it, is, it is beyond dispute that we have gotten really good at data monitoring. And that includes the robust monitoring systems we have for safety. And there has been a, a very clear demonstration of an ability to respond quickly to any, any issue that had needed, has needed to be addressed. And so for that reason, I am comforted by what we're talking about now. And I very much appreciate the comments from Dr. Wharton and Dr. Fink. I do remain seriously concerned about two issues, and I want to express those here. The first is avoidable administration errors because of labeling and communication, and the accuracy of the reporting of those administration errors. And I I think that 
I, I think about this not as much from the medical provider perspective, although that is critically important, but I think about it as the consumer who would potentially have a family member, a child, a parent receive an incorrect vaccination um, at a very critical time. And so I wanted to raise that point. And the second is continuing to, um, to voice concern about concern and appreciation for the fact that this simplified recommendation even though it is simplified, is indeed a change in a recommendation, and that is complicated for the, uh, the public. And so I want to advocate that the CDC continue to have clear and accessible communication that remains available for consumers, and also that the avenues for consumers to have their voice heard continue to remain open. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. McNally. And I will just add a, a couple of additional comments. Um, uh, Dr. Long, I think I agree. I agree with everything you had said. <laughs> I'm just going to augment what you said um, earlier, which I think built upon the comments of many of the, our colleagues who spoke before. Uh, number one, you know, I want to uh, echo what Dr. Wharton mentioned, and actually, I think Dr. Lair mentioned at the very beginning, which is this approach is very similar to what we've done for flu. Um, so I, I don't think this is an entirely uh, fundamentally new approach that we're um, looking at, but I do feel, uh, you know, the same level of I would I would like to have more information. Um, and it would be better to have more information. But we, again, have this decision in front of us where we anticipate there will be a tough uh, winter season ahead, uh, both with flu and with COVID-19. And I feel our job is to do our best to protect public health. So given that, and I, given the, uh, you know, the potential for uh, early, uh, um, earlier administration during this season, uh, to protect a greater uh, uh, proportion of the population. Uh, so I am anticipating effectiveness, and my concern is about missing opportunities for protecting many people. Um, I do think that this makes sense going forward. I also want to emphasize that I feel strongly about reducing and mitigating any potential risks, um, if at all possible. And so I am going to put out there that my personal preference is to anchor on three months as a minimum interval from either infection or a prior vaccine dose. That is what I will recommend to individuals who ask me, uh, but I recognize that there is an authorization out there. I just, I just feel like we've seen benefits um, and reductions in harms by a longer interval. The third is I want to emphasize again that making access and implementation easier should be a priority. Mm -hmm. Final thing I want to mention is, um, and I, you know, I really appreciate Ms. McNally's presence on this committee. Um, we need to create patient-facing clinical considerations material for a one-pager um, that would help individuals understand how to maximize the benefit and minimize their um, risks. Uh, and I do think that that's possible. I recognize it's challenging, but many patients are going directly to get vaccines. I always tell people to talk to a healthcare provider if they have any questions, and I know that all of our providers are here and ready to help. But um, and, and that includes our pharmacy providers are here and ready to help. I want to be very inclusive and our public health providers. However, I do think having more information out there can only help. Uh, so that is my uh, plea to continue to um, push that front. Uh, thank you. Dr. Daly? Um, yeah, I wanted to jump in again um, after Ms. McNally's comments, which is just that you know, I've I've heard of uh, to make a couple a couple comments related. I I've heard of parents who've been very concerned about COVID vaccine safety and then have decided to vaccinate, and then only to be told that they were vaccinated with a with a higher dose. Um, and I think, you know, at some level we we run the risk of of, of um, losing confidence in the program more broadly the more that that happens. And and even though fortunately there haven't been serious adverse events that at least have been reported in that circumstance, I think it's I think it's it's critical. And it's not it's not just sort of a simple error that you just sort of move on from for some parents because then they may not complete the series. And so I, I'm going to borrow a quote from Dr. Oliver's presentation, although it was in a different context. You know, I think. Um, structural problems need structural solutions. And so I, I think we need to look at structural solutions for um, vaccine administration errors. And I, and, I, and I think we need to, you know, work with the FDA and with the vaccine manufacturers to, to um, come up with structural solutions that are not just around education. Um, but then I also think we need to push for continuing to simplify. Um, and Simplification may also mean just fewer presentations. And so I think 
looking forward, I would hope that we could work with, again, the FDA and vaccine manufacturers to, um, to have fewer different presentations of different doses for different ages um, with different volumes and different dilutions and different storage. Um, and the fewer of those that we have, as long as that can be done safely with an effective vaccine, I think, um, um, again, less vaccine administration errors, but hopefully uh, greater confidence in the program overall as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Daly. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Oliver, are there any additional slides we need to consider? No, I have uh, proposed vote language, but no, no new information. Okay. I actually would really appreciate it if you would uh, be willing to put up the proposed vote language so that we could um, uh, start to proceed with the vote, because I see no additional hands raised in this moment. Okay, because there are two products authorized. Oh, I did not acknowledge people. <laughs> well, maybe there's one more thing I want to say, which is this is, you know, an hours long of ETR presentations plus the extensive presentations uh, and data to inform that uh, are so, so uh, much a representative of a, a fantastic team here. So uh, if I'm speaking, it's only because I've got excellent, excellent people on my team. So I do want to acknowledge that. Um, then I will also acknowledge because there are two different products. We will, there are two different proposed vote languages and I can read uh, both of those real fast and then turn it back over to you, Dr. Lee. So vote one is that a single dose of the bivalent Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine is recommended for individuals ages 12 years and over, at least two months after receipt of a primary series or prior monovalent booster dose under the EUA issued by FDA. Um, the vote would also include language to uh, repeal its previous recommendation for administration of the monovalent vaccine for persons ages 12 and over. Um, this is because that product is no longer authorized. Um, and so as it is no longer authorized, we need to replace the vote um, legally with uh, moving from the monovalent to the bivalent. Then the language for the next um, vote is, is very similar, that a single uh, dose of bivalent Moderna COVID-19 vaccine is recommended for individuals ages 18 and over at least two months after receipt of primary series or prior monovalent booster dose under the EUA issued by FDA and would also replace, uh, this recommendation would replace the monovalent recommendation for 18 and over to mirror what has happened with the EUAs. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Any clarifying questions to this wording? And for myself, uh, Dr. Oliver, just to restate, there is no authorization that exists anymore for the monovalent vaccine? In, in those age groups. So for the age groups where there is a bivalent booster, so Moderna 18 and over, Pfizer 12 and over, for the age groups and products where there is a bivalent booster, uh, FDA um, repla replaced the EUA for the monovalent with the bivalent. So we are doing the same or, or proposing to do the same uh, with the recommendation. The EUAs are still in place for um, the Pfizer vaccine for five through 11, because that is a vaccine, uh, the monovalent, because that is an age group with which there already was a booster monovalent recommendation, um, but does not yet have a, a bivalent product. We can't hear you, Dr. Lee, if you're speaking. Oh, yep. I called on you, Dr. Long. Please go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. We couldn't hear you. Um, so two things on this one. I really think you need booster in there because people will think that we're recommending a single bivalent as part of extension of a primary series or to complete your vaccination. Um, and so I think I would put the booster um, I would put the booster after vaccine on the first line. And then the second thing is um, we're going to stick with two months, although I agree with you and I feel pretty strongly that it really should be longer um, it, to get maximum benefit and reduce risk. 
Um, but we're going to leave that to clinical considerations. Was that your idea? And here we we stick with the, at least two months. I think it's the wrong message, but it is. It would be, uh, uh, you know, one of the brackets of timing. Uh, um, let me first clarify, Dr. Um, Oliver. Is there any objection to adding the word booster? Uh, no, we can. It, it the vote language okay. specifically clarifies that it's after receipt of a primary series, but I think for clarification purposes, we can we'll we'll work on getting a booster added. Do you do you want me to say anything about the interval or? <laughs> yes, please. I, I I would appreciate that. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, we absolutely, the work group talked about this um, as well. I think there are distinct um, reasons that it is, it is uh, really helpful for the ACIP recommendations in the current setting that we're in um, for uh, the recommendations to match the EUA. If ACIP were to vote on a different recommendation, then that would be um, different than the authorized interval, um, and it would cause significant confusion uh, and potentially legal issues with the provider agreements that there would be different uh, intervals recommended by FDA uh, and ACIP. So that's why we've really tried to emphasize that we have in clinical considerations some considerations for a longer interval, especially around those who have had prior infection, um, uh, and that for kind of the population that is at risk for myocarditis, the the nearly every one of those individuals is six months, if not longer, uh, from their last dose. I will say that this is not meant to imply that people need boosters every two months moving forward. Um, as we said, this is a transition uh, point for the program where we're moving hopefully forward, um, where we're not kind of counting doses with minimum intervals, but may be able to get on kind of a more regular schedule. Uh, fully agree with Dr. Bell that we have to um, follow the data and that could change, but that's the plan. Um, and so hopefully the future interval is considerably longer, um, but this is if we're recommending a time-based program that we think everyone should should who's eligible should go get this vaccine this fall, the minimum interval is two months since your last dose. But most people are longer than that, and uh, it, it legally is is really uh, needs to be in line with FDA. Thanks, um, Dr. Oliver. Would there be any objection to taking out the words at least two months after? It could just be. 12 and older after receipt of a primary series with additional clarification in the wording. I, I, I mean, think I, our if lawyers I were, have weighed in that, it, that it's the, the interval that matches the EUA, I think, is important here. Don't quite understand that, but <laughs> I, I mean, I, I understand that we would say that at least two months has to pass. But it would allow us more flexibility to actually um, uh, provide that information that's needed for both clinicians and, and patients to understand, you know, if they just got had an infection, uh, they, you know, perhaps more leeway or something along those lines. I just, it, it, there's a lot of people who have had recent infection, and I read this as they should be getting it two months, even though it says at least two months. Um, so this is a legal issue. We cannot change the wording of the recommendation. It, it's, it is a PREP Act liability if the ACAP recommendations are different than the, the EUA recommendations around specific things like time intervals. Could I just push this just a little bit more and ask if we're not making a different recommendation if we simply are silent on the issue of the interval in the recommendation. It's not exactly the same as contradicting the EUA language of the FDA. Again, we we maybe are not at this may may not be very fruitful avenue, but um, I, I do wonder if the lawyers might look a little bit differently on this specific issue, which is not contradicting the FDA. It's just being silent on the issue in the language of the recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Melinda Horton. Um, I appreciate the concerns about this issue. I will remind you all that there are very few people 
who are within two dose within two months of getting a recent dose. Uh, there's we're just not talking about many people who are in the age groups that um, that are eligible for this, and um, and and realistically, as this goes forward and moves toward public publication program implementation, it will have to be in alignment with the. EUA. I, I, I certainly appreciate the concerns, though, that you all have articulated. I think you absolutely have, uh, have expressed concerns about those groups of people for whom this may be an, a, the most, a more important consideration. And um, we do have in the clinical considerations um, guidance about people with recent infection. And I, I am sure the conversation today has increased the visibility and awareness of those issues, and hopefully people can make decisions about timing of vaccination accordingly. Um, so I, I don't think we can take it out of the vote, but, um, it, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a uh, requirement for a strict two-month interval. It's at least two months. And uh, again, there's very few people who are within two months of getting vaccinated anyway. Dr. Brooks? Yeah, yeah, just to move it along, two things. It will be in the clinical considerations at whatever we want to be in the clinical considerations. And number two, the words at least, that covers, that covers us comfortably. If you want to do it six months or 12 months, we're saying at least two months. Uh, and I believe it's somewhat aligning with the, whatever the clinical data that we have, be it from humans or mice. So I'm, I'm comfortable with at least two months. Underscoring it, okay. Dr. Paley. I wanted to make a motion to accept um, the vote language. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Fryhofer. Quick comment. Well, actually, before we go there, sorry, Dr. Fryhofer, I have a motion on the table. I need to ask for a second. Does anyone want a second motion on the table? Ms. McNally. I second. Thank you. We have a uh, motion on the table and it's been seconded. Um, I'll ask uh, Dr. Fryhofer, did you want to make a quick comment? Uh, yes, um, uh, Sandra Fryhofer, American Medical Association, but speaking as a practicing physician, I think that keeping the at least two months in there is actually very helpful to practicing physicians. I think this discussion to me is so reassuring about how carefully the ACIP uh, member uh, look at these issues um, and it also points out the importance of the, cl the clinical considerations, but to take that out, I think would be more detrimental to what you're trying to help with than leaving it in. So I think leaving the, the at least two months in there, uh, I hope you do that. And I hope you vote for this. Thank you, Dr. Feierhofer. Um, any additional comments from uh, members, from voting members? I don't see any additional hands raised. Um, since uh, there are no hands raised, I'll assume the committee has no objections to proceeding with a vote uh, number one here uh, that is specific to the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for individuals 12 years and older. I won't read the whole thing. It is there on the slide. I'll ask ACIP members if you would please turn on your video. Um, I will uh, ask you to state your name, uh, whether, well, I will state your name and whether you have a conflict of interest and then your vote. Um, so I'm just going to go in order of who I see on my screen, and I see Ms. McNally first. Veronica McNally, no conflict, yes. Um, Dr. Daly. Uh, Matt Daly, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Talbot. Oh, you're muted, Dr. Talbot. Let me think yeah. a little bit longer. Okay. <laughs> we'll come back to you. Dr. Sineas. Dr. Sineas, no conflicts, yes. Uh, thank you. Dr. Brooks. Oliver Brooks, no comments, yes. No conflicts or no comments? <laughs> oh, you're muted, Dr. Brooks. I just want to confirm, no conflicts? I'm sorry, did you hear me? Oliver Brooks, no comments, no conflicts. Thank Maybe you. 
That's what I was looking for, Dr. Brooks. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Chen. Uh, Wilbur Chen, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez? No conflict. Uh, no. Thank you. Dr. Paling? Kathy Paling, no conflict. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Bell? Beth Bell, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Lair? Amy Lair, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Bata? Ms. Bata, no conflict. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Long? Sarah Long, no conflict. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Cotton? Camille Cotton, no conflicts. Yes. This is uh, Dr. Talbot. Well, I'll go before you. <laughs> this is Grace Lee. No conflicts. Yes, but I still feel strongly about the three months. I know that's not really a vote, but <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Talbot. I'm struggling. Um, Dr. Talbot, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you. I believe we have um, 13 yeses and one no, Dr. Wharton. Oh, that's good um, as well. Thank and the you, motion Julie. passes. Okay. This, mo this vote number one passes. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll move on to vote number two. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and go in alphabetical order right now. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bata. Ms. Bata, no conflicts. Yeah. Oh. I apologize. I did not ask for a motion. Dr. Paling <laughs> caught me. Dr. Paling, would you like to make a motion? <laughs> yes, I'll make a motion to accept the language as it's written. Thank you. Can I get a second? Uh, Ms. Baca. I second the motion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, both of you. Um, it's been moved and seconded that we accept vote number two, which is focused on the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine booster for individuals 18 years and older. Um, so now we can proceed. Oh, any objections, any concerns? We'll proceed with the vote then. Uh, we'll start with Ms. Bata. Ms. Bata, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bell. Beth Bell, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Brooks. Oliver Brooks, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Chen. Wilbur Chen, no conflicts, yes. Thank you, Dr. Sinea. She's saying that her audio and camera has stopped working, so maybe give her a moment. Thank you. We'll come back to you, Dr. Sinea. Um, Dr. Daly. Matt Daly, no conflicts, yes. Thank you, Dr. Cotton. Neil Cotton, no conflicts, yes. Uh, Lee, no conflicts. Yes. Uh, Dr. Lair? Amy Lair, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Long? Sarah Long, no conflict. Yes. Thank you. Ms. McNally? McNally, no conflict. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Paling? Kathy Paling, no conflict. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez? Pablo Sanchez, uh, no conflict, no. Thank you. Dr. Talbot? Dr. Talbot, no conflict, yes. Thank you. And Dr. Sinea? Are we still having trouble? Um, Dr. Sinea, if this is the one exception I will allow for using the chat. If you are able to chat in uh, your name, whether you have a conflict and whether it's a yes or no, I will take that. Dr. Sineas, no conflict, yes, thank you. This is a one-time exception only for uh, technical difficulties. Um, so I have 13 yeses and one no, Dr. Wharton, and vote number two passes. 
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Um, that's my count as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Well, um, we, we are actually uh, quickly running out of time because our colleagues in, at CDC have a very, very hard stop where the entire um, uh, audio will shut down. So uh, I will ask maybe just uh, if anybody wishes to express their opinions um, uh, about this vote, uh, anything different or new, and then I'm going to ask Dr. Oliver just a couple of wrap-up questions before we close the meeting. My warning scared everybody off. I apologize. <laughs> um, any other comments? Okay. I, you know, I will no, ask no, Dr. No, no, no. Oh, no. there we go. Dr. Long, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I wanted to say that as a clinician and making a decision for individuals, I would be on Dr. Sanchez's side. Uh, and I make this decision for the best of the most people, uh, uh, considering and hoping that the advantages will outweigh any risks that we do not yet anticipate. Thank you, Dr. Long. I think we feel similarly. Dr. Sanchez. So, um, so I, I voted no because because I really feel that we need the human data. And that's really, to me, really important. It's, it's, an, it's a new vaccine, it's a new platform. There's a lot of vaccine hesitancy already. We need the human data. And at the same time, I think that the vaccine will, be, will have similar safety as we've already seen with the other method, with the previous vac um, vaccines with messenger RNA. And, you know, I personally, I'm in the age group where I'm, I'm at high risk and I, you know, I mean, I'm almost sure that I will receive it um, and I will take it. So I'm, I just feel that, that we really, that this was a bit premature and I wish that uh, we had seen that data. Having said that, I, I am comfortable that the vaccine will likely be safe like the others. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Dr. Paling. Um, I wanted to, to say that I um, do think that this is a huge step forward in simplifying the recommendations and hopefully enhancing coverage. It does put a lot of pressure on the distribution of the vaccine because we have now switched from bivalent to monovalent for boosters, people 12 and older. And my sincere hope is that this will be expedient and um, not impair access for all who want it. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Brooks? Yeah, just two quick statements. First, I really appreciate Dr. Oliver's uh, synopsis. The ETR has shown the beauty of how important that is and the addition of equity on each of the line items because we struggled with equity. And then almost the only reason I voted yes was because of thinking about how we do flu vaccine on a yearly basis. We have data that doesn't show the new vaccine. We just based them on the last vaccine of the last year and determined that it's okay. And safety profile was comfortable. So that was my primary reason for making a difficult vote in saying yay. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Oliver, I just I wanted to confirm, and I, I know uh, you'll answer in the confirmative, but I just want to confirm that all of the um, discussion and deliberation will be captured in the clinical considerations um, to make right. sure that it re fully reflects the diverse opinions of this committee uh, in, in the vote. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the clinical considerations team is, is hard at work. We'll do everything we can to get everything posted uh, as soon as possible, um, uh, hopefully within the next uh, 24, 48 hours-ish, but thanks. It's always a tall order and apologies that you need to get this out so quickly, but we appreciate how much your team is doing to get um, all of this uh, uh, commentary in and the uh, opinions of the uh, committee. So we really appreciate that. Um, 
I want to uh, go ahead and proceed with ending this meeting. So I want to, you know, thank everybody for uh, all of the speakers and our ACFP members, our ex officio, and our liaison members for your work today. Um, I there are a couple of comments I just want to make at a high level, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Wharton to see if there's any further business. Um, you know, the ACIP, I know on behalf of all of us <laughs> that uh, we will uh, we appreciate all of the input today on the booster recommendation. Uh, and, you know, the hope towards simplification and the hope that, um, and I will be optimistic, and I can't remember which of the members said this, that we might not be out of the woods yet. I'm going to remain optimistic that this becomes <laughs> a solution that is um, one that we can sustain. But um, as always, I will put in the caveat that if anything substantive changes about the benefit risk balance, or if there's any new safety considerations, uh, rest assured that ACIP will most certainly meet. Uh, and I just want to make, make sure that, the, you know, the members of the public uh, are aware that we're continuing to monitor closely that with this decision, the decision to end here, uh, as Ms. McNally mentioned, um, we have systems and teams that are continuing to monitor and to meet over time. So um, I want to, you know, I recognize the uncertainty. I want to acknowledge it. And I just want to say that despite that, I think, uh, you know, we've hopefully made a, a huge impact in our ability to continue to um, weather this pandemic together. Uh, Dr. Wharton, do you have any further comments that you wish to make, or do we have any further business? Um, so there's no further business, but I would like to thank the committee as well as all of our speakers and the public for sticking with us today for this very long meeting. Um, it, I, I do think this is a big step forward for simplification, and uh, I hope moving towards something that is a um, both a more normal set of vaccine recommendations as well as a uh, cadence of, of changes to two recommendations. We're, we're clearly not there yet, but I, I think this is a big step forward and um, I hope we're, we're moving to something simpler that will not require such frequent changes going forward. So thank, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for your help and especially to our committee members for all the hard work today. So uh, nothing more, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Any other objections to adjourning today's meeting? Uh, Dr. Lee, one more point. I have, I've I've been reminded that uh, uh, some people who were not a, on at the very beginning may not be aware that we are not meeting tomorrow. The adjourning today is the end of the meeting. I concur. This would be the end of the meeting. There's no need to meet tomorrow. Um, and I don't see any hands raised. So seeing no objections, I would like to announce that today's ACIP meeting is now adjourned. Thank you everybody for your time and all of your efforts. Take care. All right, very good, good work.